I have talked about a number of shows from my youth that act as puzzle pieces, as building blocks to the person I am today, that aired outside of their country of origin a period of time after their original air dates. It's mostly been Canada up until this point. Oh, no, clear. But I'm not here today to talk about teen animated comedy 16. If you want me to talk about that, get the Stokes video to 1 million views. I'm not joking, I'm, be, I'm, I'm putting my foot down. That one's not even monetized. I'm doing this for the love of the game. When I talked about Stoked and Babysitter, while those episodes aired initially, like years prior, year prior in their native land, my first experience watching them was the episodes that aired in America. That was the watch order I followed. And this show, a lot like 16, actually aired initially on Nickelodeon. Years after it premiered, yay! But all throughout 2008, and by that I mean the first three months, we would see commercials and trailers for the upcoming television event, H2O colon just add water comma metamorphosis. Now, do not let the marketing or the Wikipedia article fool you. There are no H2O movies. Oh, but Andrew, I remember there being several. No, you were misled. You were lied to. Every movie, and yes, they do this several times, are really just multiple episodes crammed together. The one titled H2O Just Add Water, the movie, is legitimately just a clip show. Metamorphosis was actually just the first two episodes of the show aired back to back on March 14th, 2008 on Nickelodeon. This video is in the Stoked slot from last year because again, it shares a lot of similarities. And like Stoked, I want to talk about not only when these episodes were airing, but the things airing around them in potential television blocks. But the thing about H2O and Nickelodeon is it was kind of on island all its own. That wasn't a purposeful joke. Like this movie aired in the premium slot on Friday night before very quickly being moved to Sunday nights where every episode of season one would air sans a handful of ones where it would air alongside basically nothing. There were some standouts, like some episodes aired alongside the worst season of Zoe 101 and uh, Dance on Sunset. So yeah, you know, basically nothing. Dance on Sunset has come up twice this- Am I gonna need to talk about the show? I couldn't even find it. The commercials did very much include the new brand new series at the very least, but this is not a movie. As much as it would make sense for an analysis of this magnitude to talk about the production of the show, I wasn't in Australia. So, uh, metamorphosis. No Turn that shit up, Charles, cause I'm no ordinary girl. <laughs> It's here in our fake television movie that we're introduced to all the most important characters as we see Cleo timing her friend Emma's swimming speed. See, we learn here that Emma likes swimming and Cleo likes clocks. Also, they are friends. Emma says that she's preparing for regionals to which Cleo responds, so cool, which it isn't. Next stop, regionals. What the hell are regionals? They never stop talking about it. Emma lets Cleo out of her sight for minutes and she's already being shanghaied. Brown hair guy over there attempts to send Cleo off to see a drift in a boat that does not work as a prank. I know attempted murder when I see it. Like I'm not exaggerating for comedic effect like I often do, he just, he tries to get Cleo killed, I guess. So much so that he gets upset when our final girl, Ricky, jumps in to save her. I would be making jokes, but yet again, I have still never played a Xenoblade game. Must be a common name in Australia. What we get from Cleo's initial response is Ricky is kind of a weird kid who no one really hangs out with, which is saying a lot because Cleo is a fucking freak. I know I have a tendency, a track record, if you will, on watching these shows meant for teenagers and instantly lumping characters of the same sex together uh, romantically. That being said, you think people who just met look at each other like this? This look of passion? They splash water on the attempted murderer, which seems like a pretty lax punishment for, again, attempted murder. We get our first montage of the girl's little boat date around scenic Australian locations, but unlike Stoked, we just get generic stock music. Cleo swings to grab her one friend, Emma, as Ricky is woefully friendless. Wanna ride? You know what? Never mind. I've changed my mind. These two are endgame. Five minutes into this and our gaggle of girls are stranded at sea. Exactly what brown hair wanted. They decide to row over to Mako Island, but no one must ever go to Mako Island because Mako Island is full of dangers like snakes and spiders. Isn't this Australia? You see worse shit in your backyard. Cleo is watching Ricky and Emma bicker at each other and maybe coming to the same conclusion I just did. We all have a secret. Yeah, and it ain't mermaids. Find your step. <laughs> 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 
How did you get all the way over there? God damn it, Cleo. How do you even pull that off? Can't take her ass anywhere. Can you climb up? No. Are you sure? Come on, just try. I can't. There's no way. It, it's too steep. Do you want to at least, like, try? Emma falls down the hole on accident, and then Ricky gladly joins them on purpose. Emma's pissed at Ricky like she's the queen of the hole all of a sudden. Newsflash, Emma, we're all in the hole. We see the stars ricochet off this glowing pond. Is it nighttime? Or does the cave just look like that? Because it was just daytime like a second ago. This is like the cone of a volcano. It's, um, not going to erupt, is it? It's been dormant for 20,000 years. I think we're safe. How do you know that? Emma, the professional swimmer, goes underwater for a really long time. Like, way longer than any person should be feasibly able to hold their breath. Almost as if she isn't anymore. Cleo is rightfully distressed by this, and Ricky is just like, eh, what's a couple minutes underwater? They all decide to swim out of this underground cave, to which Cleo responds that she cannot swim. The girlfriends tell her to just focus, as if that would do anything. Hey, look, it's a full moon! Also, like... She's swimming. This is what swimming is. What do you mean you can't swim? You should be thrashing around then. Listen, you've seen the theme song and the title. We know where this is going. The next morning, the three girls all have different brushes with water, causing them to transform into mermaids. Ricky specifically gets hers from a CG bubble from a sprinkler. This show loves its CG bubbles. They cannot wait to show off this technology every episode. I remember bits and pieces of this show as I've never gone back to rewatch it, but I didn't remember the tails also giving them tops. Like I assume the tail just added onto whatever they were wearing previously and not uh, you get free bras. I only noticed this with Ricky as for some reason, I did not question why Cleo would step into a bathtub with clothes on. Cleo's a fucking weirdo, I don't question it. There's no awkward moment in this episode where they all catch wind of what's going on and realize they aren't alone. They immediately all tell each other. Pretty sure these two just properly met Ricky yesterday. Sorry girls, you're all now forever bonded by fantastical powers and a secret you must always keep. It's unfortunate, but it happens to teen girls in these shows all the time. It's where we learn some mechanics, like how the tails go away whenever they get dressed again, which raises the question, how did Ricky even get here? She was on the ground. We look like mermaids. I've told you before, you're not funny. Mermaids don't exist. Well, I mean, not in real life, no. But this universe does have a concept of mermaids. Hey, let's ask this guy. Lewis is here. Lewis is leaving. You're smart. Do you know anything about mermaids? We cannot stand her ass. You mean to tell me I'm crazy? Look at this shot. They're holding hands as they walk into water to- There's no heterosexual explanation for this. I'm glad I went back to watch this as an adult because I did not have the proper language to explain what I was feeling when I was seven. Lewis heard the word mermaid and is instantly on the grind doing research to learn everything there is to know about them. Like a true cryptozoologist. Or maybe he just likes Cleo. Oh, uh, you know what? Some mysterious biker tries to kill them. I think. Well, surely there's only one person who could possibly be under that helmet. It's Brown Hair, the local attempted murderer guy. My father didn't appreciate having the water police knock on his door. Oh no, not the water police. The first 22 minutes is all about establishing the rules of the world as we learn them with our characters. Cleo discovered her dormant water powers as she makes a hydrant explode, blasting Brown Hair away. Then she runs away. Then she leisurely jogs away. The girls intervene to combine their knowledge as Emma discovers she can freeze water, which technically counts as controlling it, but Ricky can't do anything. I wonder if she can bend people's blood. That would fit her arc. It's okay, Ricky. We all get them at different times. Hey, I think you got your allegory for puberty in my fantastical mermaid show. These girls will forevermore be bonded by a secret. With great power comes great responsibility. Whatever happens, we're in this together. This doesn't mean we're married, does it? Like. Come on. The episode ends as we have all our major players. We got Cleo, Emma, Ricky, Lewis, Murder. Normally this is the section where I would recap where we are in the timeline and also the airing order and what happened in between. But again, these episodes aired back to back as a fake TV movie. So... Can they just never take baths again? Are they forever doomed to smell like shit from a butt? It's not like baths are super good at getting you clean anyway, but I don't think they can take showers either. Cleo's sister is just constantly knocking on doors, ruining her mermaid time. It's the only thing we've seen her do. Em, you're fine. 
Hmm, honey, I think a fish is calling you. While the other two struggles with their new double lives, Ricky is loving being a mermaid, hanging out with dolphins. Honestly, if I could be a mermaid anywhere, I would want to be in Australia. I'll never be a mermaid. Emma has to give up her lifelong passion of professional swimming and Cleo can't apply moisturizer anymore since it's mostly water. No showers, no baths, no moisturizer. I give it like five months before you're a local biohazard. Yet again, Ricky does not want to hear these valid complaints because she thinks being a mermaid fucking rocks. We have to tell somebody, our parents, a doctor, the police. And end up a mermaid in a straight jacket with moisturized skin. Ricky's right, Cleo. You can't tell anyone. Cleo? Your mom will have us dissected. Cleo says she's really good at keeping secrets, which tells me that she will definitely tell someone by the end of this episode. But who? Everyone stop talking, Lewis is on screen. What are the odds these three girls all had their lockers right next to each other? And they claim last time they just met Ricky? That's cold. The not weird girls, so basically everyone but Ricky, is invited to a pool party to congratulate local surf champion Byron. Now you may see the logistical issue with a pool party. But they decide not to go to the party as it would be unsafe. You know, you girls are walking awfully close to the coastline. If I wanted to hide my powers from the world, I'd probably go to like a, a local park or something. No tail, no tail, no tail, no tail. This is me when I'm out on a Tuesday night. <laughs> I would like to apologize for my previous comments. Of course, Lewis rolls up at the exact moment they're practicing discipline, but in his defense, this is his super secret fishing spot. I might just join you all for a swim then. We're naked, Lewis. Just a quick dip then. Goodbye, Lewis. The offer was there. All right, this dude rocks. Cleo, look out, that's a CG bubble. So Cleo can make water float into her face and Emma can lick a popsicle, but neither of them can use moisturizer. Ricky is offended by this flagrant use of power she does not have and storms out. Later that day, presumably, Cleo and Lewis are hanging out at the local diner cafe slash pool table spot before Byron the surf god walks in. You must be getting up there. Control yourself. <laughs> this dude is a world-class hater. Also, shouldn't you be in jail? Lewis is tired of being whipped around by Cleo. He's got other girls to be whipped around by, so he storms out with his bucket hat as Cleo swoons over the golden god. It's all right to feel moody, yeah? You're at an age where you're going through a lot of changes. Exactly, Mum. You got it in one. Hey, I think you got your allegory for puberty in my Fantastical Mermaid show. Lewis then goes back to the local diner cafe slash pool table spot. I guess they don't have a ton of third locations. But this time to annoy Ricky, who hates Lewis. Maybe she doesn't like you. Did you think about that? Yes, actually did cross my mind. But then I thought, oh no, no, if she hangs around with you, her standards must be pretty low. Lewis. You have bewitched me. The hot-headed Ricky learns through her angry outburst that she can boil water, maybe the most dangerous power of the three. But forget our main character, Magical Mermaids. How does Lewis feel about this? Are you naked again? Um, we're having a bit of a girl talk, Lewis. Yes, but are you naked? Go, Lewis. No, no, I'm here to fish. I fear women. I want fish. Make sure Cleo doesn't go to the party on her own. Call her back. No, I'm here to fish. This dude just wants to fish and you girls are making his life so hard. I am not some lackey. I am not some all-purpose servant. You really think you can tell me what to do and I'll jump. Headphones off. Guys, I'm sorry. I really am. I wanted to go into this and pick one of the main girls as my favorite and be like, oh, wh which mermaid are you quiz? But everything about Lewis is my favorite. I love this dude. They're trying to reach Cleo because she decided to go to the pool party. Again, a uh, logistical issue, but her plan to avoid getting wet is to pretend to have a cold, but still go to the party. This might just be a 20s thing, but if someone showed up to my party super sick, I would send them home. Don't let her inside. Why is Ricky the unpopular one? I know this is a deep cut, but this fit looks so much like Penelope Pignose from hit film Penelope Pignose. Still never seen it, man. This party sucks. If only there was an attempted murderer here or something. Brown hair rolls up with his four to five henchmen and immediately throws Cleo in the water. He doesn't know she's a mermaid, but he might know that she can't swim. That's another attempted murder. In the nick of time, Lewis shows up still wearing his fishing gear. I didn't think you were coming. No, no, I was just cruising by. I thought I'd drop in. What's with the fishing gear? 
I never leave home without it. So nobody sees this. They threw her in the pool and then immediately all went inside. Surprisingly, Cleo went the whole episode without telling Lewis their secret. She managed to keep it. The situation is almost entirely out of her hands. I say almost because she decided to go to the fucking party. The girlfriends roll up and Emma freezes the door hinge to keep the party stuck indoors. Sick pool party, guys. And then Ricky shows off her new powers by boiling Cleo. And it works. So Ricky could just unmermaid any of them at any time. How long until they forget they can do this, do you think? The Scooby Gang, or I guess Scooby Gang wouldn't work. Jabberjaw? The Neptunes? They managed to escape, but not before Ricky can commit an act of terror. Just like Xenoblade, I think. The pool party, the one Miriam's putting on for you. Miriam? She's the blonde one, right? That does not narrow it down in the slightest. I thought Byron would be a one and done for this episode, but it seemed he's sticking around, which adds a wrinkle to the Neptune's dynamic. Lewis likes Cleo, and Cleo might also like Lewis a little bit, but Cleo has at least swooned over Byron. Byron doesn't seem to like anybody, but Emma also likes Byron, and Ricky likes... Emma? I think. Also, this is gonna get really confusing because not only is Emma a, a total drama character that I just talked about, but also a character in Stoke. After airing as a fake TV movie in the prestige Friday night slot, it was immediately moved to Sunday night for the next 11 weeks. Every Sunday stretching from March 18th to May 25th. Now, you may be thinking two things. You're probably thinking more, but I'm gonna narrow it down to two things. One, that's not a whole lot of time. It's more than making fiends, but that's a really low bar. And two, doesn't this show have three seasons? Each with 26 up. I was gonna make 26 with my hand, but I realized I don't have that many fingers. Let's watch the next one, shall we? Oh boy, I hope we get another Lewis fishing episode. Cleo's family is watching a looping image of a shark. Like, it looks like a movie the Aqua Teens would watch. Cleo pays her little sister to do the dishes for her so that she doesn't get wet. But if I were her, I'd just bend the water and soap them when no one's looking. But I'm just built different. I'll never be a mermaid. How many episodes are we going to get where one of the girls is sulking about being a mermaid? I know it's the crux of the show, but we're running out of things to be upset about. Cleo learns about sea turtles. Turtles laying eggs this morning at the beach. It was amazing. Wow, that's wonderful. Is this ADR? The girlfriends speculate that it might actually be Cleo's dad who's capturing these sea turtles and not the only other fishermen they know. Have you ever caught any sea turtles? What kind of a question is that? What are you, a cop? The girlfriends go mermaiding again and free a sea turtle they see trapped under Cleo's dad's ship. Cleo, I know we said your mom would kill us, but your dad is also evil. You can't trust your family. You can only trust us. Run away into the ocean with us and never turn back. What's a cult? We get introduced to a new creepy antagonist, one of the only other guys with brown hair. You know what they say? can never trust brunette guys. And I feel for Cleo, I really do. It's not her fault her dad's evil and fucked up. So she sulks in the bathtub because she can't swim. But after doing some investigating of her own, Cleo learns that her dad actually owns several boats. Oh, Mr. Moneybag's over here. And the creepy hook man from before is behind this, probably. Time to look for some clues. Yeah, what are you doing here? What's wrong? I will admit, Cleo is so effortlessly funny. Who points like that? Who runs like that? Also, it doesn't answer my question, Cleo. Cleo, who cannot swim, decides this is a good time to jump into the water and thrash around. Of course she gets caught in the net of the hook man. Why is he even hunting these turtles? What's the monetary gain? Or is he just doing this for the love of the game? The girlfriends show up again to get Cleo out of the hook man's net before their secret is revealed. They comment on how impressive it was that Cleo held her breath for that long, but she was passed out. Guys, I think she died for a bit. In the end, the father is vindicated. He doesn't have to grapple with his profession because he's a good fisherman, and the hook guy is an evil fisherman. We can't let one bad apple spoil the batch. What, every fisherman is evil? I stand for the thin, light blue line for fishermen. The turtles are saved as the group find eggs on the beach and Lewis buries them. While Cleo isn't ready to abandon her family quite yet, she has gotten over her fear of the water as she slow-mo runs into the ocean with her tail sisters. They finally all embrace their mermaid life. Have anything to add, Lewis? <laughs> Cool. Well said. That episode, unlike the previous TV movie, would air by itself on Nickelodeon, not followed or preceded by any more episodes on March 16th. Following the next week, the subsequent episode on March 23rd. America. I'm glad all three of them get to share custody of Lewis. They all need quality Lewis time. Cleo got a job at the Marine Park because she's stupid or something. Four episodes into this thing and these teens want answers now. There's only one place with all fun answers to why we became mermaids. 
Oh, we're already here. Emma is going to get some answers alone. She refuses to take Lewis with her, probably so she could prevent him from becoming a mermaid, hoarding it all to herself. Oh, Miss Queen of the Hole. You know, for someone broken up about trapped sea turtles, you sure don't seem to care about dolphins in captivity at your job. A fully covered Leo slinks to the back, but she catches the attention of a local witch sitting in the crowd. What's her deal? Still, you've got time to learn. Staying dry. That's the big one. Cleo! Whoa, where'd she go? I went to Mako Island to find answers and all I got was this lousy necklace I found under the moon pool. Hey look, Ricky's in this episode, woo! Lewis is spending his weekend the way he always does, testing different liquids to see if they trigger a reaction. In the background, Cleo is trying to plan a girl's night with an apprehensive Emma, to which Ricky catches wind and questions why wasn't she invited, as if we didn't see her boil a pool at the last party she was at. It's not really her scene. Pretty, would've been great. Boys, dancing, boys. Ricky, you're not convincing anyone. At the local diner cafe slash pool table spot, returning brown hair murder man serves the girls drinks, which Cleo drinks because she's stupid or something. It's prune juice. My script kept auto-correcting because I was just typing really fast as prime juice, which is even worse of a punishment than prunes, I think. Cleo has convinced Emma to live a little. They've set up a perfect slumber party, sippy cups, Towels? My kind of party. Several nameless girls we've never seen before and will never see again slink into the house, as does the popular girl and the murder man who are apparently dating. It's more of a she's in love with him and he doesn't give a shit about her kind of situation. Ah, young love. Emma's mom is just cool with this guy sticking around. All the girls change their pajamas, except for the Neptunes for some reason. Can we get this dude out of here? Zane, I need to speak to you. Now. Sorry, Emma, can't. The girls need me. Where did this come from? Girls love danger, nothing hotter than an attempted murderer. Also, he owns a motorcycle. The girlfriends make him eat the pastries he brought because not only did he trick them with prunes early in this episode, we know he's not above poisoning people. The mindless drones gather around Emma's new necklace as it is shiny and reflective and pleases their little crow brains. And then they have a towel fight. I know I haven't been to a lot of girls slumber parties, but what the fuck? <laughs> like pillow fights with all the feathers is weird enough and like tropey. What is a towel fight? I am so sorry. Oh no, all the towels are being used for the towel fight. Cleo hides in the closet from all these girls and refuses to leave. Cleo hides in the closet from all these- Who do you think you are? Ricky? Oh, Cleo, you're so silly. What is wrong with you? She makes the green slime explode all over the popular girl and also the ceiling. Nickelodeon! Emma helps Cleo clean up her embarrassing change in the bathroom while hiding from the slumber party. Hey, I think you got your allegory for puberty in my fantastical mermaid show. Ricky rescues the necklace from the thieving fiend, so Emma decides to gift this necklace to Cleo. All right, well, fuck me then, I guess. This will be important later. Cleo, you were right to get the job at the Marine Park. No, she was not. It seems like the girls don't like anyone they invited to this party at all. Why did you invite them? Like, I'm not a fan of the slime girl, but I'd also be kind of mad if I was the only girl not invited to this lame towel party. Also, my boyfriend is an attempted murderer. Cleo returns to work with the special necklace, learning nothing yet. Hey, look, it's that witch from before. Found it. In the pool, didn't you? On Mako Island. That's where Gracie lost it. 50 years ago. It seems that the Neptunes are not alone as there was once a previous generation of mermaids, but we have so many more unanswered questions. Unfortunately, there's no time for that as the witch disappears into right over there. You know, if you walk forward a little, you could probably catch up to, oh, you don't care? Okay. The next Sunday, March 30th, 2008. A Sunday. The new Nickelodeon episode of H2O was followed up by the new episode of other teen sitcom Zoe 101. Yeah, but that show doesn't have mermaids. All it has is robots sometimes. <laughs> I love these episode titles. I guess Emma changed her mind from the previous episode because now she brought Lewis to Mako Island to do research. He steps foot on the island just like they did, then he falls in the hole just like they did, and still no mermaid. While Lewis is mapping out the cave, some pageant called the Miss Sea Queen has come to 
Whatever town they live in. Always had an affinity with the sea. You? That's a joke. I'm the one with the affinity. I'm a 10 out of 10, very funny thing to get mad about Cleo. Cleo continually almost outs their secret to the world, but never actually does. That's because she's really good at keeping secrets. Why are you cutting to me? What's happening in this episode? Cleo's little sister finds and reads Cleo's diary full of personal details about her secret life and illustrations of mermaids. Cleo... Cleo, the popular girl and her sidekick, I guess she picked that up from brown hair, are at the marine park prior to the pageant to annoy Cleo, I guess. I think what they're going for is that Cleo enters the pageant to show the popular girl up, but the way it's staged, it kind of sounds like she enters solely to get out of work. Like either she's in the pageant or she has to cater it, and I think she might just be really bad at her job. I know this because Cleo holds fish floating in water in the air, basically right in front of her sister. Her sister somehow does not notice this, is everyone in this family stupid? Is that why they watch Aqua Teen movies? I'm just now realizing how absurd Cleo's wallpaper is. Wow, she really does have the affinity. Just as long as she can keep her cool. Cleo Jr. catches a glimpse of the tail right before the door shuts. If the drawings weren't enough, now she's seen it with her own eyes. I'm glad I mentioned Cleo Jr. before, because now Emma has a little brother too, and he has never once been a part of the show. Oh, so we're all just gonna pretend he existed the whole time? Is this a Buffy situation? That's not gonna be the last Buffy reference. Like Babysitter, they actually share a lot of commonalities. Cleo Jr. proves her point to her new partner in crime by watching Emma drink a water brand water bottle with a straw. Freak. By the way, Cleo Jr. does not intend on keeping this secret. She thinks they're gonna like eat them or something. The brother does not believe her and then he gets hailed on and then he does believe her. After the convening and planning the next day, Emma's brother threatens her with water and just says mermaid out loud. I will say, I like how most of this episode is from the siblings perspective, like that Fairly Odd Parents episode where Timmy's friends try and get to the bottom of his deal. Weirdly enough, also not the last time we're gonna compare the show to the Fairly Odd Parents. Emma immediately blames Cleo, which she is correct in doing so. Cleo, you drew pictures of mermaids in your diary for weeks. The only thing missing was a big arrow pointing to them saying, that's me. Hey, look, Ricky's in this episode. The kids track the Neptune to the local diner cafe slash pool table spot and become incredibly paranoid. They begin to believe everyone they interact with is a secret mermaid. The popular girl, her sidekick, Lewis? That's ridiculous. Lewis can't be a mermaid. Okay, but why not? I don't know if this was intentional or not, but Lewis fails to delete his search history on this very public computer where he kept looking up stuff about mermaids. The popular see this and then the children, leading the girls to believe that mermaids are going to be incorporated into Cleo's outfit for the pageant and leading the kids to believe that everyone is a mermaid. We have to do something about this. Now listen carefully. You will be here next to this fire hose backstage. I'll be here, directly behind the stage. On my signal, you will turn on the fire hydrant and angle it over this wall. The water will hit the stage, turning Miriam and Cleo into mermaids and us into heroes. Any questions? Yeah, I got a question. How does that make you heroes? I guess a mermaid isn't that far of a stretch as all of their costumes in this pageant are aquatic themed. Cleo is a man of war and everyone's acting like this is the most absurd costume as if we did not just see a girl in a starfish. The popular girl stole what she thought was Cleo's idea and is wheeled out in a mermaid costume. As this is happening, Cleo Jr. orders little brother to spray water all over the pageant attendees and host, ruining this very awkward ceremony. Well, it's not like it can get any more awkward. Word. I knew it! There are mermaids on the Gold Coast, and she is their evil leader. My sister is one of them too! I like that she has her own foreboding theme. I hope the series shows her getting more and more paranoid as she develops into a Mr. Crocker type character. Remember when I said I would reference the show again? I was talking about just that. Little brother immediately throws her under the bus and the pageant is ruined. Yay! In a piece of karmic justice, the popular girl's sidekick wins the tiara somehow. She's not even in costume. Cleo gaslights her sister and it works. 
for now. I don't think this will be the last we see of Cleo Jr. It might be the last we see of Emma's brother, though. Lewis is just chilling in the moon pool. Why can't this guy be a mermaid again? The episode ends with the diary sinking to the bottom of the pool, which is exactly where the necklace was last time, ensuring that the cycle of mermaids will begin anew in, like, 50 years. It's cyclical, baby. See, it's like poetry, sort of. They rhyme. That episode was followed up by the aforementioned Zoe 101 episode. I actually don't think I said what episode it was, so show the episode on screen now. Sunday, April 6, 2008 would be followed up by not only a new Zoe 101, but also a new dance on Sunset. I'm gonna show you what Zoe episode it is, but I don't think I can learn anything more about Dance on Sunset than I already know, which is very slim. The fourth to the final episode of that show. Of Zoe, not of Sunset. I don't know how long that ran for or what the episodes even look like. Oh, so we're just gonna pretend Emma's brother was a character the whole time? I'm just supposed to pretend he's been important? And now even Lewis has a brother who isn't really important to this episode. I don't think we see him again after- I don't know why he's here. Oh man, and Byron's back too, the surf god, to teach the little brother surfing until he also then leaves the episode? Truly, everyone is here. This world is vast and expansive. Emma bails on the surf lesson and places the responsibility of watching her brother on Ricky, who surely cannot be trusted with such responsibility. The second Emma leaves, he almost drowns himself. Like, immediately. This was a bad idea all around. Ricky has to go mermaid mode on the public beach in broad daylight to save this poor boy's li- Damn. Guess he didn't make it. Brown hair's in the- Man, I love this episode. Every character is here except for Cleo Jr. Uh, because they sent her to an institution. The crux of this episode, how it got its name, is that the little brother falls madly in love with Ricky because she's tall and really mean to him. <laughs> Based. Emma's mad at Ricky for saving her brother's life. I don't know, man. What was she supposed to do? Did he, you know, see anything other than when I flashed him? Lighten up. He doesn't suspect a thing. Okay, but the last episode, he did suspect a thing. Quite a lot, actually. But he knows now not to speak out, lest he join Cleo Jr. in the loony bin. Even Cleo thinks Ricky was irresponsible. You work at a marine park and just let him fucking die? The girls turn Emma's homework into sludge before Emma can talk with her- I forgot I wrote that. Before Emma can have a talk with her brother. She tells the little guy that Ricky is no ordinary girl. She's from a different world. The lyric is actually from the deep blue underworld, but he's not supposed to know that. She's older and more mature. Kind of. Some of us men like that in a woman. Yeah, let's go, little dude. Yeah. He said he likes him older and he likes him mean. Where has this guy been? Of course, in this situation, it's wildly inappropriate. An 11 year old ruining the cool diner cafe slash pool table hangout spot of the 15 year old. The girls go to Lewis for boy advice because he is a boy, but then they don't really get anywhere. I mean, they do learn that he's working on an automatic irrigation system. Okay. Ricky just needs to be straight with him. Poor choice of words, I know. Well, we can see anything you'd like. Hey, I know you've got a crush on me, but I'm not interested. Did you know I'm gonna be a professional surfer? Elliot, fact is, I'm not a girlfriend kind of girl. I know what kind of girl you are. Ricky rejects him pretty normally, to which he responds by dramatically throwing a glass dolphin into the ocean and crying on the beach. Ah, I remember being 10. I know it's a little ridiculous to get mad about a teen show from the late 2000s, and I did have my jokes in the situation talking about myself, but I do kind of like really hate this archetype, this trope, this arc, this story. Ricky sets boundaries for herself and says no to this boy, and then everyone around her is like, you shouldn't have done that. Why are you so mean to him? Fucking what? What was she actually supposed to do? Let him like her forever? I know he's a kid, but he's also been harassing her all ep- I feel like her friends, least of all the boy's sister, are not doing anything to prevent this. Like, it's a little crush, it's harmless, I get that, but why is this world punishing Ricky for rejecting advance? I hate this shit. It's not a trope invented by H2O and it's not necessarily their fault. This is a cliche plot by this point. But why? I never understood this. I do not want to date you, small child. Hmm, I'm gonna put myself in danger and make it your problem. Emma, you're helping raise an abuser. That might be too far, but is it really? The climax is Ricky hunting down the boy and having to outrun the irrigation system set up before. Remember earlier in the episode? Destroying a lot of Lewis's hard work in the progress. Yay! <laughs> the episode ends with Ricky going back underwater to pick up the abandoned glass dolphin meant to represent 
forgiveness i don't know i didn't hate that up until like the very end and maybe i'm overacting a little bit i mean it is a youtube video the crux of this is for me to care way more about this than i actually do but am i wrong here am i reaching this stuff always made me feel grody even as a kid anyway sunday april 13th 2008 no. Man, we're just barreling through these now. The kids are preparing for their father's birthday. Emma gets mad at her brother for getting exclusively black balloons. I feel like it might be too late to change everything. And she's kind of freaking out the other Neptunes. Okay, so everyone in Cleo's family is stupid, and everyone in Emma's family is incredibly neurotic. Feels like home. The Water Witch warns Cleo to not look at the moon's eye, meaning the full moon, and knowing Cleo, well... Do not look at it, or its reflection. And when it's out, do not touch water. Like more so than we already shouldn't touch water because we already aren't doing that. Emma whips out the ugliest shoe ever and somehow gets complimented by surfing god Byron. Cleo is harshing the party's vibe with talks of old women. Brown hair and popular girl love showing up to parties uninvited in the same clothes they always wear. From the distance, he kind of looks like one of the McPoyles. I can't wait to see how Cleo messes this up. Unfortunately, it's Emma who looks right at the reflection of the moon and it makes her act weird like there's no other particular about her she's not acting like a fish or only telling the truth she honestly is just strange what's wrong with you nothing's wrong with me ricky baby except that that's normal emma follows the siren's call of the moon and escapes the party through the deep dark sea leaving her tacky shoes behind ricky catches wind that cleo was left in charge of emma and instantly recognizes how dangerous that is while emma makes her way to mako island ricky Cleo. That would be a big mistake. What the fuck? Lewis? I trusted you. Lewis tries to get Emma out of the water, but he is pulled in himself, and then we just cut to them out of the water. They make a note of needing Lewis specifically to get her out so they don't get wet, but then we just cut to the next scene. Apparently the powers of the full moon prevent Emma from turning back into a person. It's 908. According to the schedule, Elliot plays Orobo till 910, which means we have two minutes. Thank you, Lewis. That is what the number two looks like. Also, Emma's brother plays the oboe. They keep leaving Emma alone as if she isn't being weird and threatening. Perfect example, the siren calls Byron into the hot tub, which upsets the little man for some reason. I mean, he is his surf instructor. See you later, Byron. I like where this party's going. The men in this show are my favorite guy. Cleo, good to see you too. Byron is really just happy to be there. Cleo covers for Emma in front of her parents as if they didn't just see her in a wheelchair. Has there been one party in this show that hasn't been horribly awkward? I love how impressed Cleo is with her terrible bomb of a speech. She's just really, she brings the whole show together. Emma got this dude on his hands and knees on the floor talking about, now this is a party. We learn that apparently Lewis has a key to the only other location they ever go to, the local diner cafe slash pool table diner spot. That's where they'll have to hide her for the night. Do people not work here? The moon sets and Emma finally goes back to normal. Well, goes back to Emma. She apologizes to her father and gives part of the speech she planned on giving while also not explaining where she had been all night. And the worst thing is not knowing exactly what I did. Oh, and it's probably best you don't know. Hey Emma, thanks for last night. Just wanna say you're the world's best lips. Who talks like this? And Emma is impressed with herself. Credits. That episode was followed up by a new episode of Dance on Sunset and nothing else. Gotta be honest, Sunday is kind of the death spot. Also, it's spring. Why do I remember this show airing in the summer? I think it was just like vibes alone. That's why I'm doing this now. On Sunday, April 20th. <sighs> you know, that's how it, 2008. What kind of affair are we talking about? Is Emma's dad about to cheat? I hope so. Lewis claims he's close to figuring out what makes these girls transform. I'm gonna go with water. Lewis has a plan to speak to a real scientist attending the marine park. What if she wants to dissect us? What if she goes public on us? She's a marine biologist. A marine biologist. Hoorah. Lewis is instantly enthralled by this 
adult woman. We also learn that Lewis's last name is McCartney, which would explain his hair. Cleo is just disgusted by this whole thing. Cleo gets the girls concerned along with her that he may become entranced more and spill the beans about the Neptunes. I feel like the music is framing the scientist in a nefarious light when she's just kind of doing her... J All right, well, that's a little egregious. Ah, yes, test tubes, beakers, Science! Lewis waits for the scientist to leave the lab before doing tests on Cleo's toenail. Don't ask. PhD comes across the slide under the microscope and tries to squeeze more info out of Lewis. They keep setting up the scenes where the context is someone is invited over to talk, and then the conversation lasts a couple seconds, and then one of them storms at- Why are you here? The, the science, science team, team heads to Mako Island while the Neptunes trail behind. Then we cut to later that day. I have never seen less happen in an episode of TV. I think you guys are a bunch of kids. And at least Dr. Denman is a woman and a little bit more mature. Oh. You're a victim. As much as this is set up as a conflict, the scientist offers Lewis a fully paid six-month travel research opportunity. This is life-changing. Cleo is kind of a bad friend. Like she's upset that he's leaving, but she's only shown a passing interest in Lewis this episode, but only when he's happy and not obsessed with her. When's the last time we've seen these two characters interact anyway? I feel like nowadays she spends more time with Emma in these episodes. So Cleo decides to slink around. Just add water. Hey, that's the name of the show. Well, girls, we're gonna have to kill him. But are we just gonna let him go like this? Like what? Well, you're just sailing away without saying, Lewis. You didn't go. She doesn't even have object permanence. It's nice that Lewis saved the day and deleted the scientist findings for the girls, but now he's never getting out of this damn town. That was his one shot at something that truly matters. I just want Lewis to be happy, man. Not with the PhD, the P stands for Predator. This episode aired on Nickelodeon was followed by nothing. Yay! Sunday, April 7th, 2008. Look, we have a lot of episodes to get through. We're not even close to being like a sixth of the way, so we're gonna need to barrel through these. I'm not gonna pretend that I understand these characters more than this show, but Cleo is broken up about the death of one of her fish, which is why Emma is comforting her. But Ricky is showing no remorse about her lack of interest, which usually would track with Ricky. But aren't you the one who got in Cleo's face about her dad kidnapping sea turtles? Why don't you care about fish all of a sudden? You're like half fish. No, don't get, I can say that. I have friends who are fish. Ricky leaves solemnly as Cleo cries into Emma's arms. Thanks for being a great companion, a confidant. I could tell you anything. You tell everyone everything. Return to the deep. Somehow I thought it'd sink. Ricky attempts to speed run the grieving process by gifting Cleo a new fish, which is just more responsibility. We also never see that fish again. I think Ricky threw it away. Cleo says Ricky isn't good with the whole empathy thing, which makes me like her even more. I'll have you know I'm neurodivergent and gay and a minor and a fish sometimes. She's pick a struggle. I can't. And now Ricky is just kidnapping fish from the ocean. What changed? Ricky immediately sells out her morals when she comes across Barry Rollins. Now you may be asking who is Barry Rollins? Well, he's Barry. <clears throat> so this episode is just Ricky poaching fish to sell to Barry Rollins. Like, I'm not mad. It's H2O. But the turtles! Get the brat image that says girl the genocide, but just put turtles over it. Oh, I get it now. This isn't Ricky. It's her evil doppelganger, Kira. The difference is Ricky wears blue and Kira wears red. If I sell these fish to Barry, will he think I'm Kira? There's no way she's making that much money. Kira's false reality comes crashing down as she learns the fish she thought she was donating to a specialist is actually going to the local diner cafe slash pool table spot. Barry has fled the country, so they put Lewis on bitch boy work as he calls every bee in the phone book. Fine, okay, yeah, it was a few hundred dollars more than that, but I was working hard. And it is a niche market. Hey, you two were happy enough letting me spend up big on you. You could have said something, but no. We just learned about this today. Kira refuses to go to the authorities about this. She's ready to become a vigilante and go above the law. You guys didn't think to look in the spot he's been every day? You tried every B in the phone book? This is a different character. The one that wears black's name is Icarus. She's the crazy one. And I'm not your sweetheart. You know that color does suit your eyes. Adult man, by the way. Ricky goes mermaid mode to follow this adult man and then gets kidnapped by pirates? 
She's not tied up or anything. They just got her in a chair. Also, she's disgusted by Barry kissing this other adult, which makes sense if she liked him, I guess. But then this adult woman is all over this guy to like upset her. You ever see someone who's like trying too hard to assert dominance or like make someone jealous and they're hanging on someone like a weight, like way too much. Like you don't need to melt on this dude. I'm not trying to fuck your boyfriend. I might be trying to fuck your boyfriend. I don't think we're talking about this show anymore. He's monologuing as she rubs his shoulder. Is he a Bond villain? It's a shame I already referenced Arrested Development. Ricky manages to escape by boiling all the water in the pipes and scalding them. Hurry, I'm gonna... Okay, not to condone for murder since I shamed brown hair earlier, but now he knows, right? Like, what else are they supposed to gleam from this? You're a witch. They punished the shit out of this woman, like way worse than any of the dudes that manhandled her. Is it because she has brown hair? It must be because she has brown hair. That being said, I think she kills Barry. I guess we'll never see him again. Speaking of people I never thought we'd see again, Cleo Jr., shouldn't you be locked up right now? The episode ends on a simple note. Ricky learns to respect fish and also that murder is sometimes okay. This is also, I believe, the third episode in a row where one of the young kid characters falls for someone either a lot older than them or just an actual adult this this keeps happening something something zoe 101 something something dance on sunset sundays in 2008 were really eventful from 420 to may 4th may the weed be smoke you also i think zoe 101 ended in between the last episode of h2o on nickelodeon and this upcoming one it's not what this video is about but that episode sucks dance on sunset on top i haven't seen it so by default it's the best and worst one <laughs> I thought this show reminded me of Goosebumps, but I assume it's just like a budgetary thing. I'm glad that other people are coming to the same conclusion that I am, that I had this idea of like a spooky low budget show in the late 2000s that uses monsters and rubber creatures. I always lumped in like New Who, Buffy, Goosebumps, and I guess now this and also Babysitter. And I never had a term for those. I would just call them like spooky low budget 2000 stuff but now i could just call them all the pink opaque aren't movies incredible there's a film festival held at the local diner cafe slash pool table spot do you guys go to school anymore brown hair murder boy's dad is a big local hero who surfed around mako island and became rich either because of that or in spite of that he's not only judging the film festival but also doubling the pool i will die if i have to watch a north korean family eat breakfast for an hour in real time can't you read subtitles ricky these are real films. Emma, I wasn't familiar with your game. We get a shocking amount of development for the murder brunette, and we also learn how much he desires his father's approval and how little his father actually cares for him. It's sad, but doesn't excuse his behavior. We're referring, of course, to multiple attempted murders. Ricky doesn't want to make a boring mother movie, so she sneaks out with the Neptune's camera and the Neptune's Lewis. I love how they all just use Lewis for their individual schemes and labor at all times as if he has any say in the matter. Face it, we're never going to win the competition with Emma's idea. Just think of it as a backup plan. No. 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 Oh, damn, way to stand up for yourself, Lewis. Well, I can't relate to this character anymore. Where's the one with daddy issues? Brown hair is barred from entering the festival because his father is the judge, which seems fair enough, but breaks him up. You guys are gonna hate me for this part. Brown hair, now that I actually care about him, his name is Zane. He's done nothing but fight with Lewis every episode he's appeared. They hate each other. It destroys Zane's ego to have to ask for help but he doesn't know where else to go. Who else can he turn to? He's desperate for his father's approval and will stoop to any level to gain it. He bribes Lewis, who's still fishing, with his luxury camera if he can help him film a reenactment of his father's grand triumph. Guys, guys, they might successfully make me care about this character. Forget about Goosebumps, this is Buffy. And not to get ahead of myself, but of course I'm filming this after I finished writing the script, and it follows Buffy in more ways than one. Zane sneaks into the local diner cafe slash pool table spot to steal his father's legendary board. Lewis and Zane head off to Mako Island to film goddamn cinema. Did I mention that Emma is interviewing her mother for her film entry? 
I feel like I skipped that part. I definitely used it for a joke. I didn't think it would be important, but it is important as this is how Emma learns that her mother saved Zane's dad from drowning back in the day. I know how the story goes. Woman saves man, man falls for woman, throws a glass dolphin into the ocean. I was petrified. I mean, what if I didn't save him? It's a lot of pressure for a 12 year old. Hmm. I love that establishing shot. History repeats itself as Zane is tossed into the water as sharks swim around him, calling out to Lewis to save him. But it is not Lewis who saves him as a sneaking mermaid Ricky gets to him first. I don't know what happened to the budget of the show, but this is legitimately a really cool effect. I thought all the budget went into the CG bubble. Lewis and Zane watch the footage back on his dad's boat for some reason, which causes a dispute. There was a 20 foot shark out there, dad. There were heaps of them. Did you see anything? Well, um... I didn't think so. Zane created this charade because he knew he couldn't really break my record. Now get rid of that. What is your problem? It's amazing how well this show juggles giving development to a new character while also keeping all the other characters on even playing field. Hey, where's Cleo been? Oh, there she is. Does she have anything to say? No. Lewis re-edits the footage YouTube poop style to make it seem like Zane is screaming in fear, which embarrasses Zane, pisses off his dad, and annoys Ricky, who was there to witness the sharks. Lewis won? Wasn't Zane's dad the judge? Man, he really does hate his kid. You've made me manage to like Murder Boy and dislike Lewis in 22 minutes. That's impressive. I mean, Zane wins Best Actor Award and then donates the winnings to the diner cafe slash local pool table spot. I didn't know that Best Film and Best Actor get prize money. Did Lewis even get any money? Are we sure his dad had nothing to do with this? The episode ends as Ricky congratulates Zane on his bravery, which allows him to open up and be genuine for the first time in his life. He failed to build a friendship with Lewis after the movie went live, but maybe, just maybe, he doesn't need everyone to hate him all the time. Ricky believes his story, and that's all he needs. Holy fuck. Am I easy to please, or is this show just brilliant and slept on? Dance on Sunset next Sunday, May 11th. The show was followed up by nothing. <laughs> Byron the surf god wants to talk to Emma, considering the last time they interacted was kissing on the floor, I imagine it's somehow related to romance. You're like this quality skateboard that's just sitting in the cupboard. I've always thought of her the same way. Ah. Not even trying to be subtle anymore. Byron is actually here because he wants to be the fastest swimming boy in Australia, and he needs Emma's help. She used to be a champion swimmer. Surely she can mold them into a champion. You may think this has nothing to do with romance, but I'll have you know I understand subtext. Like, for example, Ricky claims to be mad that Lewis is existing or something, but I think it has more to do with Emma. Another moment between Byron and Emma is ruined as Zane enters her house to give a gift to Emma's mom. Continuity. Also, you guys should really lock your doors. I've seen this dude wander into places uninvited like every episode now. As it turns out, Zane will be the one racing against Byron, making me instantly side against him. You guys can't make me feel bad for Zane, introduce his family trauma, let me learn his name, and then have me root against him. I guess it helps that he's back to being a dickhead this episode, but that just makes it more upsetting. Oh god, no, not the CG bubble! I thought you were dead! Lewis requires more hair samples, so Ricky gives him a clump of dog hair and then kicks him out. I have a feeling that these plots are not going to be created equal. Does does this count as a montage? It's been a while since we've had one. Emma trains Byron while Ricky plots to kill Lewis or something. But these lopsided plots converge as the rest of the Neptunes find out about Emma's secret coach life. Cleo is upset because Emma isn't being careful, which is pretty rich coming from her. But I get the feeling that Ricky is mad for a different reason. It's like she's upset that Emma clearly likes this guy. I understand that. No reason to take all that rage out on Lewis though. It's only for a couple more days and I'm being really careful around Walter. I get it. One rule for you, a different rule for us. You're not even trying to understand. Why don't you just admit it? You like him. You want to spend time with him. That's not it at all, Ricky. Right, Cleo? Oh, haven't you heard? The show isn't about Cleo anymore. She doesn't get any lines. Emma is doing her best to push Byron with tough love, but his heart it just isn't in it. Did you want to win or not? This was your idea, Byron. So he tells Emma to chill out, which is absurd. Do you know who you're talking to? That was actually a joke about her being neurotic all the time and not a joke about her having ice powers, although it does work on multiple levels. Ricky catches wind of this disrespect and confronts Byron, all up in his face, like a protective partner or something. Surely they can rectify their differences. Look, Byron, I'm not an ordinary girl. I'm from 
the deep blue underworld. They kiss, this time without the influence of the moon. Ricky keeps trying to piss Lewis off on purpose, but my man is prepared and unbothered, all with a smile on his face. I just want to fish, damn it. I suppose someone has to act as the rival for Byron this episode. It's just a shame that it has to be Zane and he has to be a cock about it. I guess you can't expect him to change overnight, and technically he isn't being a dickhead to any of the Neptunes. Surely Emma will do okay. Cross the line. Serious competitors don't usually kiss their coaches. Well, coaches don't usually kiss back unless they want to. Maybe I was feeling sorry for you. Or maybe I was just feeling sorry for you. Ricky, I don't think we should be listening to this. You think by now I would have nailed down the accent? We're like 11 episodes into the show. Lewis is such a great guy that he even pretends to be outraged just to appease Ricky, which seems like a bad lesson to learn here, but I don't think this episode is really about them. Emma is avoiding watching Byron race as she cleans all of her shoes. I wish I could come, but I really need to clean my shoes. You hate cleaning your shoes. Don't get me wrong, it's a strange thing to do, but I feel like it's even more of a strange thing to hate, to feel that strongly about cleaning shoes and bring it up so frequently that your friends know you hate doing it. But everyone knows the club hates gardening. I swear this isn't me jumping around. They don't really explain how Emma got here, but the race starts when she's on the phone and then she just fast travels here to see how it ends. Only logical conclusion, the pool is in her backyard. Emma claims that getting Byron fired up and upset wasn't a tactic to make it perform better, but I've seen 2024 hit film challengers. Seen it several times, even when someone uploaded the whole thing to Twitter. The episode ends, like most, with one of the three girls we just focused on going for a swim by herself. Most of the episodes in the first half of season one were focused on the girls' powers, learning about them, and how they can slash can't control them, but it seems the latter half is gonna be focused more on the romantic lives and dynamics of these tweens. That being said, all the Byron stuff did start because of a full moon. How much time has passed in this show? I can at least tell you that a week passed in real time. Episode 12 aired May 18th, 2008 on Nickelodeon on a Sunday night, of course, and again was followed up by nothing. So they just hang out with Byron now. He's one of the main guys. While well, Zane is stuck sitting with all the bad influences. And I thought it last forever. See what I mean? But no, he is correct. Her singing is terrible. Back at the Marine Park, the Water Witch is here to warn Cleo about something else. And by something else, I mean the full moon again. Okay, so it's at least been a full month since episode eight, and there was also a full moon in the first episode, meaning that a month passes every four or five episodes, meaning that every weekly installment likely does take place over a week in real time. I sure hope they don't mess that up by airing them in bulk again. The moon. Lewis is here to watch over the girl's sleepover in case anything strange happens, which causes Cleo's fisherman dad to watch him like a hawk. You'd think they'd get along considering how much they have in common. Also, hey, I think you got your allegory for puberty in my Fantastical Mermaid show. Despite trying to torture him last episode, I'm glad at least Lewis and Ricky are having fun while Cleo does weird Cleo shit in the bathroom. All three of these mermaids have different water motifs, but they are not created equal as Ricky gets the entire ocean, Emma gets like race pools, and then Cleo gets the bath, the bathtub, the bathroom. Oh, so that's why the episode's called The Siren Effect. Now Cleo can sing like that of a siren. Uh-oh, somebody better call the Musatronics. Musatronics. Come on now, who wants some cake? I want some cake. I love my job. Cleo's closest friends instantly clock something is wrong because she doesn't sound like shit. The siren song entrances Lewis and even Byron sprints over once he hears it. Was he in the area or does he specifically have Superman level hearing? Cleo of course loves the new attention she's getting and doesn't acknowledge that anything is wrong. This could either be because of the moon or just run of the mill Cleo naivete. It seems the boys are back in town as every teen boy in the town shows up at the Cleo's family yard. We need a plan. Stay here. Do not move. Has this ever worked? The last full moon was only like 30 days ago. You don't remember what happened? Lewis, normally the voice of reason, removes his protective headphone and is once again caught in the web of the siren song. Why does the full moon always result in kissing boys? You know what? I get it. I'm good. 
Why not let me share it? It's a full moon, Cleo. Don't you get it? It's not you. Is it not daytime? It's light out. So this can't be moon behavior, right? Cleo is just like this. Is this to imply that these boys have been waiting out here for hours? Cleo's protective dad, or as we call him Cleo dad, is just having the worst time of his life as they decide to interrogate three boys at a time. It just so happens that the three boys they randomly choose are the ones we know. It's not perfect considering he's a zombie, but it's nice to see Zane not being a dickhead. Siren Cleo decides Decides she can redeem herself in the eyes of her contemporaries by performing live at the local diner cafe slash pool table spot. It does not go well. Okay, so it was the moon, and it's only now setting? Did they all gather here at 5 a.m.? Well, it seems like the plot has resolved itself. Cleo finally comes too, but remembers more than Emma did when she went full moon mode. She thought these boys really liked her. She got so caught up in the allure of all this attention that she never realized that they only liked her because of that one attribute that she couldn't control. These boys took an opportunity while she's going through scary changes and broke her heart when they moved on. Hey, I think you got your allegory for puberty in my Fantastical Mermaid show. Even Lewis, which is really fucked up. You better be here to apologize. I know it was just because of the full moon and the siren thing. I'm sorry. Can we just forget about it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course we can. Of course we can. I mean, we're just friends, right? Friends. Right. Yeah. Whoa. You blew it, dude. So she does remember the kiss, which Emma didn't with Byron, but then she did eventually end up kissing Byron, but maybe that was just to make him swim better? Ever since the first week with the Metamorphosis TV movie, which again, was not a TV movie, but just two episodes aired back to back, every week after for 10 weeks on Sunday night on Nickelodeon, a 22 minute episode of H2O, a new one new to Nickelodeon would air in that 30 minute time slot. Everything was fine from March to May, spring, basically, but like Babysitter and even more so Stoked, after this point, the air dates get a little confusing. This Sunday on Nickelodeon, May 25th, 2008, they actually aired two episodes back to back. Do the episodes Shipwrecked and Surprise have anything to do with each other? Let's find out. I hope the chipmunks and the chipettes make an appearance. Zane is here. That's close right? He's beefing with this old woman who they obscure the face of, but considering we've only met one old lady character, I have my suspicions. Emma stands up for the water witch while Zane goes to complain to the water police or something. She's shocked and kind of scared to learn that this old lady knows her name, but then steps aboard her ship anyway. Her ship is called the Lorelei. There's a Pokemon reference in there somewhere. Stay tuned. She serves Emma mysterious brown liquid and then asks invasive questions. I don't think you're old enough to be drinking these quite yet, Emma. Oh, so Zane really did go and complain? I miss when I didn't know his name. And this is even tougher for the Water Witch, considering it looks like she lives on this boat. You can't throw her out. <gasps> nice job, Zane. You killed someone. Finally, it took you like five tries. She's not actually dead. This dude can't do anything right. But she does quest Emma with protecting her treasure. When the Neptunes convene later, she drops a little nugget that the Water Witch stopped taking her medication. None of you wanna question that? Technically, there's no proof that she's also a mermaid, but at the very least, circumstantial evidence that she might have brain problems. Oh no, his dementia's playing up. Uncle Barry's got dementia. Let's just get into my house. Emma tells the old lady that she can live with her family for a while without asking any of them. You should have asked him. You would have said no. Well, yeah. I was on the mom's side, but then she's all like, there are systems in place to take care of homeless people. And I don't know, maybe Australia is better than America, but I don't buy that. My Australian fans, can you confirm or deny if this is true? I'm looking to become homeless somewhere and I want to pick the best location for it. You have a spare room? What are you complaining about? It's not like you're busy taking care of your son. We haven't seen this guy in months. Oh, look, Emma's back. She knows a lot about the water. What is your problem? The city is planning on taking the Lorelei away from the Water Witch. I'll be leaving now. Thank you. You know you can't do that. I've referred this matter on. The boat has been impounded by the water police. It's not seaworthy. Yo, water police mentioned. Water police. Arrest this 
both. I'm starting to think that Zane's only a dickhead when his dickhead friends are around to enable his dickheadedness. You guys ever think about how we never see Ricky's family? But the burden you carry is too great to carry alone. Wait, what burden? Oh, that one. Cleo. Come on. The Water Witch only drops the most necessary detail, like that she used to have friends and she once gave her powers up. Again, nothing overtly about mermaids. Yet. This is all before disappearing into the ocean on her boat. She's not getting away from this. Zane has to finish the job. I know I exaggerate and lie a lot when it comes to these episodes, but legitimately, Zane chases her down on his speedboat. He's circling her like a shark. You've got treasure here somewhere. You can't have that. Can I? Just watch me. Time to flee the scene. Emma and Lewis show up just in time to take her dramatic ass back to the hospital, while the murderer stays behind to find the One Piece, the cursed amulet. I could use this for my collection. Now, I know this is supposed to be commentary. It's supposed to be comedy. It's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be analysis in very light, and there's asterisks, uh, highlighter. I've been showing a lot of clips of this episode instead of just giving my commentary, and I'm gonna try and not do that, but I really need you to see what I just saw. What the fuck? What happened to this show? Are they gonna kill Zane? Emma shows concern about the boat while Lewis shows concern about Zane. Planting seeds. When I watch a show, everybody's gay. There's no in between. In the end, Zane does not die. I know, right? What a cheap bag of tricks. He is saved by Emma, fully in mermaid mode. He only catches a passing glance of her tail, but if he wasn't part of the Neptunes before, he kind of has to be now or later. Actually, Zane becomes the new Mr. Crocker and vows to find the creature that saved his life, his new white whale, for lack of a better term. She's not dead, but her boat is. At least she got the amulet. It was 1955. I'm the one on the left. I thought so. <laughs> and Julia and Gracie. She doesn't give the necklace to Emma for saving the day because she knows she'll just turn around and give it to Cleo and not Ricky. I'm still upset about that. When did they take this picture and frame it? Normally, this is the time I would talk about the weak gap in between episodes, but again, they aired these back to back, not as a TV movie, so. No By the calendar, it seems to be another full moon and also April 19th. That's not super far off from when it aired on Nickelodeon. It's like about a month, give or take. Unless the blacked out circle doesn't mean a full moon. I mean, that's what I would mark out on the calendar if I was a mermaid. This also means the pilot takes place like mid-February. Zane is prepping for a trek. Is Lewis even friends with the other girls anymore? He only hangs around Emma these days. Also, Ricky hates him. The man running the local diner cafe slash pool table spot instantly gives Lewis a job on the spot. Oh, sorry. Lewis! Buddy, just the guy I was looking for. See, I've got a problem. Oof. We gotta stop running into each other like this. Are we getting another Zane and Lewis adventure? I love showing clips of stuff I've been watching, so I used the YOLO clip earlier. Interesting that it's mainly been in like the Smiling Friends sick animation circle and not Koala Man. I haven't talked about that at all, considering, you know. Ricky and Cleo spot the boys having a boy adventure and are filled with instant disgust. Okay, so my assumption was wrong. It's actually Cleo's sweet 16 tomorrow, April 20th. Oh, just like Hitler. Sorry, I ruined it. I love that Cleo's family still throws toddler parties for her. I wish I got a party clown of balloon animals in my 16th. All I got was sad. I mean, I just want to know, what's this about a sea monster? Well, remember a couple of weeks ago when I almost drowned? Weeks ago? Okay, so there really is no reason to air these back to back. That throws my timeline way off. Did this show canonically start in January? Zane draws a great illustration of what he saw. It's a tale that matches almost every undersea creature that doesn't have a shell. That does not narrow it down. Oh no, my tail. How could you possibly know that, Emma? Zane's trying to track you down and you know how not to find us. Yeah, and Lewis could steer Zane away from any no-go zones like Mako Island. This is good. Keep your friends close, 
keep your enemies out in the middle of the ocean. Now you're thinking like Zane. Why couldn't these boys become the mermaids? Why can't this show be about them? Yeah, it mostly is. I get that he's rich, but where did his ass get the Kim Possible boat? Oh, so you're just gonna stay there? Out at sea? Together? For hours? Lewis. Cleo dad throws his daughter the greatest surprise party ever, and she's being really unappreciative about it. You? You said you wouldn't. How could you? Not only does she run away, but runs at extreme speeds that the girls cannot see her seconds after she jets. Do you find destiny or does destiny find you? Hmm? Like things happen for a reason. Hey, ain't no laws when you're at sea, brother. Hey. Yeah. You ever wonder if I were here? The water boys are shaken by Mermaid Cleo having a moment. Lewis knows this while Zane is still on the hunt, but Lewis needs to prevent capture. So what do they do? Miko Island! Cleo, can you go sulk somewhere else, preferably not feet away from an attempted murderer? Really just terrible form, Zane. I could forgive a lot, but this is embarrassing. Damn, they got a real pony for this show? I guess we only care about sea creatures, huh? Lewis just sprints away. I'm starting to think none of these characters have object permanence. Leo is mad that everyone knew about her surprise party, but nobody warned her, as if that is not a surprise party. Also, her surprise party that she gets every year, the same day, her birthday. Cleo, baby, you probably should have expected this. After sulking long enough on a deserted island, she comes home to a proper adult party. But where are all the towels for the towel fight and the sippy cups for guests? Lewis gets a kiss on the cheek for nothing when he spent all day trying to help out Zane, who was, by the way, on the island with them. We see Lewis run over to Cleo, but then the scene changes to them at home. What is Zane supposed to think? He went there with a twink and then left without him. He doesn't know Cleo. Actually, how did they get back? Where is this dude? He was pretty hell-bent on tracking down the creature that saved him. Then the episode just ends. Are we not gonna talk about this? Dude has a villain origin story. I made jokes about the episodes actually having a substantial gap between them, but honestly, if you're going to air any episodes back to back that aren't the first two, it would be these two since they're the ones where Zane has the most cohesive arc or at least the beginning of one. Up until this point, I have watched all of the episodes in order and then also listed off their US air dates for when the episodes aired on Nickelodeon. But now, we got a mess on our hands. The next episode, The Big Chill, did not air in the US at all. And then the next episode, Love Sick, aired September 2008. The next two episodes after that also did not air on Nickelodeon. And then we go back to a weekly schedule in June which is before September, where the last seven episodes, aside from the actual last one, air in two episode increments on a Tuesday now. What happened to Sunday? Meaning the episode order for season one on Nickelodeon goes 14, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 16 months later. They aired every week, March through June, and then didn't air the finale of season one, and then aired episode 16 in September, and then we never saw the show again. But before we can get to that, I have elected to watch all of the episodes in proper episode order. As much as I'd love to skip ahead five episodes for some reason. I'm putting my stake in the sand before I watch these episodes. There are two potential possibilities for why these episodes did not air on Nickelodeon in the US, which I am going to refer to as the stoked possibility or the 16 possibility. You guys really should get that stoked video to a million. The stoked possibility, which is that a lot of these episodes used music licenses that Nickelodeon just did not want to pay. Despite me remembering the show really fondly and it being all over the internet right now, which we'll get to at the end, nothing about my perception of the show led me to believe that the show was actually doing really well. Maybe it had something to do with the fact that you aired them on Sunday nights or the 16 possibility. Something happens in these episodes that is deemably not appropriate for American children. A number of episodes of 16 did not air on Cartoon Network because in Canada, it is a show about teenagers for teenagers, but in America, it is a show about teenagers for children that want to be teenagers. Kids like to watch shows about teenagers and teenagers like to watch shows about teenagers, except they fuck each other all the time. So simplifying it, either these next crop of episodes have all time low or periods. And knowing what I know about the show, I think I can assume which one it is. Hey, you got your allegory for pu- no. Emma works at the local diner cafe slash pool table spot now. 
when did this happen? Like, I know the US skipped around episodes, but I'm watching these in the proper order. Meanwhile, Ricky is complaining about being broke, too broke to afford concert tickets. Only a few months have passed, which raises the question, what happened to all the illegal money you got for trafficking fish to the mafia? You guys thought I forgot about that, huh? Love the continuity that Cleo has a framed photo of her lame birthday party. Speaking of Cleo, she just claims Emma give a job to Ricky. One thing we know about Cleo, she loves dumping responsibility on people unasked. Emma, however, does not protest this and agrees to train Ricky while the real boss is away. This can't be legal. Well, that never stopped Ricky before. I think Emma just has a soft spot for Ricky. You're six minutes and ten seconds late. Should I go stand in the Nordic corner now or... Girl. We're seeing way more of this cafe than we've ever seen. This episode must be important. That being said, now that we realize its size, this place is always packed, and two is the most amount of active workers I've ever seen here. Emma sends Ricky over to serve popular girl and Zane, who she refuses to be nice to, even though she has in the past. Does this show have amnesia? Normally I'm on Ricky's side, but she actually does fuck up their order and then throws a fit about it. Like, I know service is hard, but she just is not good at her job. I would understand if the popular girl was upset. What I don't understand. Popular girl slinks back into the freezer to turn it off while Zane is called away by his evil dad. While this is happening, Ricky quits, which Emma is mad about, even though she didn't want her working there anyway. Or maybe she did, brother. Ooh, anyway, Emma uses her powers to freeze the whole walk-in fridge again, but freezes popular girl solid in the process. This feels like the lesson in an ancient fairy tale. This is entirely your fault, girl. Why are you in here? So that's why they didn't air this one in the US. They killed someone. The girls come together with their combined powers to try and revive the teenager they froze to death. Now Ricky's gonna use her power to gently warm the body. Don't call her that. Sorry. If I reference Buffy again, are you guys gonna understand it or should I just keep it to myself? I gotta say, if you're trying to hide the body, these windows are not very obscured. Ricky needs to keep the temperature steady while her girlfriend barks orders in her ear a foot away. The conflict of this episode is whether or not Ricky can keep her cool long enough to not overcook this girl. Someone knocks on the door and Emma is instantly thinks it's the cops and they're going to jail. Oh, it must be the water police. I understand why they didn't air this on Nickelodeon, but that doesn't make it any less of a bummer. Remember when Zane exploded? I've got Miriam's mother on the phone here. Tell her I wasn't with her last night. Hello? I'm not gonna lie to you, Zane. They're kind of in the right. I would also assume you murdered my daughter considering you tried to kill Cleo multiple times. Um, no, no, I can guarantee that Zane wasn't with Miriam last night. Categorically. How do I know? because he was with me. What do you, what do you mean by that? Ricky keeps the temp steady while Cleo bends her blood. Oh, so only some Nickelodeon shows can do that? I can't believe the Neptunes hide a body in this episode. In the end, it's Ricky that actually keeps her cool and saves the day because if it's one thing Ricky's good at, it's covering up crimes. Ricky later gets fired from the job. She already quit. Also, this dude did not hire her. He was not here for that. But all is well as Emma uses her bonus to buy three tickets to reward the girls for helping out her murder cover up. So just fuck Lewis then, huh? I should mention because I think I've forgot to bring it up in my script. The popular girl is fine. She unthawed. She is not dead. Yet. Normally, I would give a rundown and a recap in between episodes, but again, according to my chart, that last episode did not air on Nickelodeon, and this next episode did in September on a random Sunday in 2008. The last one, I understand why they wouldn't want to show it, kind of. This next one, I don't understand at all. This is the last new episode that aired in the US on Nickelodeon. Normally, I would do my little jokey jokes and observations, but for this next episode, I am simply going to list the sequence of events in the order they happened, and you will come to your own conclusion. No. Cleo, with nothing around her to trip her, drops her gifted necklace into the marine park. Then she goes mermaid mode when nobody is around, which catches the dolphin's attention. She feeds the dolphin, which no one has ever been able to do, leading her to believe something is up. Afterwards, the popular girl they nearly killed is flirting with boys. Maybe soft confirming that she split with Zane. He is the primary suspect in her murder. Or maybe they just swingers, I don't know. Cleo exclaims out loud that she wishes she got that attention, to which Zane approaches her with an inquisition. But Zane isn't here to flirt. He's actually trying to get access to the marine park after hours to do research. Cleo doesn't pick up anything strange about this and aids Zane in his hunt for his white whale. Cleo is on the phone with her boss at the marine park talking about dolphin that will only respond to her. The mom overhears this and thinks Cleo is talking to a boy. She instantly relays her suspicion to Cleo Jr. because this family loves fueling her already deteriorating mental state. Cleo Jr. then relays this info to the girlfriends, turning them also into paranoid freaks. Cleo Jr. suspects it's Lewis and takes an incriminating 
incriminating picture on her 2000s flip phone. Cleo's dad sees the image and becomes enraged because he hates this guy, as previously set up in this show. Cleo defends Zane's honor to Louis after he sees them talk. So, what do you know about Genghis Khan? Is that some sort of heavy metal band? Uh-oh. I know where this is going. Luckily, Cleo's dad steps in until they both overhear another phone call that they interpret to be the real boyfriend. Now, Lewis is going through the phone book to track who this mystery boy is. When they call, whose message is it? Zane. I can't tell if Lewis is more jealous of Zane or more jealous of Cleo. Hey, you guys ever seen Challengers? I know I already brought that up. Cleo is finally putting it together that this dolphin might have a crush on her, which, if you know anything about dolphins in captivity, is horrifying. I feel that Genghis Khan is actually an apt comparison. Since we're all figuring things out, Zane finally lets it slip that he's actually there researching the creature that saved his life episodes ago. Remember? When he exploded? We'll talk about this more later, but if I'm keeping track right now, uh, Lewis likes Cleo and has a love-hate relationship with Zane who everyone thinks like each other in this episode. Ricky was kind of interested in Zane, but maybe not anymore. She also showed a passing interest in Byron up until she kissed Emma, and then Ricky and Emma are still cooking. The dolphin at the marine park is sick, and Cleo is the only one that can help. The dad assumes Cleo is lying about this because she sounds a lot like she's doing a liar voice. I think Cleo just talks like this man. So she is grounded, but she escapes, to which Cleo Jr. squeals, because that's what she does. Why is she hell-bent on telling on Cleo? Was it the gaslighting thing? You know what? I think I answered my own question. This is stupid. What's Ronnie doing over there? Is that the pregnant dolphin they rescued the other day? Yeah, that's Jemima. Terrible name. Absolutely terrible. Change it, please. As it turns out, the dolphin was not in love with Cleo's mermaid form, but was actually in love with the unfortunately named girl dolphin. Everything is right in the world. Hold on, wasn't there just a bunch of whole other other people? Every character involved, even the evil dad, shows up to stop what they think is a wedding between Cleo and Zane, which Zane takes umbrage with, which makes sense considering he used to actively try to kill her. Can we be done with this? I really hate misunderstanding stories. Who at last we meet? Um, Louis? No, Cleo, no. This is about, this is about honor and integrity. You and me, Zane, outside right now. I can't tell whether or not this would earn Lewis any brownie points. Would this work on you? In the end, all I could think about the entire episode was- I've got a problem. Well, what's the matter? This dolphin fell in love with me. Well, things are very confusing. No wonder they gave up trying to air episodes after that one. We won't be back into the normal Nickelodeon schedule for at least two more episodes. So here are those two episodes. <laughs> I sometimes forget that this show, while having a fantastical plot, is very much a sitcom, a comedy of errors. Today's episode, Emma studied really hard for a test, but all the girls have to miss school because it's raining. Maybe I've never been to Australia, and maybe I'm just so used to the post-climate change world, but this hasn't happened yet. From January to April, it hasn't rained once before this. This is a new challenge. When confronted with this new challenge, Cleo instantly passes out. But it's okay, she was just faking being sick so that they can stay home. For a while, I couldn't even tell that's what was happening because her lying voice sounds just like her regular voice. She just talks like that. Emma's parents begin to take Cleo's temperature, so Ricky boils the insides of her mouth to keep the illusion up. Surely there must have been a safer way to do that. Emma hates lying to her mom, even though she been doing exactly that for months now. The lie gets deeper and deeper as now a doctor is in the house as all three of these girls are pretending to be sick. Once again, the doctor wants to check something pretty uniform, so Ricky boils Emma's skin. The doctor now realizes there is something seriously wrong with them and suggests house-wide quarantine. Nobody comes in and nobody goes out. So of course, Lewis shows up at the door and Emma's dad makes him leave. Man, Dads hate this guy. Make dads hate you with this one simple trick. The three sick girls are all sharing one bed, festering in sickness like the Bucket family from Willy Wonka. It's disgusting. Thanks for calling, Lisa. I've left a message for Ricky's father, but we all have to come straight out. Sorry, what? Who? Is that all we're gonna hear about this guy? If things weren't already spiraling, the two youngest kids are conspiring again. The little brother clearly learned his lesson after the embarrassment last time and does not trust Cleo Jr. Lewis sneaks in, but then, oh no, the doctor comes back and he has to hide under the bed. How will he get out of this wacky situation? To add more stress to the pile, a wet towel transforms the Neptunes as basically everyone enters the room and talks over each other. Lewis is right, we shouldn't have lied. Okay, quick, please, some dry towels? As opposed to what? I mean, I guess the last towels they were handed were wet. Certainly too wet for a classic towel fight. Cleo Jr. overhears some questionable stuff happening in the girls' room and runs to tattle a la Candace Flynn. The storm is over now, and look, 
a rainbow. That's for you, Ricky. So Lewis is just gonna like walk out of the front door. The girls have made a miraculous recovery, but the doctor is not having it. She demands that everyone must stay in quarantine. Hey lady, you've been in and out of here and you are not wearing your mask. Please remain calm. See, now these guys are goddamn professionals. There's like five minutes left in this episode. I actually do not know how they could possibly get out of this one. In the end, it's a lie within a lie revealed that saves the day. Emma claims that they faked sick to get out of the test the audience knows she was prepared for. This is a tactic known as softening the blow. Basically, if you confess to a lesser crime from what you actually did, you'll still get punished, but it'll be a much lighter punishment. And whoever was on you and was willing to punish you is now off your trail. It's good fun. On, try it at home. But somehow the little brother does have the measles and then Cleo Jr. also gets them. The 2000s were a magical time. I feel like we should be more concerned about that. I know I keep repeating myself, but specifically with this one, since nobody died, that episode did not air on Nickelodeon and I don't know why. Is it because they lied or because they got really sick? Are the measles more serious in the West? It just doesn't make any sense. But on the bright side, I'm glad this was kind of a soft filler episode because then we didn't get any major character changes or development lost in translation. Well, that's a foreboding title. It begins as Zayn has a horrifying flashback nightmare about the sea creature that saved his life. You guys remember. When Zayn exploded. Popular girl, what are you doing here? It's the night of another full moon. Happy late May, everybody. While the Neptunes are preparing, Zayn shows up, but he is not here for Cleo. He wants her dad. The fisherman to help hunt down his white whale. He puts out a bounty for anyone who can bring him the creature that saved his life. And I'm just gonna tell you right now, all this amounts to in this episode is Zane learning that he should consolidate his search to Mako Island. Okay, didn't he know this? Like that's why he searched there with Lewis episodes ago, right? He had to find out to look at Mako Island. Despite trying everything, boarding up doors and plugging crevices, the reflection of the moon still hits Ricky's eyes. So it's Ricky's turn now. And she is cooking. There's gotta be a reason for this. You don't think that the moon no way. No way. How could something that only shows up once a month make a woman's body get inexplicably hot? Uh oh. Hey, you got your allegory for pew? Ricky is heating up everything around her and she can't control it. Just toss her in the bath or a pool or something. Well, great, now everyone's seen the moon. Luckily enough, the water witch is here with answers. But the only safe place is the moon pool on Mako Island. That would have been good information to know months ago. Why must you be cryptic on purpose? Lewis name drops Yoda. I know this isn't a Canadian show, but I'm still counting it as a win for the bros. <laughs> Lewis wants to prevent them from going outside as the moon will touch them. But like, has it ever been about touching the moon or the moon beaming down on them? I just thought they shouldn't look at it, right? Ricky causes a forest fire while Zane shows up to the island by himself at the same time. Ricky collapses on the ground, had enough. She can't take the pressure of trying to remain chill the whole time. She's tired of no one understanding her. And Zane sits beside her, feeling the same way. Everyone thinks he's crazy, even his own father and friends. Ricky was the only one who believed him at least to his face. Maybe they have more in common than they thought. No one understands. I know exactly how that feels. You're a mess. Well, Zane's dead for real now. I understand why, kind of, but this is a pretty important episode for development and we didn't even see it. It's because they killed someone again, isn't it? They're rushing like a ticking clock to get Ricky to the moon pool, but like, don't they just have to wait for the moon to set? Like, honestly, I would just lie down and close my eyes until the next day. Let's go, hot tub, hell yeah. Ricky was sulking a lot, but she wasn't acting weird like Emma and Cleo did. But when the moon set, she also has no memory of what happened. It's insane that all three of them got possessed by the moon and ended up kissing different boys. Uh, the moon makes you go a little crazy sometimes. Too bad Ricky's turn was killing someone. Nah, Zane's okay. He's just really sunburned. What I mean is, That must have been one hell of a kiss. Hell, he said hell. 
Or is that why they didn't air this in the West? Not because of the almost death? Zane, for whatever reason, does not suspect this as an important clue in his hunt for the creature that saved his life. It's been a while since we've gotten more character development, mostly from Zane, because the last crop of episodes have been, isn't this a wacky situation episode? Should I consult the board again? But now, finally, at episode 19, we are back to airing on Nickelodeon for the time being. But unfortunately, when I say back, I mean we're back to airing two episodes back to back on a Tuesday with nothing following it. Here are those episodes. Cleo and Cleo Jr. get into a fight over a broken MP3 player, which results in the little one refusing to do the dishes for her anymore. They enter the living room yelling at each other, and the dad immediately, without saying anything, bails. The Neptunes question Cleo's lack of foresight with using her powers for bad, as if she wasn't already the riskiest of them all. They're still fighting? The sisters have made a pact to not fight each other while their cousin Angela visits, as her parents are going through a tough patch. I swear this is the same plot as that Friendship is Magic episode. Has this chick never seen a bed before? Is she an alien? She keeps smiling like a freak. She's scaring me. I love the way this dad reacts to the girls' fights. Really playing it up for the people in row Z. Can we go on the volcano ride? I thought you hated rides. Angela wants to go on. Water. Good guy Lewis steps in for Cleo, having fun with the whole family. While Cleo sulks. He looks pissed. He looks pissed at you. He was. Cleo, if you wanted to watch the kids safely and also avoid water, maybe don't go to the marine park? I know I keep saying that, but I feel like I'm the asshole here. In a very short amount of time, Cleo manages to lose both her little sister and little cousin, but then finds her little sister, and now there's a pelican in the house. Yeah, I don't know, man. By this point, they've just given up on the magical girl transformation animation. They just cut into mermaid. Probably saves a lot on time. Hello? Yes, I'm, I'm just waiting at home in case Angela comes back. Okay, I will. Thank you. That was the police. They called you? The rest of the Neptunes are here to help with Cleo's weird, confusing side adventure. I don't care what anyone says. I love filler. Cleo Jr. defends her case, yelling that she did not steal this bird from the marine park. Cleo doesn't believe her and carries it back in a box with holes. But then Cleo gets blamed by her boss, using the exact same words Cleo used for her little sister. Someone who doesn't understand that shouldn't be working in a marine park. You mean I could lose my job? I don't think there's a could. Here, I think you did lose your job. Cleo socks while precariously dangling her feet above the water. C Cleo! Apparently that pelican isn't one that belonged to the marine park, so her boss thinks she actually is bringing in a hurt animal. I'm gonna be real, we're coming near the end of the episode. I still do not know how these two plots are related at all. I forgot the cousin existed. The other Neptunes find Angela and return to the house to question her. And what we glean from this is Angela took the pelican, but not from the marine park from a regular park. Uh, who is this? Are you an alien? Angela used the sister's pension for fighting to slink away and commit several crimes. Are we ever gonna see this girl again? I never noticed she was holding corn in this scene. Okay, I'm done with this. It's sweet to see the sisters reconcile. I guess it wasn't wholly a waste of time. Maybe? The same day aired back to back, technically not summer yet, June 1st, 2008. Completely unrelated episode. <laughs> Lewis is excited to enter the yearly fishing competition with Cleo. It's cute, they're sharing interests. But his excitement is dashed as Cleo backs out due to the water-related risks. I know there's a scene happening here, you know, with like dialogue that I should pay attention to, but is Cleo making a sandwich with only honey and mayo? Anyway, I've got something more important to do. See, like, how are Nickelodeon kids expected to know what's happening? Cleo still comes out to support her awkward friend in his lame competition. Every single one of these boys is wearing a different type of hat, and yet they're all pretty bad. Did this dude just tip his fedora in real life? Lewis picks a fight with the fedora boy after he tripped him into the water. This is just embarrassing, Lewis. Getting bullied by a man of this caliber? Oh no, Ricky and Zane accidentally got all dressed up and attended the same seminar. I hope this doesn't mean anything more for these characters. Run to the end of the pier and scream, hey, I'm back. Why do you care so much? Well, because I just do. do you think Emma and Byron are somewhere off screen also having a romantic storyline? Seven kilos, you are in the lead. Cool. Hey, Lewis, you may as well just pack up that pretty little rod of yours now, mate. That pretty little rod. Huh? 
Excuse me? Lewis, you're embarrassing the both of us. Cleo then slinks away from the competition and into the water after watching Lewis get owned. While Cleo bailed on Lewis at his lowest, Emma is here to not only morally support him, but also feed him delicious sandwiches that aren't made of mayo and honey like a freak. I mean, technically we've seen a lot more of Emma and Lewis than Cleo and Lewis at this point. But in actuality, Cleo is under the water, directing fish into Lewis's bait. Is this any different from the sea turtles? Why draw the line there? Like, I guess they are throwing them back, but I feel like that's not much better. Meanwhile, Ricky questions Zane on why he doesn't stand up to his dad, which he seems really receptive to. They check out the balcony of this huge luxury hotel room, which accidentally locks them out. Uh-oh, somebody contact Wattpad. A favor for a friend. It's okay, Cleo, I understand. We all know you like Lewis. Do we all know that? I feel like it's pretty unclear up until this point. Ricky attempts to hurt Zane by insulting his father's morality as if he doesn't already have terrible daddy issues. At the same time, Lewis is accosted by the fisherman's gang as they assume he's cheated in the competition, which he did. Like, knowingly? No, but he did cheat. Lewis is knocked out of the competition and banned from Cleo's dad's house. You can play my daughter but never ruin the sanctity of fishing. Zane begins to get claustrophobic or scared of how high up they are as the music swells and he snaps on Ricky, blaming her for all of this. No. Trust no, me. No, I, I can't. Trust me. Trust me. <sighs> Pretend I'm a painting or something you admire. A painting? Or a speedboat or some stupid car. Something that makes you happy. Feeling better? I'm starting to remember why I liked the show so much as a kid, but I'm a bitter, loveless old man now. Cleo apologizes to Lewis, or at least she tries to. I don't know if they're doing this on purpose, but Cleo convinces Emma to help her make things right by invoking Lewis's name. Is this a triangle? I actually can't tell. Where is Byron? Ricky and Zane bond over how much their dads dislike them. Ricky even lied about being here with her dad. It saves on having to cast someone. While Ricky is close friends with the girls, they all have perfect nuclear families. In reality, Reality, Zane is the only one close to her that understands what it's like. But then it rains. Doesn't rain for months and then rains like every other week. But she manages to get very little shelter. Emma and Cleo help prove that Lewis wasn't cheating by cheating again. Zane's dad ruins the moment, which begins an argument. Is this scene even mic'd? Honestly, if you have to waste time with a girl, at least pick one with a future, like one of those down at the seminar. Her name is Ricky. And she was one of the girls at the seminar, only smarter. She didn't fall for it. And by the way, I'm not your errand boy, so stop treating me like one. Ricky gets to ruminate on the strange but nice evening she had with a guy she previously thought nothing of when Zane returns to retrieve his jacket. Kiss. Let's see if Cleo and Lewis can top that. The real makeup is that Cleo's dad finally accepts Lewis as a fellow fisher and a man. A bonding opportunity. At the very least, he won over the dad. That's gotta count for something. Ricky withholds information after meeting back up with the Neptunes. Now, she lives two double lives. Or triple lives? Oh, maybe it is a triangle. We got three more weeks of this, so let's quickly jump into the batch of episodes that aired on June 8th, 2008. Again, a Tuesday. They've now been moved to Tuesday. <laughs> How many of these titles are fishing related? I didn't really notice it till right now. Oh, I fucking knew it. We're due for a Byron episode. Emma gets her moment. That being said, she does seem to prod Ricky about the day she went missing, but Ricky refuses to give details. The water witch is very concerned about something, but you can't trick me. I've seen the episode title. I'm not falling for anything. The three of us are like best friends. No secrets, right? Right, right. I'm glad. Zane and Ricky have a classic walk and talk on the beach about whether or not they should go out. But neither of them think their friends will support him. But he says it in a much more charming way. Guys, I don't think Ricky Zane would be endgame, but this is honestly the only one I'm pulling for right now. The Water Witch, who remember Zane evicted in a previous episode, seems personally concerned that Ricky is talking to him. For some reason, who, who can say, you know, who's to tell? Emma is upset with how predictable she's become, so she does what any tween girl would do, dye her hair red. I did this exact same thing, except I was 18, so technically legal adult, and it looked awful. Lewis catches Zane Googling the water witch. We don't ever see what he's typing exactly, because 
What would you even look up for that? I've changed my mind about what I deem Endgame. I'm also a fan of Zane Lewis. This is exactly like the 2005 Doctor Who pilot. And the pink opaque. Any excuse to get back to your, your monster hunting, this is a hoax. For your information, there were other witnesses to this guy's story. Zane, it was the 50s, it, reds under the beds, people imagining there were communist subs everywhere, all kinds of stuff. Back off. So true, Lewis. Hey Zane, did you ever like, break up with your girlfriend? Does she- She's right there. The boys find an old newsreel of the water which has a young woman and a man who came across a sea creature of his own with the exact same sketch Zane made. You know, after he exploded. The music and reactions make me think that Emma's hair is supposed to look really bad, but it, it's fine. It's pretty. Was this considered comically red hair in the 2000s? <laughs> I can't trust what you say. You have red hair and pronouns. Cleo has to leave for work, so she just let Zane into Emma's house. She does this a lot, actually. Zane needs to talk to Emma for some reason, specifically Emma, but the hair dye included water, so she's full on aerial mode. She manages to dry herself fast enough, which undyes her hair. Does that make any sense? Zane needs to talk to the water witch and thinks Emma is the best way to find her. He's hunting the sea creature. I think she knows more about that sea creature thing than she's letting on. Why do you think? I remember I was on her boat and there was all this really, really weird stuff. I remember that too, Zane. You exploded. Oh my god, no way. Are we getting an actual flashback of the scene I keep flashing back to? So is Zane the red herring or is the red herring referring to the red hair. If I was one of these girls and I learned that only changes that happen when I'm in mermaid mode stay when I'm a mermaid, I'd get sick tattoos all over whatever skin I actually have. I don't think you can get them on the scales. Zane confronts the water witch trying to look intimidating with the lamest stance ever. Cleo threatens his life and you know what? I've forgiven Zane and maybe so has Ricky, but I feel like if any two characters have a right to hate this guy, it's these two. He exploded her house and sent Cleo out to sea to die and also the motorcycle. How come we never see that anymore? The Neptunes convene to stop Zane from snooping around the shipwreck and finding mermaid proof, and Ricky leaves pretty nonchalantly. You guys aren't questioning this at all? A lot is at stake here. Oh, but Cleo has to return to her job. Yeah, okay, is Zane friends with the Fedora King? Man, this universe is getting bigger and bigger. I think he was actually his sidekick earlier. Ricky attempts to stop Zane from hunting this sea monster, that he's too obsessed, but he doesn't let up. Considering their fling started because she's the only one that didn't think he was crazy, this must really hurt. But we can't unpack that now. We've got a shark infested island to go back to. Dude, the red looks sick underwater. Why would the show ever convince anyone this isn't cool as fuck? Ariel dives underwater to uncover the picture of the mermaids from the 50s that is still intact somehow. And then, well. The Neptunes take the photo of the old group home and wonder what drove them apart. But I think we already have an answer for that earlier in the episode. Communism. Wait, you thought the red herring was referring to the red hair? No. Emma wants to turn her mermaid hair back, even though, if anything, it gives her even more cover. I think they did that solely so Zane can go on another wild goose chase, chasing a mermaid with red hair. They're gonna put this dude in an asylum. Nobody <laughs> believes this guy. Zane, I think the oxygen got cut off to your brain. Look, babe, maybe you need to chill for a while. He's so dramatic. Ricky pities him and decides to go out with him only if he drops the mermaid hunt, which seems awful. Like, I'm no counselor, but you probably shouldn't start seeing someone to get him off your tail. I didn't mean for that to be a fish pun. But what do I know about teenage romance? Nothing but I know a whole lot about shows made for children. We're still in June 8th on Nickelodeon and I see no reason to stop trucking forward. Surely the plot will move forward as well. America. Guys, I'm not gonna lie. I think I hate these episode titles. Movie theater, let's go. Another win for the import shows. I don't even know what counter I'm gonna put up there. Just put a weird logo, I don't know. Beach ball. Mm. Cleo and Emma catch Ricky on her date with Zane and they relay their suspicions to Lewis who immediately goes into denial mode. I'm sorry, Lewis. I gotta get everything out of my system and then never talk about romance again. It's been going too far. Why would they be keeping a secret otherwise? Well, I followed Zane around all day today. Lewis. Lewis. Zane almost immediately reneges on their deal, the catalyst for them dating, and starts info dumping about mermaids. 
She's so real sometimes. Personally, if I had to choose between having a girlfriend and talking about mermaids, well, I'm here, aren't I? Against my will, sure, but here nevertheless. The Neptunes meet at Mako Island to confront Ricky about keeping secrets from them. Emma regrets saving his life, kind of implying that he should have died. You know, when he exploded. What do you know about this Ricky girl? Enough to know that I like her. Have you met a family? No. Nobody has. Emma and Ricky get into a heated argument while Cleo stands back there looking like a sad child. Emma needs Ricky to stop seeing Zane, and Ricky says very specifically, friends don't give each other ultimatums. But that's not reserved for boyfriends? Isn't that how you started dating? It's, it's literally an ultimatum. Zane buys Ricky a very expensive gift, a dress, and it's even Ricky red. If the dress is blue, that's an entirely different person. That's Kira. Don't even get me started on black. I should proofread these, actually. Let's fucking go, pink DS, and it even makes the spring Candy. noise. Ah, oh, I love the year 2008. Emma and family end up at the same house party being thrown by the Zane family, which Ricky is attending as his date. I feel like I'm getting farther and farther away from English, and I don't mean Australian. It was red, it was Alex. Elegant and sexy. Elegant and sexy? That doesn't sound like Ricky. All right, Cleo, damn. Zane's dad is like the onceler in more ways than one. What do you mean by that? He's looking to colonize Mako Island, which is ironic coming from an Australian. Zane embarrasses his girlfriend with mermaid talk again. She doesn't get him like I do. What do you mean by that? Ricky flees to Mako Island in mermaid mode and has a dramatic flashback to the first episode. I think I should specify, this is not the finale. It's like a good four or five episodes away from that. She's remembering holding hands with Emma. Yeah, these are all from the first two episodes, or sorry, TV movie. She brought the dress? Or wait, did she transform in the dress? That raises an important question. If the clothes also transform when they're wet, does it mean their clothes never get wet? Like while they're wearing them, but only while they're wearing them? Well, now she's back at the party in her tomboy apparel. I guess Cleo was right. She had to go on a soul searching journey to realize that Zane's dad was bad. Also, how long was she gone? If you want to go on playing ventriloquist dummy to your dad, you can forget about being with me. Get this straight. I am not Miriam. So you can stay here or you can come with me. Sit down, Zane. You just don't get it, do you? Let's fucking go, you tell him. That's my attempted murderer. Maybe that's why these two get along so well. Remember when Zane died again? Ricky killed him. You remember when he exploded? In the end, the girls give Ricky their blessing to go see the guy that tried to send Cleo out to sea. Cute. According to my count in season one, there's only four episodes left and we're still in June 2008. You think they would do their best to space them out? They did not do that. Nickelodeon was fed up with this show. Oh, the one about puberty where they keep killing people? Get rid of it. No Zane and Ricky are having a cute little moment until the mood is ruined as soon as Zane brings up mermaids again. Ricky finds a locket that looks exactly like Cleo's that she got from Emma who took it from the ocean. Maybe we should just concentrate on finding out more about the locket. What locket? Julia. Water Witch finds out that her old mermaid friend Julia has died. Man, they're dropping like flies. Also, total drama name. There are only three lockets in existence. The one the witch has, the one Cleo has, and the one in the store. Good news, Emma. You just need to wait for one more old lady to die, then you can match. We see a flashback of the mermaids from the 50s, and to match the time period, they're all dressed and styled like teen beach movie. Okay, so really anyone can gain its power as long as they swim in the pool during the full moon. Ricky begs people for money so she can buy the locket, but does not ask her rich boy boy friend or resort to even more crime. But it's too late, popular girl already bought it. Ricky immediately calls a domestic disturbance and gets mad at Zane for breaking it up. Ricky questions if Zane still has feelings for that girl, which is laughable. He never liked her. I'm surprised he remembered her name. What happened to us, Zane? We never broke up. Miriam. We were never together. See what I mean? Ah, oh, labels, am I right? They clearly filmed these flashbacks in bulk because a lot of these scenes are set at the moon pool. Apparently the thing that drove the past mermaids apart is that one of them had a secret boyfriend that she chose over the team. What are the odds? Men, am I right? She never really got over the betrayal.
Whoa, I get it. It seems the lockets acted as sort of promise rings, as it's what the girls gave each other to promise they'd always stay together. And then they didn't, like real promise rings. Zayn continues to hunt for his mystery sea creature with the Fedorid Warrior. In the background of this episode, Lewis has been grinding to make enough money for the locket because nobody told him that was already sold. Zayn sells his body to get the locket back from the popular girl, but Ricky and Lewis walk in at the worst time. Lewis is heartbroken. Oh yeah, and Ricky. I sold my hair to buy you this watch chain. I sold my watch to gift you this comb. If my significant other gave me a comb for Christmas, I would never see the light of day again. Pop Girl pulls a Titanic and tosses the locket into the ocean. And Emma goes under to find it, and so does Zane. Did they ever explain how or why they unredded her hair? That wasn't canon. Apparently the mermaids have like Jedi super speed that they never use. Zane is a strange character. If I almost drowned, I would never go in the water again. Remember? When he exploded. Zane leaves because the girls are being weird, as if he isn't weird all the time now. Ricky denounces boys and sides with the witch and Neptunes, who rewards her for agreeing to never be vulnerable again. Cool show. This belongs to you. You kept the secret. You deserve this, Ricky. Wow and she didn't even need to die. All is well as the status quo of the earlier episodes is reverted. The girls are closer than ever with no boys allowed. I wonder what Lewis is up to. He keeps doing side quests that we just do not see. He's always somewhere just right off screen. Something about that title makes me think we're about to see some very questionable behavior. I remember Vampire. I don't know why the Neptunes get to decide this, but they all get the idea to have the school dance at the local diner cafe slash pool table spot. Considering we only have so many locations and they just specified that it can't be the marine park, not a whole lot of options. Lest we have the dance on Mako Island. The man who runs the cafe just kind of lets Emma do whatever she wants now. Byron always looks like he's dubbed. I think he might have a concussion. Apparently this dance is gonna be the last time their class is together before summer. So I think we are firmly in early June. In real life on Nickelodeon in 2008. I'm not saying this mermaid show was super grounded before, but Lewis says he's cracked the formula on making the girls waterproof, but I've read the title, I know where this is going. When did this show become Johnny Test? Emma refuses to ask Byron to the dance as she wants him to ask her. Same with Cleo, who is unfortunately really interested in a bucket-hatted oblivious boy. And Ricky is there. She's retired now. Lewis, is there anything you wanted to ask me? Yes, there is actually. Really? And what would that be? Um, well, I, I, was, I was kind of embarrassed to ask in front of the other girls, but He wants a sample of my earwax. Not only did Lewis royally blow it, but now Cleo is going with the Fedora Lord. If you still like to come to dance with me. Cool. Oi! Wear something short. Tight. Cleo is young, she's learning. I'm not gonna blame Cleo. That being said, you can't even say that Lewis was wasting time because somehow in his evil scientist lab, he created a waterproof solution, like it works. Lewis finally realizes what's going on and asks Cleo too late. Also, he isn't dressed up at all. Oh wait, Zane is just here? I thought I said something short and tight. What? Nothing. Should we get going? Lewis, you're not coming? Um, I'm like, Get there later. Zane, you are with the wrong person. Cleo's father, who's grown a liking to Lewis after realizing he didn't cheat at the fishing competition when he definitely did, talks Lewis up to go get her, her being his daughter. At least someone's having fun. Is that what that is? Lewis finally shows up in a real suit, but unfortunately Cleo must be polite and dance with the dude who sucks hard style. Man, being a teen girl sounds tough. The second Ricky steps away from Zane, popular girl swoops in and then Lewis is dragged away by a stranger. Did they not have like consent? in the 2000s? There's like 20 people here, Max, and still absolutely no space. Why did you choose this location? Lewis tries to help Ricky being accosted by the popular gang, but unfortunately he's having a Luigi Smithers moment. All three of the main girls start breaking out in red? 
Oh, like the herring! The Neptunes dress down Lewis for just trying to help before he is snatched away by the canonical pageant winner. You know what? You made this guy wash cars last episode. I think he deserves to be happy a little bit. Damn, the bros are drowning. Byron is sulking with them even though he didn't even bring Emma. Dude, you have a date. Okay, there's like five minutes left and Lewis is talking to the water, which I don't think we're actually going to see a love potion. That's a nice change of pace for these types of shows. He asked to go to the dance. He'd feel responsible for it. But he didn't ask her. She asked him. Tiffany told me between handstands. Lewis, please, you cannot let that girl go. Like, I know this is the classic childhood sweetheart and you've been fighting for a while, but Cleo is as dumb as a pile of bricks. You gotta get out there. Zayn is waiting for someone. Sorry. I misspoke. All the girls get to dance with their favorite boys as the school year presumably comes to an end. Lewis and Cleo finally discuss their feelings for each other under the light of the moon. That is not full. And then once again, this time without the power of the full moon, Cleo and Lewis kiss. What a nice and efficient way to wrap up so many storylines in season one, but don't get too comfortable yet. There's still two episodes left. One of them is the final H2O Just Add Water episode to air in America on Nickelodeon. And the other is the actual season finale. So yeah, the season one finale didn't actually air in the West, which could mean two things. Either the penultimate episode acted as a suitable enough finale and they just didn't want to air anymore, or the Neptunes kill someone in the finale. Only one way to find out. It's crazy that we've spent months together and the witch is only now training the Neptunes. But forget about that, it's the full moon again. That means we're in July, baby. That's why it didn't air on Nickelodeon. It was too early. Zane talks to Ricky like nothing happened and goes on to tell her that he's found proof of mermaid. Zane, you're so lucky to get a third chance and you're royally blowing it again. The Neptunes talk out loud at the local cafe diner slash pool table spot and for the first time after 26 episodes, they consider you know, maybe we shouldn't be saying this out loud in a heavily populated area. And it's Cleo who suggests that. Is this the power of the full moon? Is she smart now? Truly everyone is here. This universe is vast. Our stories are converging. It's the scientist who groomed Lewis, remember? from before. I hope the water mafia that Ricky worked with shows up. She questions Lewis on his cell sample that transforms when water touches it, but he gives up nothing. He's got an iron soul. Unfortunately, she already has photo evidence of the girls as mermaids. Again, he denies it all as the scientists hired goons hold him hostage. The girls are called to Mako Island to rescue him, but are instead trapped by the science woman and her bald squad. Now that the jig is up, they could fully use their powers to try and kill her. As she shows them that they have Lewis trapped in a vault that he will never escape if they don't cooperate. And then, big reveal. You're just in time. And so are you, girls. You can meet the man who's been funding this. Extraordinary. What is this? Ricky? This. It's not my fault. Zane, this is entirely your fault. Like even before you knew they were mermaids, you did help kidnap Lewis. Zane says he can't do anything, which is probably true, right? Like there's a ton of witnesses, they have to die. Oh, is that why this episode never aired in the US? Zane goes to the only person he can trust, Lewis. Once again, when the chips are down, Zane goes to Lewis for help. <laughs> Okay, so that's one body. Look at this dude swim, and he's not even a mermaid. Lewis uses the speedboat to rip the gates off the hinges as the girls escape. Okay, but like, they still know what they look like. I'm almost certain Zane's dad knows where they live. The water witch showing up only now reminds me that, wasn't it supposed to be a full moon? I thought that's what this was gonna be about. She lets it slip that now that they're found out and likely have to stay on the run, they do have the option to give up their powers. Only at special times. Very special moments, like tonight. As I said, it's not just any full moon. Tonight's a lunar eclipse. Exactly. The full moon is one thing, but the lunar eclipse makes it very special. If you were in the moon pool during the eclipse, it would draw away your powers. But without your powers, you're of no use to those people, are you? 
I feel like the goon squad doesn't know that. Like, I feel like they very much will still hunt these girls, but then they just won't have the powers to defend themselves. This is a bad idea. Zane's dad gives up on the hunt and begins the lengthy process and making up years of torture and lies to his very troubled son. As are, are these lights supposed to be in the shot? The lunar eclipse slowly moves into position as the girls link hands and stand in front of the moon pool at Mako Island. Emma says she'll miss her underwater speed. Cleo says that she'll miss controlling water. Ricky gives a more vague response, but we know if she never got these powers, she likely wouldn't have gotten close to Cleo or Emma or Lewis or Zane. She'd just be another lonely loser girl whose dad we have still yet to see. But then, disaster strikes. <laughs> I think they actually were going to kill her. I'm no scientist, but I'm pretty sure if you freeze and boil water at the same time, you'll create uh, a tornado, if I remember school correctly. The scientist attempts to prevent the girls from removing their powers, but she's too stunned to move. As the girls enter the moon pool at the precise moment, the lunar eclipse blasts the pool with a beam of light, making the Neptunes, mermaids, no more. The next day, Ricky and Zane have one final meeting where they agree to remain friends. When Zane excitedly runs over to his dad, who's now making an effort to understand his son and be a part of his life. I guess this really is the best way to say goodbye to our beloved character. Lewis and the Water Witch were the only ones that knew it wouldn't work, but he knew to not let the girls know as they could likely not lie convincingly, which is true. Lewis is right here. Lewis gets punished by his new girlfriend by being lifted into the air with water powers. Thank God, I had no feasible idea how they could realistically squeeze two more seasons out of this show about ordinary girls. This was always part of the plan to do two seasons, each with 26 episodes, so a total of 52 that they could rerun in syndication. And of course, I've looked at the Wikipedia, I've tallied together all the episodes, I knew the show wasn't going to end, but I also assembled all the episodes air dates, at least in the US, and we know that season two never aired on Nickelodeon, at least not in the US. And they didn't even air the season finale. I don't know why. There's violence, sure, but not any more violent than any of their other shows. Maybe they did the Angry Beavers thing where they just didn't want anyone to know that they had stopped syndicating the show on Nickelodeon, but that wouldn't even make sense because then you don't even get reruns. What do you have to gain by not showing kids the finale? I know I've compared the girls' powers to like water bedding and Avatar, but even like iCarly was way more violent than this show. Timmy Turner has definitely killed people. Or so I thought. As it turns out, despite on the guide it saying that episode 25 never had a proper air date in the US, the two final episodes were actually aired back to back and paired together as, you'll never believe this, a fake TV movie. Nickelodeon's run of H2O Just Add Water died the way it lived as a fake TV movie that just two episodes back to back. I couldn't find any ads for this, but I'm certain it happened. The movie was called H2O Exposed. All of that to say, I don't know why they gave up on this show. From everything I could find about it, it seemed like it was pretty popular amongst tweens. I mean, people are still talking about it. I'm still talking about it. It even won a Kids' Choice Award in Australia. I also did not know they had different ceremonies for each region, making my previous video outdated. Stoked, I understand. They moved it around to a bunch of different days all the time and they didn't want to pay the expensive music licenses and the show just wasn't doing anything for them, at least not as big as 16 or Total Drama were. And I guess honestly, if we're looking where Nickelodeon was in 2008, uh, H2O being this teen show for teens, they didn't really need it. But you know what? Damn it, I do. I'm invested now. I didn't remember a whole lot about the show, not nearly as much as Babysitter or Stoked. But from here on out, I know I'm going to be watching episodes for sure I have never seen. Can they keep up the series momentum in season two? How will the girls grapple with the handful of people that now know their secret? What about their romantic lives? Did Zane explode off screen? Will we ever see him again? <laughs> I don't think I can play any of this for you, and maybe it won't mean anything since you haven't been hearing it anyway, but they re-recorded the theme song with a new band for some reason. Also, I've been watching these on YouTube, and the top comment of this episode is, the full moon is like a period for mermaids. 
Astute observation as always, YouTube comment section. We open with a montage of swimming under the ocean, set to what I think is licensed music. Close enough, welcome back, stoked. <laughs> Emma and Ricky, now without their boys, continue to challenge each other in a flirty manner. Cleo is also there. We're so back. We need to reestablish their powers just in case someone decides to jump in on season two for some reason. Ricky uses her heat powers to cook Cleo's hot chocolate, and Emma uses her ice powers to cool it down. A loving Lewis appears, kissing his girlfriend, to present his newest plan for avoiding the full moon, which is happening again, meaning it's at the earliest August. They say that they've all been affected every full moon, except for the last one. Kind of, that didn't really do anything. Lewis put in a lot of work finding out the precise timing the moon will rise and set, and no one respects him, barely his girlfriend. I know the characters are color-coded and all, I appreciate it, but I'm fairly certain this is the only outfit we've ever seen Cleo Jr. wear. Hey, just because mom and dad are split up, it doesn't mean you're in charge. Wait, what? Are we, are we gonna talk about that? I liked it better when your mother handled these things. Not that we can't work this out together, right? Did I miss something? Is there a season I didn't watch? Your mother bought two tickets to this concert before she, you know, before she left. Dad, it's not your fault. Okay, so actually what is going on here? Considering we've only ever seen this guy throw lame ass parties and be bad at fishing, I guess she could do better. We don't need her anyway. Lewis says the Neptunes have at least an hour before the moon rises, but like, it's there, I can definitely see it. I know it's not all the way in the sky yet, but does that matter? I thought they just needed to look at the full moon to be affected. While the girls stay at home, the moon pool over at Mako Island is bubbling up. We're gonna go upstairs and have a pillow fight in our gym jams. Wanna come? Mm-hmm. Hey, throw in some towels and some sippy cups and I'm in. Okay, so Lewis's calculation was just completely off. Now he's got to deal with three of them. I think they might actually tear this dude to shreds. To smithereens, it's got to be the worst way to be blown. All three of them disappear into the water and make their way back to Mako Island. And now Lewis has to hunt them down. Wait a minute, guys. Something feels off. Like this cave has more details, almost as if our universe was gifted a higher budget between seasons. Instead of the girls acting like sirens, they actually try to get Lewis to leave, but he refuses to leave without the girls. I know I keep asking pretty rhetorical questions and it's bordering on CinemaSins territory, but legitimately, why does this matter? It's like every month they forget that the moon eventually sets. This is not a permanent issue. Oh no, the girls went to stay on Mako Island, where no one else is around. Lewis, not only will this problem eventually just solve itself, but it barely constitutes as a problem. The full moon gave the girl storm powers or something I don't know. What are you doing? Help me! Remember that thing I said about the budget? Forget I said that. So it's the next day and the girls all wake up in their bed. So Lewis is most definitely dead, right? And when Lewis is gone, no one's around to keep them in check as all the girls act really irresponsibly with their powers. Oh, so that's what was set up in the opening. I'm not used to these scripts having cohesive themes. Ricky even has Undertaker powers now. The problem is that although the moon has set, the girls seem to have accidentally upgraded their powers. Meteorologists are puzzled by the sudden weather event and have no idea what caused it. Police have recovered a small aluminium boat adrift in the water nearby. Haha, <laughs> how silly. They say aluminium. Is Lewis actually dead? Cleo does the responsible thing and leaves her little sister unattended out the house alone. Of course she sneaks out anyway. She's got a man to meet about a pelican. I didn't see a thing. I did. Lewis's torch. Ha <laughs> ha how silly. They say torch. They found him in the fetal position on Mako Island. They try to dry Lewis's clothes and Ricky just kind of forgets all the clothes she set on fire earlier. Like this isn't even your regular moon amnesia, she just forgot. Lewis is understandably afraid. The Cleo Jr. plot has just dropped. It's not nearly as important than the storm powers. At least she got a second shirt. The Neptune stopped Cleo from using her powers on her sister, mostly because of her new powers she can't control, but frankly, she shouldn't have been using them for combat anyway. Well, that's a pretty decent way to set up a new season. Introduce new viewers to the main cast and their mermaidness while also adding new abilities and upping the stakes. If they didn't accidentally kill people last season, they have a much higher chance of doing it now. Also, I'm glad Lewis and Cleo dating does not upend the dynamic of the group. I mean, they still don't respect him, and they kind of pushed a shit in this episode and then tossed him in the sky. Evil BH Ultra be like they flew into the moon and died. 
Cleo tests her new dangerous powers on innocent bystanders. I feel like this is becoming a common thing for her. She ends up spraying the new girl, Charlotte, who needs help finding her way around, clearly likes Lewis, and has red hair. That's all we know about her. One thing about Cleo, she's gonna be friendly to new kids. Considering the last one she met was Ricky, it's a real crapshoot. Cleo is mad at Lewis, but she doesn't explain why. Want my advice? Loosen the leash a little. How'd you hear about that? Who told you about the leash? Cleo goes to Mako Island to sulk alone until she is joined by Ricky and Emma, and Lewis. While they're here, they might as well test their new upgraded powers. Ricky sets the pool on fire. Didn't even know you could do that, that's sick. Emma freezes afloat to death and Cleo blows Lewis. Like, like with wind, like the air, like with wind powers, wind. I gotta put punctuation in these somewhere. Initially, I thought Cleo was mad because of Charlotte, but now I think she might be irritable because of something else. Why are they so mean to Lewis on H2O? Like, I know I'm not a teen girl. They remind me of that every day. But Lewis is being attentive and understanding and caring, and everyone is pissed at him for it. It's sad. Lewis comes to visit Cleo at the marine park she still works at and even tries to help her with her job. Sorry I put you under so much pressure yesterday. I've cleared my whole day so we can hang out together. Lewis is driving me crazy. I have a feeling I'm gonna dislike this season. I really like him, but he's... Totally suffocating. Yes, he's doing everything right. But I can't stand it anymore. I don't know what to do. Here's a thought. Dump him. Seriously, did I miss several episodes? Even in his free time, when he's out by himself, he's researching mermaids. He does so much. Granted, it never amounts to something. Last thing he looked up was moon time, and he really fucked that one up. Emma's little brother is playing soccer. Can we watch something else? I'm gonna dislike saying that because I also dislike the A-plot. It's all bad all the way down. Charlotte teaches Lewis that painting is calming, and then Lewis turns around and attempts the same lesson on his girlfriend. It does not work. Boy plays soccer and Emma gets so upset that she freezes the ground beneath him in a slip and slide position. I'm no sports expert, but that's gotta be a foul, right? Like that ball can't be in play. I know they don't know who did this, but I don't know, man. Chalk it up to an act of God, cancel the game. Confused right now. First mom and dad split up and then I turn into some power freak. Oh. I'm not gonna lie, I actually forgot that even happened. Cleo lets Lewis down and tells him that he's not one of them, not one of the Neptunes. And then she breaks up with him and he looks like you guys shot his dog. Like mother, like daughter, won't somebody please give these pathetic fish boys a chance? Women do not want me, fish are indifferent to my existence. Cleo's reasoning set to a sad montage is that they don't need any distractions while they figure out their new powers. You know who could help you with that? Do people hate this season? I'm no idiot. I know why they introduce a new girl out of nowhere who's inexplicably into Lewis. If a red haired painter was into me, even at all, I would fold immediately. She even sketched a picture of his side profile from the bushes. What a freak show. Listen, there's a level of suspension of disbelief when it comes to these videos when you're reviewing kid shows like this, and I need you guys to understand the bit I'm doing so you don't send me to a facility. Do angry gamers on the internet actually hate NES games enough that they would rather eat their own shit? No, it's a character, it's hyperbole. Does Andrew Ultra in real life care about the romantic relationships of these fictional teenagers from this 2000 show? Yes, 100%. I'm not being facetious or ironic. This is not satire. I'm being real. I've never been more serious about anything in my life. I feel like off this episode title alone, this one is gonna annoy me as well. Ricky is almost run over by a motorcycle, which we've only ever seen driven by one person once. But it takes her him taking off his helmet for her to realize it's Zane. He's back. As far as he knows, last time they saw him, he thinks they lost their powers, when in reality, they've only gotten stronger. In a realistic depiction of breakups in a larger friend group, Lewis is only hanging with Emma and Ricky in the very short amount of time Cleo isn't around them. You see, normally Cleo has a job, and these two don't do anything. Emma uses Cleo's appearance to hammer home that she did the right thing, and that their lives are too complicated right now for boys, and then looks directly at Ricky. Emma... This doesn't have anything to do with mermaids, does it? All the while, Lewis goes to have boat time with Charlotte. Ricky catches a dirt bike routine set to pop music. Should we really keep busting at the montage counter? I feel like this is gonna be an ongoing thing this season. The good thing is that Zane doesn't suspect a thing. Here, on me. What's wrong? 
not thirsty. Not a thing. Lewis is happy spending time with someone who cares about and respects him, but Cleo will not have it. Me. All right, psycho. I'm back to disliking this guy. As far as I'm concerned, he's just another attempted murderer. Should show the clip of him exploding again, please. Emma is pissed at Ricky for going to the dirt park to see Zane, and now she has to deal with Cleo's paranoia. Emma doesn't do a whole lot, but she's the only one keeping this goddamn family together. Not that you know anything about that, Cleo. Now, Andrew. Cleo and Emma go to interrogate Charlotte, and before this scene, I thought Cleo was just being jealous, but then Charlotte very casually says that there's no record of her at her old school because the records office burnt down. What? Okay, no, yeah, absolutely start investigating her. Cleo happens across her diary, and because she is her sister's sister, she starts immediately reading it. I was never a teenage girl, all right? We know this. Do people actually put pictures and illustrations in their diaries? I thought it was a text-only venture. Well, 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 look who accidentally revealed their secret to Zane. I never thought I'd be siding with Emma over everyone. I guess they're back together or something. I can't keep track of this anymore. Cleo and Emma find evidence that Charlotte may be hiding a secret boyfriend, which is like not important context. Like, we've never seen Lois show any interest in her beyond just hanging out. Why would he care about this? It's all they can admit it to Lois. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you laughing? This photo is from my theater group. We're doing Romeo and Juliet, RJ. <laughs> Those meetings are rehearsal. All right, you know what? I don't know how you got me back on Cleo's side. These two are having a wrong off and it's making my head spin. That's still not normal. Why would you have a cut out of yourself kissing this? Am I missing something? She's clearly hiding something else. Forget Lewis and love triangles. I think she might be covering up some kind of act of terror. Your story isn't adding up, Charlotte. Lewis confronts Cleo about stealing Charlotte's diary, to which she claims she was just protecting their secret. She does not mention the building burning down. You don't think he might want to know that part? And just in case you thought the status quo was changing too much, Zane and Ricky agree to date as long as they keep the mermaid secret and tell no one they are doing this. Not only are we reverting to the end of last season, now we're in like the middle or something. Did the witch not say that keeping secrets drove the girls apart? Also the red scare? I could feel me allowing myself to become annoyed by this season and I did not really want that to happen. No fun in watching a middle-aged man. That's technically true. It could be true you don't know when i'm gonna die i do but you don't i'm only going to say nice things about this next episode positive reinforcement oh this one's gonna be a piece of cake by the title of this episode it's likely going to be an emma ricky episode my favorite emma plans a sleepover since her parents are out of town but cleo has to watch cleo jr on account that their mom left them so ricky's the only one who comes to the sleepover we get a very rare deep piece of continuity that blew my mind emma's parents are going away for a convention of glass figurines and the mom is excited to show ricky her newest crowning achievement and what does it look like a blue glass dolphin, just like the one her little brother gifted to Ricky. Okay, so maybe someone else is actually paying attention. Dude, not only is this a potential Ricky Emma episode, but Nate, the fedora guy, shows up to accuse Lewis of being too girly after exclusively hanging out with the Neptunes for too long. As a chronic one of the girls, I feel this in my soul. Nate attempts to, again, the fedora guy, his name is Nate, attempts to teach this female boy. If only there was a term for that. No, I don't want to bother you. I might find an online course. Silence. Okay. Attention. Left short, right, punch, pizza slide, kick! Ah! You're really good at this stuff. You can practice with me. Happy late Pride Month, everybody. Am I pushing this too hard? Am I overstretching? Or is Ricky using Emma's toothbrush? I said I was gonna be positive and these are the only things keeping me going. Cleo's excuse for not wanting to attend the Emma house is that she has to watch her sister, which she is not doing. That's not a complaint about the writing. It's likely an intentional part on her character. Hey buddy, you all right? This episode rules, I don't even need to pretend. Emma is trying to be chill and cool for Ricky, but she sees right through this facade. Ricky and Emma both separately get to talk to Cleo as two separate locations as she gets love letters and chocolate. She's constantly going out today. I think she just didn't want to go to your lame ass party. I had my first karate lesson this afternoon. And you got taken out. What do you mean? It was great. I was great. 
Lewis, this whole macho thing doesn't suit you. You're just not a physical kind of guy. Cleo, I am making some serious changes. And from now on, my body, it is my temple. Chocolate? Love one. Lewis. My guy. Speaking of lame ass party, Emma invites over a ton of strangers to impress Ricky and convince her she's a real rebel. Damn, the second other people are here, Cleo rolls up with Cleo Jr. You're a bad friend, Cleo. So I just found out some guy has been sending Cleo presents, and all I want to do, I just want to, I want to find him and I want to straighten him out. Oh, really? Are you sure she's not doing it herself to make you jealous? Why would she do that? Oh, Lewis, think about it. You're a whole new guy. She's worried other girls are gonna notice her. Is there anyone in this show that isn't enemies to lovers? It's a bold decision that they make the prototypical douche guy character that's in all these teen shows, but make him obsessed with something really lame like karate that makes everyone uncomfortable. It honestly endears him to me even more. Also, Lewis. Lewis walks in on Nate, moving in on Cleo. And I know I usually say this as a joke, but I'm certain he's more portrayed by Nate than he is jealous of him. This is my house and my party, and I'll say when it's over. Emma, give it up. What are you trying to prove? That I'm not boring, okay? I can have fun too. Emma, I hate to tell you, but this party sucks. You've only thrown lame ass parties ever in your life. The two boys trying to karate each other break the giant glass dolphin, the prized jewel of this family and the only thing holding it together. Everyone's getting a divorce this season. Ricky takes the fall for the property damage and the party for Emma but she won't stand for it. I mean, we've seen Lewis get bad from the Cleo house. I don't think Emma wants that for Ricky. She's been personally invested in keeping Ricky single for a while. Emma realizes that she isn't spontaneous or cool or chill. Where was I going with this? Lewis is really just getting ran through the ringer here. He's having a rough go of potential love interests. Whoa, the fire and ice from the title wasn't just referring to Emma and Ricky, but also potentially Lewis and Nate. Also, Cleo was there lying the whole time. Not to sound like a jilted ex, but I feel like the reason I've disliked a lot of the recent crop of episodes is because they kind of torture the fuck out of Lewis, and he's my favorite guy. He has been since the beginning. The man just wants to fish, and they don't give him a break ever. Cleo dad is doing a really bad job of being a dad, but a pretty decent job of being a sad divorced man. It's a shame I never saw season two as a kid because Lewis rolls up with the mythology book this episode and looking back at all my favorite fantasy stories as a kid. I love art where they learn about a new creature of the week using a secret journal. Gotta be one of my favorite genders. As we're speaking right now, I still have not watched the Roku original Spiderwick series. We love a cryptozoology king. Cleo actually believes the spell book and she almost immediately wants to pull off a spell. I don't think the show about mermaids anymore. The owner of the local diner cafe slash pool table spot lets Emma know that business is not booming, considering we've only ever seen four or five people here nowadays. That adds up. I don't think anyone at the dance ever bought anything. Emma offers to help make a commercial to get new eyes on the place, and Mr. Manager insists that she stars in it. Cleo and Lewis are off collecting ingredients for their curse or whatever, but Charlotte catches Lewis in the act. So I got something to do with that book you've been glued to? What book? It's no book. Yes, there is. I saw you with it at school. Not that I was spying on you or anything. <laughs> Call me paranoid, but surely she's up to something, right? If we find out that Cleo's house burned down in a later episode, we'll know why. Lewis puts all the ingredients in a big witch's cauldron and then orders the girls to use their powers. Now, if you're wondering what that even means, you are correct to wonder. They all just kind of point their hands at the bucket, freezing it, then boiling it, then bubbling it. So like, if you don't have three mermaids, how would you even do this? I guess it would take a special self-insert mermaid that would need to have all the powers. Ricky then puts the green slime on her face and attempts to grant Emma's wish. I feel like I missed a scene or something. What's even going on in the show anymore? Sorry it didn't work out, Cleo. What about me? What about my apology? You did waste my valuable time as well. What could Cleo even possibly want badly enough to waste everyone's time and effort? I have a feeling Charlotte might be the one to turn up missing, actually. Ricky, angered that Lewis doesn't apologize to her as well, decides to boil the pot of sludge for fun. And as she leaves the local diner cafe slash pool table spot, it begins to bubble and expand. I've got a feeling this guy's about to lose his only place of business. Cleo continues to apply the gunk in the bathtub, and I didn't even think about this until Cleo Jr. complained, but like, does she just only take baths every day? Like, surely she can't stand up in the shower. Do the other girls even shower? I feel like baths don't actually help you get clean. I just know this friend group smells like shit. I wish I could have a shower and I want one! Oh 
know, the local diner, cafe, slash pool table spot has been greened. Now there's green everywhere. Cleo puts two and two together and learns that the wish has to be made while they're in mermaid mode and also kind of implies she's going to use it to get her mom back. I'm no marriage expert, but if this wish comes to fruition, they're either just going to split again or your parents are going to be miserable. Ricky refuses to take the blame for something that is entirely her fault. And now it's Lewis's problem. Fantastic. Emma attempts to fix said problem by freezing the green slime and making it look like the slime experiment I attempted in the Kids Choice Awards video. I forgot I wrote that. I pissed myself off. I won't lie to you, man. This actually looks sick as fuck. We need more fantastical gross goop and monsters in this. I'm going to keep bringing up the pink opaque and you guys are just going to have to know what I'm talking about. Charlotte shows up to the cafe at the least opportune time as gaseous fumes fill the room. If things couldn't get any worse, Mr. The Boss rolls up with his camera team. Lewis attempts to undo this catastrophe by turning Cleo into mermaid mode and then scraping up enough toxic goop to wish it all away. It also plays like the climactic music as if this is a romantic moment. Lewis is rubbing garbage on her face. Right as the ticking clock expires, everyone from the crew to the boss to Charlotte file inside to see that the cafe is now completely clean. Wasn't there a divorced dad somewhere? Earlier in the episode, Cleo tricks her dad into wishing for his greatest heart's desire, which she thinks will be his ex-wife, but in actuality, it's about getting new fishing gear. I love this guy. I want fish. My wife left me, likely because of the fish. Mum and I weren't happy together, but she is now. She's made a new life for herself. And you can go and see her anytime you want. Yeah, we know. And to be honest with you, I'd love to have her back, but she'd still be unhappy. I guess. But what about your happiness, Dad? He's happy, aren't you, Dad? You bet. This is both surprisingly mature for this show and handled with pretty decent tact. It's nice. The only positive divorce representation I could think of is this show and like big city greens. So are we just gonna like not bring up the fact that in this universe we can make wishes? Like I know the plan went wrong and the book is gone, but that was mostly just cause Ricky got mad. What if we just tried it again and didn't do that? Like you guys definitely remember the recipe. It took all day to get the ingredients down. Cleo and Cleo Jr. think their dad might be going on a date, and because they are career haters, Cleo goes to spy on him. Another nice little bit of continuity, while Charlotte brings Lewis some food in a picnic basket, he's got the custom bait he made in the cheating episode on his fishing rod. Bait, by the way, that we and him both know does not work. This girl loves fishing? Lewis, you gotta lock this down. I don't know what came over me. I'm usually very careful with those fish hook things. Uh, they're called lures. I made these ones myself. Lewis, yeah. That's what I meant. <laughs> you don't know anything about fishing, do you? Never mind, she's a dirty liar. Throw her in the ocean. Did you lie about the building that burnt down too? What's your real story? It's nice that Cleo has upgraded from sabotaging Lewis's happiness to sabotaging her dad's happiness with Lewis's help. Was the previous episode not all about how sad she thought the dad was when he was all alone? Like, actually, what is your problem, Cleo? Ricky and Emma are also tired of hearing Cleo complain about the boy she dumped hanging out with someone else and her dad attempting to move on with his life. At least she can't become even more of a hater. Who's they? Welcome. Hi, darling. Come on in. Uh, may I introduce Annette Wattsford and her daughter Charlotte? You. You know what? I feel like you probably deserve this, right? And now Lewis is here. Oh, this is rough. Charlotte's mom is excited and ecstatic to finally meet the boy Charlotte has been talking about. And I bet the dad is just as happy that he basically gets a second chance at the only boy he's ever liked in his house. Not only does he get a new girlfriend, but also a new, much cooler daughter. What's cooler than arson? I flip sides. Cleo dad is info dumping about fish and scaring the hose again, all while Cleo burns their food. Not with fire powers, just by being bad at cooking. Where is the fire? girl anyway. Oh, she's on a date with Emma? Okay, well, at least someone gets to be happy. I'm glad, man. Everything else is super uncomfortable here. But then the girls roll up to the house. At least it makes our stories easier to follow. Emma and Ricky are seemingly mad at Lewis for hanging out with Charlotte. I don't know if I mentioned this part, but Ricky was the one who convinced Cleo to dump Lewis, and Emma was the one who said they should remain focused. Now they're giving her a pep talk on how to win him back? I don't say this as much as I should, but actually, what is your problem, Cleo? Ricky made a pot of boiling sauce explode, and Emma freezes 
replaces the rest of the food just because. Lewis is the only one reacting correctly to this. Is every other episode of this show written by a completely different team of people that hates the other writing team? Now Cleo is attacking her dad and his girlfriend with water. She absolutely blows it for him, and even worse, she seems pleased with herself. You and Annette, aren't you getting married? What? Annette is a business partner. She was here to inspect my fish, to buy for her restaurant. Okay, so not only did Cleo purposefully ruin his potential chance at happiness, but now they're broke. Thanks, Cleo. This might be too strong of an emotion for a show that doesn't exist anymore from my childhood and very hazy memories, but I think I hate Cleo now. Like, she was never my favorite, but this is advanced bullshit. Cleo attempts to make things right by apologizing to the business partner, but like, what is she even thinking? Like, from her perspective, the food exploded and or froze and water splashed in her face. Why would she ever think you had anything to do with this? How would that be Cleo's fault? She's not familiar with mermaid powers. I'm starting to worry that I will regret watching the show the full way through. There's a universe where I never do this video and still have this vision of the show perfectly just placed in my brain, unaltered unruined. Even like in this video, if I only talked about the Nickelodeon season. Unfortunately, that is not the world we live in. Lewis has lost his passion for the hunt, and now he's trying to science the fish. I'm glad he's at least using his intense research for something other than mermaids. His simultaneous laptop breakdown and hours of wasted time both lead him to the same conclusion. He's always touched grass. Now he has to get a job. Considering he's already tried the local cafe, pool table, diner, slash whatever spot, and the fish mafia isn't around anymore, there's only one job left in this city. Lewis gets Cleo's job at the marine park after she gets fired for feeding the dolphins too often, as the new boss is strict and unreasonable. It's just a small step to help us keep an eye on the staff. N not you, of course. Oh, of course. And racist? I think? Cleo misses her job because of how easy it was, which is not what we saw. That shit was only causing her more problems. Instead of talking to anyone or having a discussion, the girls immediately decide to torture Lewis and make his job harder. Okay. I, I, I just can't. Put up the drywall meme. Lewis catches on to this pretty quickly. I mean, the ice cream did melt and freeze. Not a lot of people you know can do that. You guys are nuts. You yeah? Well, you're a traitor. But we're above name calling. That's actually funny. I like that. Lewis feels bad for taking Cleo's job and Charlotte assures him he shouldn't and I never thought I'd agree with her, but Cleo did get fired before he got the job and honestly should have gotten fired way sooner. Remember when Zane stole all those records? Remember when he exploded? He's got a positive support system now and a job and these girls are trying to pull him down. Lewis comes by the Cleo household and even loses the support of her dad. See, that's what they don't tell you about breakups. You can't hang out with your ex's dad anymore and go fishing, it's sad. Lewis's job is on the line as the girlfriends are personally responsible for letting the dolphin go, but he can't even say that lest he reveal their secret. See how good of a friend he is to the people who are awful to him? Cleo is the only one who seems upset by this, so she confronts them. They're going to arrest to Lewis? This is absurd. Thank God the Neptunes come to their senses right before they drag him away forever. And by that, I mean the girlfriends would be totally fine with him rotting had Cleo not stepped in. He even gives up his job so Cleo can get hers back. Lewis, I beg you, please get away from these girls. They are ruining your life. What is with this season and torturing Lewis? Like, it's one thing to break them up. If you just don't want Lewis and Cleo together anymore for this season, that's fine. But that, it's not just that. Cleo is mad at him, even though she dumped him and Emma and Ricky want him to die or go to jail, which he will also die there. This really is just the result of characters being subtracted. They have to fuck with Lewis because Zane and Byron have gone missing. Also, I think they're trying to purposefully make us hate Charlotte, maybe? Bikers, bikers, the motorbikes are here. Zane and Nate are back in town up to their regular nefarious deeds, this time without a fedora. Again, Zane has continued to be corrupted by the worst of his friends. I would say he lacks the positive influence, but Ricky has been an insane hater all season. These two, as we know, have been secretly seeing each other this whole time, whenever Ricky can get away. So basically every time she's off screen, which makes her vitriol for Lewis that much more hypocritical. I just wanted to enjoy being back in the year 2008. I got you this. What is it? Open it. Zane, 
I can't accept this. Uh, yes, you can. God, we need to go back. Zane walks Ricky to her home, or rather what he believes to be her home. Despite this being a pretty clear-cut situation, Zane still wants to meet Ricky's dad since she met his, and he's allegedly trying to be a bigger part of Zane's life. Zane is only ever in town these days for one reason, and the other girls aren't suspicious about him being around at all. Did they ever end up making that commercial, by the way? I forgot about that. Business seems to be booming. Speaking of making an effort, Charlotte begins a dialogue with the girls, and they are severely cold to her. Cleo is jealous because of Lewis, while Emma just hates red hair. We know this. This happened in an episode previously. It turns out the man who Nate stole from, and and Zane is returning to is Ricky's dad and also a Twin Peaks character. Well, this is awkward. You alright, sweetheart? Yeah, dad. Fine. Oh. Where's that beautiful smile your mum gave you? Wow, everyone in this town is a bachelor. I know where I'm moving. I want to make it clear. Disclaimer. The joke there is that I want to date dads, not that I hate women. Despite what you may have thought by my feeling on this season, Lewis and Zane interact like one time and it's still not enough. Ricky is hiding her trailer park home and her trailer park father from Zane, all while the other Neptunes get more and more suspicious. Charlotte is also in this episode somewhere. See, there she is. She's over there. Zane, in his sassiest stance, talks to the girls about the confrontation he just had. Ricky became very upset and, well. She took off in the water. You know, fish style. That is exactly how I would have written that line. Yeah, we're doing this shit fish style. They find her in the only water-based place they ever go, and Emma extends an olive branch, saying that while it is dangerous, she should probably be with Zane if it makes her happy. Cleo politely sits in the background, now realizing that she broke up with Lewis for basically nothing. Ricky reveals all to Zane. She lives in a trailer park, and the man Zane accosted was in fact her father. We've learned from Zane that money cannot buy happiness. I mean, this dude was miserable. Ricky believes that he would instantly turn and run after seeing where she lives. In reality, the issue is that Ricky's dad, who we've only now seen, is a psycho who threatens Zane's life. And then we get another sad montage set to license music. Let's go, add it to the counter, beach ball, baby. All while Zane sadly solders. I actually think this is the same sad song as last time, so I'm gonna revoke that beach ball. Zane! What are you doing? My dad will kill you. Right, I looked away for one second and heard that crack noise and I swear I thought it was a shotgun. Zane makes up for it by fixing the man's bike and all is well. Yeah, yeah, we're square. I'm Zane, by the way. You can call me Terry, mate. I am Terry, the real Terry. This bloody buffoon locked me away in the Ultra Mega Terry Cup 10,000 years ago. We have upgraded from normal videos having zero YOLO references to this one having like two or three. There's a reason for that. Ricky gets over her fear of her closest friends judging her and invites everyone she knows to her house. Four people. More friends than I got, but still. While Zane and Terry bond in the best way a dad and boyfriend can, over the damn grill. Lewis gives his jacket to Cleo and once again, the status quo is reverted. Remember when you guys cost Lewis his job? Remember when Zane exploded? I swear, it feels like I'm watching two different shows. Or the same show from two different timelines and I'm getting like mandela between them. Let's see if next episode is set in the Zane universe or set in the Lewis torturing universe. Lewis, hold your breath, is attending a young inventors competition. He asks Cleo to join him, but she refuses. There's just too many feelings. So Lewis, dragged kicking and screaming, asks Charlotte to join him. Hey, you guys remember Byron? The surfing god? Okay, forget everything you know about Byron, forget he existed. Can I help? You're the riding instructor? Sure am. Is that a problem? They got cowboys in this show? Somebody on the team just really wanted to see Emma go after a cowboy, so they invented a ranch that she's apparently been riding at since she was a kid. Damn. The show used to have mermaids in it. But she hasn't been on the old horse in a while and fails to impress Ash. His name is Ash. Normally I wouldn't use legal names, but I get the feeling we're gonna see this guy again since Byron has mysteriously gone missing. Does the horse know she's a mermaid? 
Did he do this on purpose? I know lying on that wet hay feels like hell. I always hated that shit. Emma complains and gets annoyed by the idea of Ash, and because of this, Ricky immediately knows that she's into him. Ricky knows what it means when Emma starts bickering. Emma lashes out and criticizes Cleo for not even being able to talk to Lewis, which she takes to heart. While this is rude and mean, it's not out of character. Emma has been a career hater for these two relationships the whole season, which makes Ash a lot more interesting. Cleo takes Lewis's invite before he can tell her that he already invited Charlotte. Normally I'm on his side, but you had so much time to prevent this from happening. What's well, cold horse riding? You're the instructor. When are you uh, going to instruct us? Elliot, quiet. We paid a lot of money for this lesson. Please. Elliot, we are trying to have a conversation here. <laughs> Another casualty of enemies to lovers. Sad. Charlotte and Cleo both spend weeks worth of wages on dresses to match with what Lewis is wearing, and he pretends to be sick. Lewis, I swear to God, Lewis. Listen, if I were writing a show for tween girls and kid Andrew Ultra, same audience, the Venn diagram's a circle, and I wanted to make the most money possible, I would also put mermaid magic and a connection with a horse in it. If only they aired this episode on Nickelodeon, it would have lasted at least one more season. Ash stays for lunch where they all eat cheese sandwiches. Sad life. I think the little brother is actually eating a tomato slice between bread. This is advanced teen romance. Do you think they're gonna set up Emma and the cowboy, but in actuality, this is a format that allows Ricky to tease Emma all day, inject that shit right into my childhood veins. Surely there must be something else to this episode. Someone has accidentally poisoned one of Ash's horses, and then Emma explains that it must have been her mistake, but does this by pointing to the exact weed the horse ate in the book she marked. Now, I know I don't trust most people, and you guys are friends, but this would make me incredibly suspicious. It was an accident, but you just so happen to know where to find this exact plant he ate. Maybe she does have beef with the horses. Speaking of bad friends, Ricky assumes that Lewis still has feelings, so she urges Cleo to accept the award on Lewis's behalf. Even if he wasn't faking sick, this is still a terrible idea. Oh, so just anyone could get up on stage and take the trophy? Why even show up at all? Damn, Emma really killed that horse. Emma comes clean to Ash that she did, in fact, murder his horse, but she has a plan. He needs to be called down to break the fever, like an ice bath. An ice bath? But Emma, where will we get the ice? It's not like we know anyone with magical ice powers. That'd be ridiculous and destroy my current worldview. Ruby Sunday makes snow fall down from nowhere, all right? Since when could she do this? Also, what does this accomplish? Not only did Cleo and Charlotte both plan to accept his award, again, a horrible idea, but they both bought the same dress. Meanwhile, the boss man asks why don't they all just go together because he knows ball. Did Emma sleep in the horse's stable? Was that part of the plan? Emma saves the day and we do not see anyone accept this award. Considering we'd have to see a new location full of new people, I should have suspected this. Ricky rubs her positive relationship in the girls' faces and then they all laugh. How quaint. Technically, nobody did anything to Lewis in that episode. He did all that to himself. I think it does mean that he also blew it with Charlotte this episode, but honestly, all that man needs is a damn fishing rod. I'll drink to that, hell yeah. Cleo Jr. did really well on her report card, and Cleo the first presumably did not. Which makes Ricky and Emma bragging about their respective C's and A's really get on her nerves. Dumbass Magoo over here failed her big test because she didn't have Lewis around to help her study. This is fine. We're only a couple minutes into this episode. Nothing bad has happened to Lewis this episode as of yet. I'm just bracing for impact. Cleo's teacher, on her behalf, does order her a tutor to help her study, but instead of Lewis... It's Charlotte. Cleo's dad says, you're gonna love this, as if he hasn't already seen these two interact and it went really poorly. It almost bankrupted the man. This man knows a splintered relationship when he sees one. What are you doing? Cleo is learning how to read as the rest of the girls visit her at the Cleo home. I know why these girls hate Charlotte, but why are we the viewers supposed to hate her? Like, is it just because she isn't Cleo? Or is it the fire? She puts together a picnic of wings and mini pizzas to hang out with Lewis, and I would fold instantly, I am assuring you. Pizza and wings, and they say Americans have no culture. Grandma left me all of this when she died. Some paintings of hers in here as well. All right, Charlotte. Um, but how did she die? Did you have anything to do with this? My go on. What? Nothing, I, I just thought I'd recognize something. It's not important. Yeah, it is. Do you know where this is? Is this Mako Island? Ooh, maybe. I don't know. 
really could be anywhere. I'm probably wrong. But I've been looking for this place all over. I really want to paint it just like Grandma. She's actually the most interesting and redeemable character this season, sans the mystery fire. Cleo was studying in the bathtub because she just does everything in there now, as Charlotte snoops around her room. After drying herself, she walks in on Charlotte fiddling with the dead lady locket and finds her drawing of Lewis. The girls confront Lewis on this the next day. She manipulated the whole situation. She volunteered to tutor me so she would keep me busy while she worked on you. Worked on me? What are you talking about? We think she's trying to get close to us. There's a, another possibility. Maybe Charlotte just likes me. <sighs> Lewis, she's taking advantage of- Can we please let this man have one day of peace? The girls don't allow Lewis to take her to Mako Island, and he finally stands up for himself. Says that they can't tell him what to do. They don't own him. They can't control him. Can the show just be about him now? I think he should have ended up with Zane anyway. Wow. Look at this, it's almost exactly the same. Yeah, almost like it's a matte painting. The girls don't trust one of their closest friends, so they follow him to the island. We're coming up on the halfway point of the season. I'd say we're due for something big to happen. Charlotte. Charlotte, there's something I need to tell you. and it didn't even take a full moon. Actually, when was the last full moon? Has this whole season been over the span of like two weeks? That makes Zane's arc a lot funnier. <laughs> Charlotte helps Cleo get an A on her exam and Lewis gets to be happy, which means Cleo is pissed. Guys, I think I hate this show. Watching a man fondly talk about a children's show that meant a lot to him as a kid, that's fun. Some would call it cute, but you better not call me cute because I'm not cute, all right? I'm cool and epic. That same old man complaining about the teen show made for tween girls in the 2000s, Bad look, hard to watch, honestly. And yet we trek on forth, speaking of tough to watch. Zane comes to Ricky with a proposition. A yacht sank off the coast, and with it sank a priceless Tibetan statue. Zane, however, cannot search the bottom of the ocean, and Ricky refuses to be his search party. This is the kind of show I wanted to watch. I want to watch them search for cursed idols every episode. Lewis rolls up to someone else's house, where Charlotte goes to find him. Does everyone in this town just enter people's houses uninvited? This is why murders keep happening. See, I don't even answer the door for food I order. Just as Ricky has already told Zane no in hunting for the Tibetan idol and claiming the cash reward, she learns from her broke dad that they are broke and may have to leave their place. So tell me about this reward. I thought you'd come around. The owners of the yacht are friends of my dad's. They're offering $10,000 to anyone who can bring it back in one piece. got a map laid out and everything. Can the next season just be all of them going on a sea adventure? Zane says he's in it for the glory of the hunt, but then also agrees to split the cash with Ricky. Zane, you're rich. Like, currently, already. But the job is too much for one mermaid, especially once the reward is announced, so Ricky goes to the Neptunes for help. Cleo is on her Indiana Jones shit and says that the statue should be in a museum, and Emma just enters the hunt for sport. What the hell? I love this show now. The girls are skeptical about trusting Zane, even though it's Ricky who refuses to mention the cash prize. Another classic sitcom misunderstanding. If only Ricky told them that she'd lose her house. The Neptunes and the show are treating Zane as a suitable replacement for Lewis, as he's the nerd doing the calculations now. I've never been more sure a character is going to die than I am with season two Lewis. And don't say it's not that kind of show. We've seen them merc so many dudes by this point. It's why they didn't air these episodes. While the Straw Hats are on their hunt, Lewis enjoys his retirement with his new companion. His words, not mine. Because Emma is messy on purpose now, she urges Cleo to call Lewis for more help. It did not go through because Charlotte got to his phone first. And just when I thought we were having fun. Financial reward is one of my favorite phrases. Reward? There's a reward? Yeah. So it looks like you'll have to force yourselves to accept some money. I knew we couldn't trust you. We're out of here, right? Right. Come on, Ricky. Um, I'm going to keep looking. Why? He conned you. No, he didn't. I knew about it all along. 
So you lied to us. Ah, the classic act two liar revealed plot. Emma and Cleo bail on the treasure hunt, leaving Ricky alone in the water to search for the Tibetan idol. Seeing this panning shot of Mako Island brings back memories of Disney XD's Pair of Kings right into my mind. You guys remember that show? Who knows what makes him tickle what Ricky sees in him? That's why I've got a really bad feeling about leaving her there. It was Ricky's choice. Every time she's around him, she loses it big time. Yeah, okay, Emma, let's not get carried away here. Tell us how you really feel. A sulking Cleo Jones and messy Emma spill the beans to Lewis after chewing him out about the phone thing. Man, the bottom of the ocean is really dirty. You girls should do something about that. Zane attempts to pull up the treasure chest, but the Owen Hart clamp snaps, dropping the crate and knocking Ricky out. A frantic Zane jumps in the water to save her while Donkey Kong Country music plays. I think, like, not the underwater level, the calm music. You, you're just gonna have to take my word for it. He manages to get her up, but she's unresponsive. Zane calls the Neptunes, and Lewis is held behind by Charlotte for a second, but there will not be more blood on her hands. Lewis goes with the gang. A reliable Lewis rolls up at the last minute with the smelling salts he keeps on him at all times. You guys don't do that. As much as I don't hate Charlotte like I'm clearly supposed to, I really like this Scooby gang we formed. Lewis at his computer, Zane hitting his sassiest stance yet, Emma and Cleo are there. Ricky finally comes clean to the group and explains she would never take money from her friends. The bounty, on the other hand, that's a different story. Why don't you try those traffickers again, huh? I'm sure they need more work after they exploded. Zane, I looked at your plan for raising the crate. Pretty good. Except that it didn't work. I've got a few ideas, if you're interested. The love triangle is keeping us away from a quality quintuple. Between scenes, Zane and Lewis went out, just the two of them, mind you, found the Tibetan idol, and got the reward money, passing it off to Ricky. You deserve it. My dad is gonna freak. My mom is gonna freak. Look how happy they all are hugging. Also, Cleo is there. You know what I'm starting to realize? I thought I was souring on the show, on the season, on all the characters, but in reality, it's just Cleo. I mean, Ricky's plots are the most grounded and relatable. Emma is now intertwined with the cowboy television. Like, am I the dickhead? I can't tell if this is just a me problem. Because I've been watching these episodes on YouTube, mind you, and all the comments, because I, I try and read them after the episodes, they're all about how much everyone hates Charlotte, and I don't get it. But to be fair, I never really got the hate for characters like Dawn Summers or like Clara Oswald. It was always like, this character is new and I hate her, and I say her because it's always a her. Remember when people sent death threats because of the Star Wars mechanic they didn't like or something? <laughs> Well, I don't like that title one bit. Emma cuts her fingers on a glowing multicolored undersea pine cone, and then she starts eating exclusively fish food, meaning both food made of fish and actual fish pellets. You ever think about how cool it is that we have genetically modified food to come in perfect pellet form for individual animals we keep as pets? Like imagine having human pellets every day. That's not crazy, right? The glowing artifact also makes Cleo's fish want to kill itself. Yeah, I don't know, man. They needed a reason for Emma to act weird and unsafe, but the Neptunes pretty much already mastered the full moon stuff, so they invented whatever this thing is. We're not going to be able to keep people out of here forever. Hey! Lewis, isn't it? Laurie! Hey! Ah, of course. Laurie. I actually do think we may have seen this guy before. So what's happening here? She's turning into fish? More so than she already does? The rest of the gang attempts to watch over Emma in her time of crazy. I'm thirsty. Get you a drink. Emma? Emma, no. Emma, Emma, what are you doing? Emma, get it, get it, get it. Is the sparkling sound diegetic? I never thought about this. I just assumed the answer was no. Did Ricky hear the swoosh sound effect? The gang gets to the bottom of her condition and this coral thing. But what about Laurie? What about Laurie? Oh man, am I gonna have to remember this name? I tried really hard with Ash because I thought we'd see him again. I'm not making that mistake twice. Cleo and Lewis hunt for answers while Ricky loses Emma. Also, Charlotte got stood up, but nobody can be truthful to her because... Mermaids. Speaking of mermaids, they definitely just traumatized this girl. That is two children they've gaslit into insanity. Gills and scales, Emma is slowly transforming into a fish human. See, it doesn't make sense when they're already mermaids. Oh no, she's becoming slightly more fish-like than she already was. Emma ruins her parents' anniversary dinner, but Lewis saves the day with the cure Laurie developed, turning her back into 
slightly less fish. And she doesn't remember anything, just like the girls didn't when they were cursed by the full moon. Are we gonna look into this? Like, the coral had the magical powers of the full moon. There's a lot of moon-based implications later in this series. You guys don't think it's worth looking into? Oh, the episode's just gonna end with the girls laughing at Lewis and Charlotte? Okay, great. Wow, that truly was a fish fever. These transitions are hard when it's not airing on Nickelodeon anymore. What are the odds we get the answer to any of those questions we just asked this time? The Cleo family is going camping on Mako Island on the night of a full moon. What are the odds? Louis does his best to keep everyone in place, but Emma and Ricky decide to join Cleo on Mako Island to help her deal with the full moon. They assure Louis that they are big girls and can take care of themselves, which they cannot. We know they can't. We've seen this. Lewis, of course, also worms his way into this family trip. He's doing the right thing, just the wrong way. By wrong way, I mean he bails on his movie date with Charlotte to go deal with the girls, like, the same day. Damn, where was this actually filmed? This place looks beautiful. You don't see this anymore. I've got to get to Australia. Lewis decides to bring Charlotte to the Cleo family camping trip because he got brain worms between episodes or something. He didn't have a choice. She was getting suspicious, and we know the Neptunes are really bad at hiding their strangeness. It used to be an old hermit lived on this island. What do you mean used to be? Well, every now and then he's spotted. Whenever there's a full moon. Like tonight. People say he eats raw flesh. Yeah, right. What people? The ones that make it back alive. The others, well, who knows? I just wouldn't be wandering around alone if I were you. Come on, Kim. I'll help you. Surely this won't come back to bite them later. Now they're just fucking with people by howling? normal teen activity. The show started with these girls being outcasts, having to deal with popular girls and bullies, and now they're bullying the girl with no friends. Like, has Charlotte done anything? It's interesting we don't see popular girl or her pageant-winning sidekick in season two anymore because now they have become the popular girl. Once night falls and the moon rises, Lewis and Charlotte decide to go for a walk, leaving Cleo Jr. and Cleo Dad all alone. Cleo Jr., now scared of the hermit monster, comes to the girl's tent, which, well... What sure you do? What do you think they're getting up to? Go to bed! This was bound to happen, right? Cleo wanders off, Lewis and Charlotte almost kiss, Cleo Jr. rolls up, Lewis returns her to her tent, and then Emma and Ricky decide to go after Cleo. Ricky says, we can't live, I can't do the accent, we can't live in fear forever, when they have only ever lost to the moon. Like, they never once avoided it correctly. Fear might actually work if you try. I guess now they're the things people should be afraid of and not the other way around. Ricky nearly kills Charlotte with lightning. You know what I just realized? We're at the exact halfway point of this season. Huh. Cleo? Where are you? The moon shines on the underground cavernous pool as the water begins to bubble. Initially, we believe the girls just entered the pool because last year. It's almost as if the water calls to you. Charlotte nearly enters the Mako Island moon pool, but Emma freezes the pool over before she can become a full-blown mermaid. Now that would have been interesting. The next day, the girls brag about beating the full moon without Lewis's help, which is not at all what happened. I watched the episode. You almost killed someone. Speaking of abusing Charlotte, Cleo suspects she might still have mermaid powers as she did touch the ice at the same time as the full moon. So they put this to the test by spilling water on her in broad daylight in a populated area in front of everyone. Oh, so it's only a secret worth keeping if it's your secret? I do not say this lightly. I think Charlotte should be allowed to throw hands with them. At least one of them, but knowing the track record of this season, it'll probably be Lewis. In your dreams. Oh. Emma. Ash. 
Ash. God fucking damn it. I knew I had to start remembering names. It's inside the local cafe diner slash pool table spot where we learn that Emma has been working here for a little over a year. We saw her get the job in a previous episode, meaning that actually a substantial amount of time has passed in this show, making their failure to fight off the moon's curse even more absurd. And potentially Lewis has been with Charlotte longer than he ever was with Cleo. Speaking of things that are just straight up not true, Cleo complains to Ricky that Lewis spends all his time with Charlotte and she never gets to see him anymore. Again, he bailed on a movie date to go to Mako Island to help the girls. That is not true. Unless unless. What if that last season hasn't actually been over the span of the year, and instead a good couple months passed between the last episode and this one, considering that was the halfway point. Maybe ever since the island adventure that almost went horribly wrong, he's been avoiding Cleo more and more, which is fair. I know I've mainly been focusing on the Nickelodeon air dates, but I decided to check the releases of the last episode and this one. Maybe a lot of time passed in the mid-season break, and nope. <laughs> Just another week. I guess we'll just have to come to terms with the timeline of the show not making any sense and Cleo is a liar anyway. Oh no, Ash is the new supervisor at the cafe? What a wacky turn of events for Emma. We're getting another Emma plot. He implements new policy and new uniforms. The thing is, without the hat, it wouldn't even be that bad. I initially wrote a joke about how ugly the old shirts were, but this is the exact type of thing I would wear unironically and potentially the thing I am wearing right now. You can't blame it. I mean, look at me. I've got scales and a tail. I'm half fish. Shall I get the violins out? Lewis just wants to be with an ordinary girl. And not one from the deep blue underworld. Cleo. You did break up with him. She attempts to win back his favor by deep sea diving with fish set to another pop song. Mm. Montage counter, let's bring her back in. Charlotte is suspicious that Lewis was without his phone for hours as he does not explain the part about being underwater. Because like every character on this show, he likes making things more difficult for fun. Ash is making the cafe diner run a lot better and Emma does not like it. She's worried that the sandwich shop becoming a high class restaurant is gonna mean her friends will leave her behind, especially after her closest friend just took his own life, not to mention the recent divorce. Oh, wait. Oh, I'm uh, no, that's the bear. Oh, I'm sorry. They're trying too hard with this Ash hate. I feel like when the horses aren't present, there's really no reason Emma should hate this guy other than that's just how she expresses who she likes. He does attempt to turn it into a basketball themed establishment and they don't even sell wings. Huge misstep. He really doesn't know a lot about the Juice Net Cafe and it's not his fault, but he's clearly out of his depth. <laughs> And he's standing right behind me, isn't he? Um, he's right behind me, isn't he? It sucks. Every idea he's had so far has been good except for the basketball one. Why lean into this one? It's like whenever a Marvel villain is making good points, so they also need to make them crazed murderers. It makes me even more mad that it absolutely worked. I guess there's no money in taste. Emma attempts to sabotage the fruit, but Ash has a mallet for everything. Ash fires Emma and then goes to her house and rehires her. And then he asks her out and she says yes and then he leaves, and then the episode ends. It's like a monkey's paw. I asked for the season to let up on Lewis, and in response, they deleted Byron from existence. Maybe I am in a different timeline. As if Nate couldn't get any worse, now he plays guitar, trying to convince Cleo to take a couple lessons from him, this time without the fedora. <laughs> Meanwhile, Emma and Ash are being awkward. I'm starting to think this might be all this show is. Lewis. What do you know about something called ambergris? What's so funny? Ambergris is a myth. It doesn't exist. Oh, it exists, though it's very rare. Except for this, let's go, Lewis and Zane treasure adventure. If it does have some sort of mesmerizing effect on mermaids, it, it could be useful in certain situations. Never mind. I don't want to watch this anymore. Cleo Jr. invited Nate into the Cleo household to learn guitar, and he's like a vampire. Now they can't get rid of him. He's already got his hooks in Cleo, Dad. It's over for them. He's like a parasite. They're doing plumbing and everything. You can't possibly bond more than this with a dad. While Nate fumbles, Zane rolls up with the mermaid potion he got from the internet, which ruins his date with Charlotte. I can explain. You've been gunning fish? No, it was his fault. He squirted it on me. Oh my goodness. I assume this is where this is going. Now Nate has the smelly fish potion that scares everyone everyone in the cafe spot and puts Emma under a spell. I leave my sight. I want to be with you all the time and do whatever you say. But you don't think I stink? For those of you keeping track, uh, just for posterity's sake, the last three episodes in a row have been Emma gets cursed and brainwashed by a reef, a pine cone thing. Emma gets affected by the moon. 
Emma gets affected and brainwashed by a potion. See, this is what happens when you implement love potion stories. I actually thought we dodged a bullet last season, but they did it again. How did they do this again? Now he's got Emma and Cleo surrounding him and... You know what I didn't notice? We're halfway through this episode and Ricky has not made an appearance. I fear she may not show up at all. During the year-long time skip, she actually uh, went all around the world. But at least Cowboy Ash is here. I love this guy. Hey, look, it's Ricky. Your boyfriend caused a horrifying nightmare for you and your friends. Again. Can we just skip this one altogether? It's making me uncomfortable. But that's okay. The boys are back in town. You guys remember Byron? Remember when Zayn exploded? It's not like it can get any worse. <laughs> There's really only one way out of this. You guys gotta kill him. I know the fantastical elements already reminded me of Goosebumps and I guess the pink opaque, but especially here when we see no one else, it's like a ghost town aside from our main characters. We didn't even see Ricky until she blipped into existence a couple minutes ago. Nate continues to spray the gross shit on his face without even knowing what it is or what it does. The reason the girls dig the night is because he's a guitar playing karate chopping big wave surfing love machine this is the plot of the barbie movie does everything give these girls amnesia do the fish scales give them brain damage nate has accidentally become the greatest threat to the show without knowing anything about anyone he brings the girls to the beach for a swim of course not knowing about their secret double lives lewis and zane show up last minute to save the neptunes from their weird captor as the stink has now washed off in the ocean so we know what happens they turn into mermaids and then escape this frankly terrifying endeavor but for from Nate's perspective, he just lost three girls in the ocean. Like, they are surely dead. The number of characters the Neptunes have now inadvertently traumatized is now three. Probably more mm. than the montage counter. I've been shitting on Nate all episode, but he didn't know. He's just an idiot. Why the fuck did Zayn even buy this? More importantly, who sold it to him? How did they get this? Should we not be more worried about this? The world you all live in is horrifying and insane. Wow, I hated that. Season two is hell-bent on making me hate every character I grew to love. Whether that be by putting them through the ringer or making them creepy. If I could forgive Ethan and Benny, I guess I could pretend this never happened. I mean, that's what the characters are gonna do. Did they even explain what happened to the girls? Because they have amnesia. They've lost like multiple days now. If I woke up and it was three days later, I would have some questions. Okay, but there are three of them? This episode opens with a sequence shot like that one scene from Jaws of the townspeople seeing Cleo as a mermaid, but in reality, it was all just a Lewis nightmare or daymare or premonition. Dude's dreaming of Cleo while his girlfriend is right there. Honestly, if somebody came to me and told me they had a dream about something awful happening to me, I would be way more concerned, but also been dreaming about me? Was my fit hard? Was I acting chill? Emma's little brother we haven't seen in ages goes to Lewis for girl advice. Do these two even know each other? Like, have they met? One thing I do know, it's when a girl likes you. That part's usually pretty obvious. Just read the signs. Well, she's always ignoring me. Is that a good sign? Dude, at your age, that means she's totally in love with you. Hit the nail on the head, brother. You know, considering we've only ever seen him interact with one girl, it makes sense that his crush is Cleo Jr. On the other hand, the last time they chatted, she was reduced to mermaid-related hysteria. Emma just loves when her little brother is in really toxic relationships, whether that be a huge age gap or labor. Emma walks in on her brother doing Cleo Jr.'s homework. I'm not really sure that she likes you as much as you think. <laughs> You're wrong. Lewis said she's totally in love with me. His ass did not say all that. See, now Emma turns around and makes this Lewis's problem, all while she's still having terrifying visions. I get the feeling this is going to be a very Lewis-heavy episode, which could be really good or really bad. Little brother asks Lewis where he should take his abusive girlfriend on a date, and considering they're already at the diner cafe, there's only one other place they ever go. But they can't go to Mako Island, because he doesn't have a boat. So he takes her to the marine park, but not before having to take the classic Cleo dad test. No, man, I get it. The last guy who showed up here played guitar like a loser. I don't mean that playing guitar makes you a loser. I mean the specific way that Nate was playing guitar was the way a loser would. Trust me, I'm no date expert, but this is 
too many people. No such thing. I'm starting to think this whole concept was set up to get Cleo and Lewis on a romantic evening together, set to a modern pop song. Let's go. I love the montage counter. It's my favorite bit. Really anything I get used to goes away, regardless of how superfluous. I miss that thing. I have attachment issues. The only issue the brother has is lack of funds. Cleo is worried that Cleo Jr. is using him, but she fails to realize that maybe he just wants to be used. <laughs> Okay, never mind. Now this is getting dangerous. Cleo gets splashed at the marine park, so she jumps into the marine park, and now Lewis's premonition is coming true. I know this may look like footage from a Breaking Bad episode, but I assure you this is H2O. Lewis covers for Cleo, but we aren't at the beach. This isn't how the dream happened. Wait a minute, why do we believe the dream anyway? I've learned to stop asking questions about this world, at least legitimate ones. I didn't mention it because it didn't seem important, but the B-plot of this episode is Ricky and Ash sneaking around and Emma growing suspicious, but it turns out they were planning a present for her. I only mention it because it's the closest we're gonna get to more Ricky-Emma content in mid-season two. At first, I thought I was overplaying the, the shipping dynamics of these characters and not focusing enough on the fantastical, magical world, and then I look deeper into these episodes and it's, it's still all dating even the kid characters. I wanted to slay a dragon and go on a pirate ship. The episode ends with the kids still bound together as Lewis asks Cleo about dreams, but she seems entirely unaware of the concept as if she's never heard of dreams before. Not a thought behind those eyes. Anyways, uh, uh, more video. More video for you. Here's more. Uh, the video is going to continue right now. More video. I don't know, man. This is exhausting. I just know some dumb shit's about to happen. Cleo is getting baptized on Mako Island. The full moon is upon us once again as the timeline is moving forward as it used to. And by us, I mean Ricky and Cleo, all while Emma has to turn down Ash for tonight. They're like zero and 10 against the moon. There's no way. He doesn't understand why as no one on this team thought of a half decent excuse over 10 months. Cleo and Ricky attempt to convince Emma to tell Ash the truth of their mermaid powers, which is incredibly irresponsible. You guys don't even trust Lewis right now. We're just supposed to tell every boy we like what happened to byron what did you guys do to him the neptunes give lewis the night off they say they don't need him anymore which is you guessed it a crop of shit you almost killed someone last month but just when they think they have everything covered cowboy shows up with a mystery box and leaves the door open don't you guys live in australia are there not creatures about you wouldn't want in your house i'm asking too many questions it's unbecoming hi um can you just hold that for a sec thanks Beautiful. It's almost cartoonish how consistently this goes terribly wrong. The moon powers are really a crapshoot. It's like spinning a wheel, except one of the options is X-Men powers and the other is fish. Ricky, of course, immediately notices something is wrong. The moon makes them act weird. We've seen it. You see here, Cleo is only seen through a reflection, showing that she has been turned by the image of the moon, but then we see Ricky cross into the shot, which means nothing. Ricky brings Emma upstairs, away from their romantic dinner Ash set up, to deal with their toddler brain friend. But Ricky has been an avid Emma Ash supporter from day one, so despite making her go upstairs with her, she now assures her that she can handle Cleo herself, which she can't. <laughs> This time, it's ironically the influence of the moon that prevents a kiss instead of causing one, as a crazed Ricky and Cleo are now deliberately trying to out their secret to Ash. The girls corner Emma in the bathroom and then menacingly march towards her, pushing her over where she falls backwards and then sideways into the bathtub. <laughs> Congrats, girls. You have certainly proven that you cannot do this at all by yourself. The other two urge Ash to join Emma in the bathroom, telling him she has something to show you, which he is rightfully spooked by. But right before he could open the door, our hero, Lewis, shows up. Look who isn't needed now. Lewis kicks the cowboy out and doesn't even say, I told you so, when he certainly has every right to. You girls are losing multiple days worth of memories. It's like two or three in the span of 30 days. That doesn't seem like a huge discrepancy, but it's certainly more days than you and I forget on a monthly basis. 
basis. This has ceased to be a mermaid thing. You gal should go see a doctor. The episode ends not with a secret revealed, but with Emma and Ash kissing in the local pool table slash cafe spot while the whole train claps. Opa, homeless style. Things are heating up in the mermaid community. Even before they got moonstruck, Cleo and Ricky wanted Emma to bring Ash into the gang, which makes sense. He has access to horses, which will be an invaluable asset when it comes to defeating the big bad of this season. Whether that be traffickers or scientists is really up to the show's discretion. Wait a minute, did I just hear myself saying heating up? Okay, so... Um, the girls are preparing to celebrate their anniversary. The anniversary of what, you may ask? Today marks one year since they all became mermaids. So, your questions may be correct. We've had a decent number of full moons, which if I remember correctly, occur only once a month. And I previously theorized that the show, the initial time they turned into mermaids, the first episode, began in January. It doesn't help that they never celebrate any holidays. It's perpetual summer. So I'm, I'm simply at a loss here. My fault for trying to assemble a timeline. But that also kind of implies that Zane only tried to kill Leo like four or five months before he started seeing Ricky. I think my numbers might be off. Isn't there an episode happening? Ash kicks Zane out of the local pool table slash cafe spot for being Zane. You guessed it, being white. Which makes Ricky and Emma fight, both running to support their mans. And on their anniversary of all days, this begins to worry Cleo. Emma and Ricky always disagree about stuff and I'm always the one in the middle. But this time... This time what? This time it's serious. I mean... What if we were never mermaids? We'd never have been friends. Considering you met that same day? Probably. If you think about it, none of this would have happened if Zane didn't try and kill her. You should be thanking him. Remember when he exploded? Cleo decides that the perfect place for the girls and their boys to work out their differences is at the ocean very close to the coast. This is where she tells only Emma and Ricky that the anniversary will be held at Mako Island, which, while a bad idea, makes more sense thematically than at the marine park or something. Zane and Ash are currently at each other's throats, and you know what that means? Tension. Waving pool cues, it's lame. Oh, you think? Doesn't make you a better player. What, you think you can take me on the pool table? Whoa! Okay, tough guy. Put your money where your mouth is. Why are you thinking about his mouth? I can't believe it took this long for the pool table to be an important staging point. That's pretty much this place's claim to fame. That's what I named it after. To make this even more complicated and messy, Nate goes to Zane's defense to try and cheat for him. Remember, this is exactly what Cleo did for Lewis when they were dating. Now this is the content I've been waiting for. Where's Byron? Wait a minute, didn't Ash already ban this guy from sticking up the joint episodes ago? Speaking of cheating, Ricky boils Ash's skin. Classic Ricky, it means she likes you. So Emma retaliates by freezing Zane's fingers, but he knows all about this mermaid stuff while well, he can't say anything out loud. Not to pick sides, but if we have to have one or the other, I'd say keep the guy who's been helping you hide it. That's why Ash yelled at him in the first place. You're cheating. You started it. Don't make me finish it. What does that mean? You gonna kill this guy? Cleo and Charlotte both sulk alone in a montage set to mm. H2O Sad Music number two while everyone is distracted by the game. You guys remember Charlotte? And by distracted, I mean the second that the girls leave to go find Cleo. Where are the girls? I have no idea. So, are we just gonna let this go? I can't be bothered anymore. You? Not really. You wanna get a drink? Forget what I said actually, can I pick a side that just these two together? Dudes rock. Lewis makes it to his date a little late, but Char still understands. I guess it goes to show, everyone else can be happy only when Cleo isn't, and vice versa. Someone's gonna have to bear this cross. I mean, she went all out decorating Mako Island. When the girls finally show up, they watch a slideshow that is either set to diegetic music or this is just background montage music that they do not hear and are sitting in a cave in silence. Weird. 
You guys are weird. Well, I've been flipped. That was easy. I am now the world's biggest Zane and Ash shipper. I'm really easy, man. I don't have gay favoritism. It just helps. I don't hate Charlotte and Lewis. Like we're clearly supposed to. I know these in-between transitions have been going by quicker and quicker. Probably because I realized how far away we still are from the finish line, despite how long we've been here already. And it's mostly because since we've left Nickelodeon, I've really had no reason to talk about the air dates. But what's interesting about these next two episodes is that in some territories, they aired back to back as, you guessed it, a fake TV movie. The Gracie Code Part 1 and 2 would air together, a subtitled H2O Just Add Water, and then there were four. They could have just called it the Gracie Code, but you know, I'm all for theatrics. Second of all, really long name. Third of all, before even seeing this episode or TV movie, I can already kind of guess where it's going, but I do still have questions. Who is Gracie? Why is she code? What is the code? The code is, who is the code? Is it Mick Foley? By the way, this TV movie only aired in places like Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria my wheelhouse. You guys know how I'm always talking about Bulgaria. I can't shut up about it. I'm starting to realize that even this many episodes separated from the finale that we may be on the precipice of a major status quo change, so what are we doing waiting here? Lewis is running more tests on Mako Island as he's realized that there's some sort of magnetic interference surrounding the cave and moon pool. I was initially gonna comment on how we only ever see two girls at the start of every episode now, and then I realized, oh wait, Emma has a job. And then I took a beat and thought, hold on, doesn't Cleo have a job? We've seen her at the Marine Park, but we haven't seen her do any work since Lewis got her a job back, which what's even the point of getting her job back then? This timeline is gonna make me rip my hair out again, and I fear that it's only gonna get more confusing and convoluted. Apparently, someone did the same research as Lewis did 50 years ago, around the Water Witch's time. Wait a minute. Where is she? I know I keep making jokes, but I truly feel as though this is like a season two of an alternate version of the show. Water which fell into the void with Byron and Cleo's mom. Lewis does more research and confronts the man who did this magnetic planetary research all those years ago. And after all that time, he still never left the coast by Mako Island. I was wondering if you knew the guy that lived up in that house? I do, as a matter of fact. Oh, you do? Top fella. Do you know where I might find him? Standing right next to you. Max Hamilton. Oh, cool. Star Wars reference. This is Max Hamilton. Like any bloke, he refuses to answer any questions about his past and he just wants to fish, goddammit. Lewis grills him, but to no avail. Lewis, be careful. I've got a bad feeling about this. Oh, cool. Star Wars reference. Cleo's bad feeling was right, as Max Hamilton followed Lewis around all day, hiding behind very thin trees and is transfixed on Cleo's necklace. He takes one look at the locket and out loud he mutters, Gracie. Like the code! The next day, the old timer finds Lewis, and Lewis asks him how he found him, as he does not answer. And Lewis is not as concerned by this as he should be. Now, Max is the one asking questions, asking about the locket and Mako Island! Old timer agrees to give Lewis more intel on his research if he can get a closer look at the locket. At first, it seems like Lewis refuses, but the next scene we see him get it off Cleo, and then the next scene after that, we see him giving it to Max Hamilton. Lewis! I knew I recognized it. Now, I would have been able to. I made it. 50 years ago. I made three in total, each one slightly different. This locket was Max Hamilton's favorite. It belonged to the girl of his dreams. He projects this story onto Lewis. Crazy that the exact thing happened exactly 50 years ago, and it will likely happen in another 50 years. Catch me talking about the new show in 2057, where I will be right here. I just realized I might actually be here forever. Sorry, there's an episode happening. Lewis rejects this claim, saying that Cleo did love him once, but they were just kids. On one hand, you may be thinking, just kids, that was a couple months ago. But again, we don't know how the timeline falls, and you fail to realize that they were 16 when they dated, and now they're 17. That might as well be a decade to a teenager. Why is this messy old man trying to split up Lewis and Charlotte? He may subconsciously take this to heart as Lewis goes to the Cleo house to hang, but Cleo says she's busy. Again, we have not seen her at her job in a good 10 plus episodes. Back to research. Thought maybe we could spend some time together today? Yeah, that, uh, that sounds really good, Charlotte. Good Charlotte? Where? Lewis has got a new girlfriend as Max Hamilton asks to go to Mako Island with him to share his research. Like, I know I'm a deeply untrusting person, but 
Lewis, you just met this guy, and he already hasn't lived up to his side of the deal. Well, now past Lewis and present Lewis are off on Mako Island as the score plays a knockoff Indiana Jones classic. I just hope Max Hamilton fares better than Satipo. He flashes back to his time on the island with his true love, the red one. I forgot her name. You know what? The episode's called The Gracie Code. Oh, they really are going all out for this episode. You guys know I was just kidding, right? Way to go, Squidward. You ruined his favorite fucking holiday for him. We taking money from the CG bubble budget? Haven't seen one of those in a good while. Max, like the girls and Charlotte before him, falls down the hole into the cave and comes across Cleo. Lucky Emma isn't here to declare the queen of the hole. Cleo is understandably shocked by the appearance of this old man and the fact that he knows her name. He's asking a lot of questions as he steps closer and closer to the moon pool. He reaches in and splashes Cleo with water, who dives into the pool, revealing her mermaid form. But Max Hamilton is not shocked by this. It's as if he's seen it before. Time for some lore! Back in the day, Max Hamilton was not told about the mermaid curse. He followed the girls to the island and found out against their better judgment. Technically how Lewis found out, but ever so slightly creepier. Gracie and Max were happy together. Max did all the research he could. On the island, on the moon, on the water, on mermaids. Gracie found being a mermaid harder than the others, so Max got to work trying to work out a back door. But it wasn't enough. She slid deeper and deeper into depression. Max made the necklaces for the girls to show his loyalty, which is not the version of the story we heard earlier in the series. Whether or not this creepy stalker is lying here or not is up to you. But the most important part of the story is the fallout. What happened to Gracie? What happened? I lost it. Hmm. I have a lot more questions, but Cleo and Lewis do not as they exchange glances to each other under the moonlight of Mako Island. Max states he has to leave, and Lewis follows because, I mean, he drove him here. You and Cleo, you remind me of Gracie and me. That's not the compliment you think it is. Your story makes it seem like she went missing to get away from you. Lewis takes this advice to heart regardless and gifts the now fixed up locket to Cleo while also getting all of Max's old research, which we know amounted to nothing. The episode ends with all of us thinking, what the hell makes this a two part story? Like the true quirked up quirky, Lewis and the gang take the information and research they got from Max and put it on a big cork board. It's classic science, man. As they're having fun theory time, Charlotte calls Lewis's phone, which Cleo picks up. All in all, she's pretty understanding of this despite it being incredibly suspect. This would have drove me up the fucking wall. Then Lewis lies and gaslights her, telling her she's worrying for no reason and has nothing to worry about as they're working on a school project, even though they're on a break. Uh, potential confirmation of what month we're inside of? I don't know when they go on break. I'm gonna be real, Charlotte. I don't think this dude is worth all this. So afterwards, Charlotte comes to see Cleo, where she's confronted with all these maps and papers. She's incredibly apologetic until- Thanks. I really appreciate you being so cool about it. Where did you get that? Oh, that was just with the rest of the junk. Well, what's so special about it? No reason. It's just such a pretty, Picture. It's my grandmother. What? Her name was Gracie. Why do you have a picture of my grandmother? I knew you were gonna be important to something. Did her grandma burn down the records office? Is that why they introduced the lightning ability? Lewis is upset that Ricky and Cleo let Charlotte take the picture, but I feel like that's a pretty reasonable response. Charlotte is the only one completely within her right, and everyone is making her feel like she's insane. Lewis goes to interrogate his girlfriend, who his best friends say he cannot trust. She doesn't remember a lot. Gracie died when she was very young. She does remember her being weird, which tracks with what we know about mermaids, but then she looks closer to the picture. Lewis, the locket. What? Cleo, Ricky, and Emma wore the same locket that my grandmother wore. Ah, oh, there's a similarity. But they're exactly the same. Don't you think that's bizarre? Lewis again convinces her that nothing is wrong, but again, if this happened to me, I would be in hysterics. What do you mean my boyfriend's ex has a picture of my grandmother and also the locket she used to wear? I'm calling the police. I'm gonna pass on my Gazgano Comtech to my grandchildren, um, and I'd be irreconcilable if they lost it. Meanwhile, Ash attempts to throw Emma in the ocean after she told him that she is deathly afraid of water. This is psychotic. He had a pretty good run, 
up until that point. So, um, Emma almost reveals her secret to Ash because she's angry until this abandoned beach ceases to be empty as she leaves in a tiff. Charlotte seeks to learn more about her grandmother from her mother. Apparently, this is where Charlotte got her pension for art. That's sweet. People hate this girl? Charlotte needs answers, so she shows up to the Cleo house when she believes no one is there to retrieve pictures of her own grandmother. But as it turns out, Cleo Jr. is there. But she hates Cleo anyway, so she lets her sworn enemy inside. Charlotte pockets the film reel that the girls tell Lewis they never watched because they didn't have a projector, which is not true. We definitely saw projector episodes ago, unless that was an impossibly super flat screen TV. It's not like she can watch it, right? You can't really play one of those old films on a DVD player. Unless she gets a transfer to disc. Charlotte is my favorite character this season. She deserves the world. Lewis gets to Charlotte as she's watching the film reel and it's too late to stop her. Charlotte sees her first glimpse of a mermaid. Charlotte just found out a shocking revelation about her family and the grandmother she thought she knew, and Lewis is back to work at the gaslight factory. The Neptunes convene as Lewis assures the girls that there's no way Charlotte should suspect the girls are mermaids, which is true. I mean, she just found out mermaids were real. Hey, how about this? Why don't you just tell her? You were about to tell Ash and we just met this guy. I've been doing my best thus far to talk about the show in which the window it was released, a television show that released weekly, occasionally, back to back on the same day, either on Nickelodeon or overseas. Well, the truth of the matter is, like I mentioned previously, I've been watching all these episodes on a YouTube playlist, which gives us a unique opportunity to see what this show's viewership, at least the modern ones, are saying and thinking about the show as they're watching it. For no reason in particular, let's read some comments from the Gracie Code Part 2. Put the little smash transition in, even though it doesn't make any sense. I didn't leave the comment. I am annoyed with Charlotte. She had no business going through Cleo's stuff. Choosing Charlotte over Cleo is like choosing a bus bus ticket over a Ferrari. I love Ricky this season. She's the only one who treats Charlotte the way she deserves, lol. I'm doing an H2O marathon, but I find it so hard to get through episodes like this because Charlotte is just so- ah! Cleo really needs to get a lock for her door already. Oh my God, dude. That title does not instill hope. Oh, that's why they called the movie that. In areas previously mentioned, this episode was aired with the Gracie two-parter as the full TV movie a fake TV movie. Everyone becomes obsessed with mermaids the second they think they see one. We saw it with Cleo Jr. and then Murder Boy and now Red Hair. The Neptunes want Lewis to dispose of the evidence, and by that I mean all the research Max Hamilton did. But Lewis wants to keep doing more research. Whatever that means. It's always the vague idea of research, but we never see it go anywhere. Just ancient books or potions bought on eBay. It's a shame they set up this important character as Lewis and Charlotte now both have reasons to see Max. Charlotte found the love note Gracie wrote to him when they were young. This would be a much better arc if they didn't air all of these episodes back to back in one movie, but here we are. The point I was making is we don't see Max in a lot of episodes, mainly just these three, but if they're all aired together as a movie, it's as if like he was just a blip on the radar. Lewis tries to get his girlfriend off their trail, but I think he forgot how good she is at stalking him. She sees him talking to Max Hamilton, then confronts him herself. You're in love. You knew everything about her, didn't you? Sorry, you're, you're mistaken. Please, I need to know. She was my grandmother. I'm not leaving until you tell me everything. That's the face of a man who may or may not have illegitimate children all over town. I get it. I get why the girls hate Charlotte. She gets like three or four parental figures while some of us only have one and he sucks. Max and Charlotte grow closer while reminiscing on Gracie off of these pictures. Is she really a mermaid? Yes, she really was a mermaid. Well, that settled. A mysterious old man said it. It must be true. It's a good thing Lewis didn't give him all his research back so he could prove it to her. Oh. It's the fucking full moon again. What year is it, 2012? And they're gonna go swimming? All right, whatever happens to you guys tonight, you deserve. The kids are fucking around having a fun time where there should be danger as Max and Charlotte are having simultaneous earth shattering revelation. Charlotte combines the footage of her grandmother and the drawings of the moon pool to finally figure out She's been to this exact spot. Close enough, welcome back Summer of Ultra Indiana Jones. Now she really is trying to compete with Cleo. Have I said lately that Charlotte is the most compelling character? She's the only one not being dumb or mean. All we need now is a way to make her a permanent member of the cast. Going slow over the ring. Are you kidding? Going fast is so much better. Listen to you two. At least they won't. Lewis, this is 
all your fault. You and that stupid research. Are you guys even friends? Do you even like being around each other? Charlotte's still there. How long were they in the cave for? How did they get home dry so fast? As the moon begins to rise in the water of Mako Island, the moon pool begins to bubble and sparkle and boil. Actually, wait. Did, when did it sparkle? Charlotte, not even dipping her appendage in first, jumps right into the Mako Island moon pool. See, I knew this was gonna happen. I read the title. But forget about that. The real cause for celebration is that for the first time since gaining their powers, the Neptune successfully avoided the full moon. I'm so proud of you all. All it took was three or four years. The show is strange. I was always a little bit jealous of how much time you used to spend with Cleo. I tried not to be, but I was. But I never understood why you spent so much time with Ricky and Emma, too. Well, that's because we're all good friends. Dude, Ricky fucking hates you. Charlotte is remarkably understanding. This is kind of the ultimate win for Lewis. He gets his mermaid girlfriend and he never has to apologize for keeping secrets or bailing on her several times. But he doesn't see it that way. Lewis reacts to Charlotte's new form with abject horror and then credits. This is the only episode of The Last Handful that actually ended on Cliffhanger, and it's where the movie ends. TV movie, not a real movie. And even then, it's not even technically a TV movie. Bro, this one should have been part one. As excited as I am for how the story will unfold, I mean, we only have a couple episodes left in season two. We have to check in with my favorite segment, YouTube comments. Does anyone else notice how Charlotte literally has zero friends? Gee, I wonder why. Who wishes Lewis said no when Charlotte said, do you still want to be with me? Thumbs up for who hates that Charlotte became a mermaid. This has inadvertently made her my favorite character on the show. Didn't we already do the whole witch cauldron thing? Cleo immediately sees mermaid Charlotte. Well, that certainly saves us some time in this episode. Okay, so everyone knows it. We're like a good minute into this episode and most of that was the theme song. They all blame Lewis saying that this is his fault and he has to deal with this, whatever that means. It's always felt like you guys were part of some kind of club or something. I guess we were. It's more like a band, but okay. Lewis promises Charlotte that there'll be no more secrets between them. And I mean, there don't need to be anymore. Also kind of fucked up that Charlotte immediately told Lewis like the first person she went to after this groundbreaking secret, she like, they didn't even want to tell Lewis initially. She went to him. Like Lewis, these girls do not have your best interest at heart. And now you have no reason to keep hiding. She already knows. The girls convene and Ricky is the main one campaigning against bringing Charlotte into the Neptunes, which is big talk considering the only reason Ricky has any friends is because of the mermaid of it all. Maybe that YouTube comment was right. I think Charlotte does need some friends. It seems like everyone aside from Ricky is at least open to the idea. Cleo is just very suggestible. We know you've been going through a few changes lately. Yep, that's one way of putting it. Hey! We can bring the puberty running gag back into the video. More like talking about puberty makes me gag. The Neptunes show Charlotte their individual water-based powers, where they run tests on her to see if she has any latent ability. It only took us like 20 episodes, but I like this dynamic. Lewis is doing his best to help Charlotte, who Ricky hates for some reason, so she criticizes her. But it's normally for stuff that Ricky was also guilty of, like taking longer to figure out her power, all while Emma defends Charlotte, thus causing more bickering between the girlfriends. Cleo is also there. It seems every time they introduce a new character and have an interesting dynamic, Cleo just kind of has to sit on the sidelines. Also, they do volleyball or something. If this isn't some kind of metaphor, then this episode has gone far off the rails. Oh, I get it. They can't work as a team. This is an episode you write like 10 or so into the Charlotte Mermaid art. The show conditions the viewers to be opposed to Charlotte by having most of the characters hate her for a lot of the runtime. So pulling this story is a very bold move, but I like Charlotte. I feel for her, I really do. Give her a chance, Ricky. It's not just her. Think about it, the original mermaids were a threesome. Ricky, that's not... Don't say that. Ricky does her best to turn the team against Char, even provoking Cleo by bringing up the fact that she's now dating Cleo's ex, who Ricky told her to break up with. Char finally discovers her power. She can move water. That's kind of what Cleo does, but okay. Cleo seems way more upset by this than the whole Lewis thing. The rest of the episode is just volleyball. As much as I'd like to ask several questions about how Cleo can just bend the wind now for some reason, I don't think it's worth it. We're like halfway to Avatar now. If we count the lightning and the fire, like three fourths. Volleyball brings them closer together as now all of them are ganging up on Lewis. Fantastic, great. Charlotte has heat powers like Ricky as well. It's like they want people to hate her. When is she gonna learn the wind power that Cleo has for today and only today? At least this part of the volleyball is set to music montage. Mm -hmm. I'll take it. Wait, I thought you already had my power. Yeah, guess I've got Ricky's too. 
Oh, and one more thing. Oh, girl. The YouTube comments are gonna hate this. Just as the song states, the best things come in three, not four. On one hand, this is absurd hate and over the top vitriolic. On the other hand, if they're trying to push Charlotte as one of the four now, one of the Neptunes, what did they expect was gonna happen? Most of, if not all of your audience is children or adults with the mental capacity of children. I'm leaving the asterisk in for me so I can watch it without public scrutiny. You spend 20 episodes having your main characters hate her every time she breathes. She becomes a mermaid by choice and then gains all of their powers, except for wind. I don't hate her, I feel bad for her, but she's not real. Neither are mermaids, and yet here we are. You set up this character for failure. What other outcome could there be? Why can't we all get along? Charlotte, they're kicking your ass in the quote retweets. Nate teases Lewis with his jet ski while the man is simply trying to fish. He even manages to knock around the camera guy. Lewis, in a frankly insane trick move, casts his rod around the jet ski, knocking Nate off and crashing it in the process. Nate demands Lewis pay for the damages, but Lewis doesn't respect him. Who do you think you are, Zane? <laughs> Charlotte vents about being chased by dolphins to the other Neptunes, which Cleo assures her in a reductive manner that dolphins are not hostile or aggressive, which is factually not true. I don't know who's been doing PR for dolphins over the last decade, but those things are monsters. She storms out, frustrated. Her boyfriend Lewis takes matters into his own hands, and by that I mean he takes her to the marine park and makes it Cleo's problem. And the one time in a long while we've seen her doing her job. I like that we've dropped any pretense that the marine park is dangerous for mermaids. We're all just cool being here. I know Charlotte is new, but she gets wet immediately. <laughs> Charlotte. Oh, how could you tell? This is the most blood-curling scream I've heard all show. Cleo tries to give her advice, but she takes it personally and storms off again. Nate approaches Lewis with a bill, but again, it's Nate. Who cares? All right, I could see just this once. If I've only seen one episode of the show and it's this one, I would also dislike Charlotte. But it's not like the other characters haven't had episodes that also grind my gears. They're all out to be annoying sometimes. Our plots converge as Nate comes across Lewis and Charlotte. He attempts to scare Lewis off by crushing plastic. Ooh, which apparently has become a problem. I'm Lewis. Actually, this show rocks. I've never seen the Zelda t-shirt and cargo pants combo on this kind of alpha. Hey, look, it's Ash. I think. I'm actually not sure. Basically, every other guy has left this show, which is ultimately why we're stuck with Nate storylines now. As a supportive girlfriend, Charlotte goes to use her powers to... I guess kill Nate. Like, I know I say that a lot, but I legitimately don't know what else she could be planning. But the other Neptunes combine their powers to undo her attempted murder. She really has become one of the girls. It's like initiation. I love this dynamic. He asked for Pickles core. Lewis confronts Charlotte because what she did was very reckless. But she defends her actions as she's the only one who actually cares about Lewis. I wonder what the internet will say about this. The moment she boiled Ronnie, I swear to God, that never left my mind and I felt the need to punch someone in the face that bad. Normal reaction. Who the fuck is Ronnie? Not even gonna bother speculating what that title means. What are you doing, Charlie? You're gonna start a fire. Uh, start a fire? It's already started. I knew she burnt down the records building. Okay, so Charlotte is just an X-Men now. Cool, great. Zane is in town, hopefully for Lewis's birthday, where Charlotte and Cleo fight over what they should do for his birthday. Charlotte wants to throw a surprise party while Cleo wants to send him off on a party boat. I mean, Lewis does love boats, not sure about the party part. Ricky snaps at Charlotte and bails to hang out with Zane. Honestly, a much better usage of her time. I never understood the appeal of surprise parties. Like, why would I want my friends to pretend they don't know it's my birthday all day? And what if I then get my hopes up for a surprise and then they just legitimately forgot? People did often forget my birthday. Mermaid show. No mermaid club. I've decided to take a step back from the girls. <laughs> really? I'm not kidding. I promise. You were right. We hardly ever see each other and it's about time that changed. I think Ricky's planning on leaving this show. Man, they'll just let anyone in this party. They got the cowboy to show up. Lewis is surprised, but by a party of mostly Charlotte's friends, none of which he knows. Cleo kisses Lewis and then complains that Charlotte won't allow them to hang out as friends. And just as I was about to defend Charlotte again. Oh no. 
What? You don't have to let Charlotte win, you know. Why? Is she a super villain? Ash finds the girls trapped behind a door with water pouring out from under the door. Ricky and Zane show up just in time to stop the secret from getting out to Cowboy. Zane tells him it's secret women's business. Their water broke. Both of their waters broke. Dude's always gotta be up in women's business. We're two episodes away from the finale, and Charlotte has revealed herself to be the secret villain all of a sudden. Maybe the YouTube comments watched more of the show than I thought. She is no longer the good Charlotte. The Neptunes rescue Lewis from the lame surprise party with a party boat. Remember? From earlier. Remember when Zane exploded? Important note, if that happened to me, I would never go on a boat again if I were him, but whatever. The episode ends with the girls telling Charlotte she's on her own from now on, which seems more like a liability for them than anything, as the party floats away on the titular party boat. I'm not even gonna bother with the YouTube comments this time. Even though she's a fictional character, I fear for her life. They hated her when she was a minor nuisance. Now that she's actively done wrong, they're probably gonna saw her head off. I will stand by what I said though. Up until this point, Charlotte has been way too overhated, but we only have two episodes left, and would you believe me if I told you in some territories those episodes aired back to back as a fake TV movie? A novel concept, I know. The movie was titled H2O colon Just Add Water dash the finale, but as you could tell by how much of this video is left, we'll see about that. Who will Charlotte light on fire this episode? He's eating, she's serving, but who's doing the damn dishes? Dishes aren't done and that's going crazy. I'm not your slave. Of course not. I pay you. Capitalism. I am not lying. The plot of this episode is Cleo struggling to find someone to do her dishes as her father scolds her to get them finished. But she can't because of the water. Like, yeah, Charlotte is making Lewis avoid Cleo, but more importantly, the dishes need to be completed. I'll quote the water bottle from the opening. Wait, what's happening? Why are we fighting? <laughs> Look at you. You call yourself a mermaid. You're pathetic. I see what Lewis sees in her. She takes the locket from Cleo by force as it belonged to her grandmother and not hers, and she makes Lewis put it on her and kisses with her eyes open in front of Cleo so she can see. When did Charlotte become a Game of Thrones villain? I may have judged the YouTube comments too harshly. How would I know in the last three episodes she would become the Dark Phoenix and become evil? Cleo runs off into the ocean to avoid the dishes, and she's upset about Lewis, but mostly the dishes. Emma. My daughter ran away because she couldn't do the dishes. This is entirely based on nothing, but I guarantee this is why the wife left the family. Nobody in this damn house. The search party gathers at the Cleo house, and Emma asks Ricky where could she have gone, which they immediately check Mako Island because they know like five locations. The thing is, she was there. She was just hiding. Don't we have a guy for this? A mermaid and a normal girl, just like Gracie. She grew unhappy with being a mermaid. It's not easy find a balance between the two worlds. So much impossible. So Cleo's just gonna be a mermaid now? I gotta say, this is probably a better use of her skills, even though she couldn't swim when the show started. Lewis confronts Charlotte about hiding his phone the day Cleo went missing. Her story is starting to catch up with her. Of course, she didn't make Cleo go missing. The records office, I'm not so sure. Lewis drives his dinky boat out to shark infested waters and dives past said sharks to rescue Cleo from the prison of her own making. He extends his hand and she reaches out and grabs him. They wash back to shore, sit side by side and talk. She questions why he rescued her as if it isn't obvious. Then the two sit on this random beach out in the middle of nowhere while the cops are looking for her. Lewis cheats on his girlfriend. Damn. All this because of dirty dishes. I guess it worked. I mean, Cleo's return home and her father is so elated, he completely forgets about the pile of dirty dishes that will only get bigger. Even Lewis has won back his respect as they look so happy together. Okay, dude, am I? 
excited. I liked Charlotte before because everyone was being mean to her and then I disliked her because she was kind of annoying and now I'm back to liking her again because she's an over-the-top villain. Like, what else could that ending mean? She's gonna try and kill Cleo, right? I'm not saying that murder is warranted, but murder of passion is a legal term. Her boyfriend did cheat on her, but honestly, that's more of your boyfriend's fault than anything. I'm not saying I want Charlotte to win. I'm just saying I want to see what she does. So here we are the season two finale of H2O Just Add One. All of our players are in place. Lewis is going to hunt for a white whale out at sea as the girls prepare for yet another full moon. The Neptunes attempt to try and warn Charlotte about the oncoming full moon as it's constantly- <laughs> What the fuck? I don't know why Ash is pretending he didn't see that whole thing. The girls just fell out of the sky. Meanwhile, on the Lewis side of things, he does some research with Max Hamilton and says this month's full moon is the strongest. Yes, I also don't know what that means. It's here from Max Hamilton that Lewis learns that this is a special full moon that shows up once every 50 years and can actually take away their mermaid powers. Not just for 24 hours, but for good, as that is what happened with the Water Witch and her friends, Gracie and the other one. It takes Lewis confronting her about the attack for Charlotte to take this special full moon seriously. Ash is suspicious. I've been thinking about what I saw this morning. It was an accident. But it's not just this morning, is it? There's a lot of things about you that don't add up. This would be a lot more compelling if we saw more of this guy beyond being a background character. Also, where did his horses go? I feel like aside from vouching for Charlotte at first, Emma hasn't been doing a whole lot either. Maybe Charlotte was a bad idea. Speaking of Charlotte and bad ideas, she looks right at the moon while standing outside. It looks like we got a new water witch. Bad Charlotte makes all the water in the house blast out, boil, and shake. A tendril of water, remember that for later, appears to splash ash. Surely he doesn't suspect a thing. Lewis has finally had enough. It breaks his heart, but he convinces Bad Charlotte to go to Mako Island with him. His plan seems bulletproof, but then he texts Cleo that he's meeting Charlotte there, but doesn't explain why. Like, if you want to be a good boyfriend and be honest, why would you purposefully leave out details that make you look worse? Of course she's gonna go after them. It's Cleo. I thought the show was just being dumb, but- Cleo, please go. Not without you, Lewis. I knew that if you came here, she'd follow you. You're so predictable. You knew she'd come. You used me as bait. Oh, Lewis. That's smart. Unlike your little friend here, I've known why you wanted to get me into the moon pool all along. Hello, why tonight's so special, Lewis? Any mermaid in that pool when the full moon passes over tonight loses her powers. I never thought this show, H2O, would have a villain monologue in its season finale. The show is the middle point between Babysitter and Stoked, but I know, unlike those, it has a third season, and I know there's more after this. Charlotte yells that Cleo isn't worthy of her powers. It's her birthright, not theirs. <laughs> You know they were practicing that shit before they showed up. Okay, now we're doing the fight from the end of Attack of the Clones, except it looks more realistic and has better defined characters. A water snake? What show is this, man? I told you these water bubble effects would come back. All right, enough jokes. <laughs> I'm actually at a loss for words. When I started this fun mermaid show about puberty, never in my life did I think it would lead to this. Why didn't they show this on Nickelodeon? That makes me so pissed. The season ends, the final season they initially had planned from the jump, with Lewis removing the locket from Charlotte's charred corpse and Emma showing the truth to Ash. 
Finally. Cool. All right, man, he definitely knew. This season ends with Lewis, Zane, and Ash, the boyfriends, watching Cleo, Emma, and Ricky play around in the water. That's all well and good, and I hate to ruin it. Actually, no, I don't. So the full moon just doesn't affect them at all now. Like, they had wind and lightning powers, but they weren't acting weird. Not any weirder than they normally act, and also they remember what happened. As far as forgetting goes, I feel like the show is just gonna forget about this, this development, whenever it's convenient. How permanent is this full moon thing, this special 50-year moon? Like, if Charlotte wanted to, she could just go back to the moon pool and get her powers again, right? And what's stopping Charlotte from still revealing their secret to everybody? Like, she has proof. She has documents. Her relative. She's not a mermaid anymore, but she could still spill their secret. Oh, what's that beneath her? She created water serpents? Unless she's a bigger part of season three, but considering what happened to Byron, I doubt it. Unless, of course, she loses her corporeal form and becomes a water tentacle. Maybe. The show was initially only planned to have two series of 52 episodes for syndication, but due to popular demand, a new season was greenlit. Which is never a good sign. Did they know in season two that they were getting a third and try and end on a high note? And now they're like, ah, fuck, we gotta make another one. What's that picture of Steven Universe doing here? The first season would be the only one to air in the US on Nickelodeon, where I watched it. The third season would begin airing in the United Kingdom in 2009 and would eventually air in Australia in 2010. Ew. Where's your honor? Where's your Australian pride? As of writing this, of course not as of filming this, I have not watched season three, but considering how hit or miss season two was, and I kind of didn't even want to watch past season one, I'm apprehensive. I'm scared. Not concerned enough to stop though. I mean, we're already closer to the end than we were earlier of the original series run. Why stop now? Might as well wrap up one more season. No more episode air dates, no more rhetorical questions, and certainly no more TV movies. I mean that. Whoa, new theme song performance? Whoa, new logo? Whoa, who is that? New girl unlock. Cleo and Ricky walk the beach as some goons accost them. They taunt them with lines like, what are you scared of, the water? Which, yes. It seems they caught the attention of a girl we've never seen before. It's not that. Emma, you should be happy for her. Not everyone gets to see the world with their parents. I know, I know. But why'd she have to leave? Damn, first Byron, then Cleo's mom, and now Emma, and also probably Ash. Listen, I'm not saying we aren't gonna feel her absence. I am saying, if I had to pick one character to shove in the void forever, I'm gonna assume Charlotte has also gone missing under mysterious circumstances. You know, unless she became a water tentacle somehow. But hey, at least we got Cleo, Dad, and Lewis. This is all I need. Along with all of that, just by proxy and it being kicked out of the Neptunes, with Emma gone, it also means that Ash is gone. Oh no! A blonde hunk boy is taking his boat over to Mako Island, and Ricky does nothing to stop him. She's got Zane time to get in. What do you think? Uh, it's great. What is it? It's my new cafe. Starting tonight. Yours. I guess Ash and Emma got the local diner pool table slash cafe spot in the divorce. Ricky's gonna be crushed. This is a lot of status quo changes in a short amount of time. I'm sure the adoring audience will only respond positively to this. Zane not only offers the place to her, but it's even named Ricky's, which is such poor PR. Nobody here even knows Ricky and the ones who do know better than to enter her domain. I was gonna make a joke about Zane's hairline. And then I looked in a mirror. New hot boy is deep into his investigation of Mako Island, and we don't even know his name yet. Damn, was the pool always this blue? What is this, the rise of Skywalker? I promised I would stop talking about Star Wars outside of the designated Star Wars time. But if the show can reference it, so can I. It's about tonight, it's a full moon. Werewolf time. Oh, come on, you guys have got that sorted. Yeah, I mean, it didn't even bother them last time. I wonder how much time has passed since then. I mean, they said they have one year of school left and they were 16 earlier, maybe 17. Although I don't know him, I got really excited about the prospect of a boy mermaid. Years and years of me not being invited to play mermaids in the pool, finally. Vindication. Cleo's head is almost taken off by a stray water tentacle out of nowhere, and everyone immediately tells her she's crazy and seeing things. I'm secretly hoping that Charlotte is still around the corner somewhere with dormant hereditary mermaid powers and using it to torture Cleo. She's plotting her revenge, but I know in my heart, and in my brain rather, that that's probably not true. I'd say like half of the characters in the show we'll never see again. Emma may be gone, but Nate is still here. You guys know Nate. He's Zane's boyfriend. You will the fedora. I feel like
feel like five different shows are happening right now. Oh boy, how is Ricky gonna find a replacement performer? Dear God, help me, the island's trying to kill me. Evidently, Ricky finds Nate's replacement in the mystery girl we saw in the opening. Meet your new singer. There is no way I'm sharing my mic with anyone. You know we're three seasons deep into the show when we're introducing love interest for Nate. I promise I did not know this was going to happen. Now the new girl, Nate and Lewis, are performing together as a well-oiled band, like that of My Babysitter's a Vampire, or Stoked. I don't know what to call this genre of show, but it keeps happening and the pink opaque isn't gonna cut it. All we're missing is something spooky. That'll do. Cleo theorizes that the water tendrils might be related to the full moon when we very well saw it earlier in the day. I know I've been showing a lot more clips for this episode. It is the first of the season. I've already given up on monetizing this video. Something, something Patreon, something, something channel membership. I just need you to see this. There's something going on here, isn't there? Something magical. That's ridiculous. There is no such thing as magic. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my god. Cleo and New Girl chase down Ricky and the tentacle underwater. Oh yeah, this New Girl's a mermaid too. Ooh, what a thunk it. Her extra bonus power is that she can make water into goo? Like slime, like sludge, like gunk. Our new character to old character ratio is getting way too even. The new Neptunes rescue the buff. Oh man, I wanted a man-made. Are you sure you'll be all right getting back? My name's Will. Bella. You guys gotta remember these because I only have so much space in my brain. Apparently, Bella has been a mermaid since she was nine. She describes her transformation a lot like the Neptunes, except at a different location. A second Mako Island, if you will. A new status quo is firmly established for the third and final season of H2O. Bella is sired into the new Neptunes after the tragic loss of Ash and Emma in that biplane accident. The OG girls have their boyfriends and their boyfriend's friend guy. Nate is around, but Muscle Boy Will, like many before him, is hell-bent on finding out what happened when he got knocked out and why. Oh yeah, and also water is evil now or something. Don't tell me that Nate isn't important to the squad, okay? He's in a band. If you thought people hated Charlotte, oh boy. It's not that the dedicated audience hated Bella per se, it's more so that they hate change. They don't resent her for replacing Emma, but they do feel Emma's loss. I promise I'm not being contrarian just to make my stance on the show stand out from everyone else and also drum up conversation in the comments. That does sound good though. That being said, no, I'm actually really excited about this season. I mean, we have an overarching big bad technically tied to a mystery. What else could a growing boy want? Even if I wanted to watch this season as a kid, I think it may have been impossible. And now the whole show is on YouTube. Let's watch said show on YouTube. Actually, watch the YouTuber watch the show on YouTube instead of watching the show on YouTube. I can't wait to see how they follow up all the questions postulated in the season premiere. <laughs> Will is asking more questions and Ricky does not have any answers. Do you have anything to add to this, Bella? Like anything to say at all? She's decided to prove her worth by purposefully leading Will astray, leading him out to sea like a siren or a mermaid. Meanwhile, Lewis continues to downplay Cleo's fear of the water thing that attacked them. Come on, I know this Mako thing's gonna be spooked. Do you? Lewis, because I don't think you realize how much that water attacked us. And you guys beat it off. Whoa! I promise I'm not skipping scenes. It's just that a lot of this is establishing shots. I mean, this is more of Mako Island than we've ever seen. And we had a whole episode set here. Time for slime. Bella falls an inch into deep water, fully submerging herself in the process. It's impressive more than anything. You guys are lucky I care about lore because otherwise we're just watching two characters we just met. You don't trust me, do you? Bro. We don't know you. Will has even more questions now that Ricky is here, which is fair. He saw her twice before this, once was waking up outside the cave, and the time after was when he asked her about it and she talked to him like he was crazy. She's here to chaperone more than anything. Chaperone's my favorite lesbian artist. Lewis and Cleo do a little investigating of their own. That's not a euphemism, that's literally what they're doing. Cleo points out that the island has shifted and something is clearly wrong. Lewis proceeds to drink water leaking out of these new cracks. All that time with Charlotte, she was secretly melting his brain. This is also after saying volcanic islands move and shift all the time. This is the point where only now I realize, oh yeah, I guess Mako Island is a volcano and then 
Another realization crossed my mind. Oh, great. Now everyone's down here. All of our big players. I guess Emma can't be queen of the hole anymore. If the plan was to keep Will away from the moon pool, then they're doing a real shit job. Lewis and Ricky continue to double team gaslight gatekeep and girl boss Will. All while Cleo stands by watching what her boyfriend has been doing to her happen to some poor kid. Bella is equally as upset, but only because she thinks Will is cute. Equally valid reasons. This is like when Ricky told Zane she believed him when no one else did, except for two new people. People. So this is like a high school musical three situation, right? Where the new class of freshmen is sired by the now seniors on their way out. Is there any end to these rhetorical questions? The girls find out that the tentacle only moves when all three of them stand close by, except for that time it attacked Cleo at home and when it shot bolts at will. Clearly there's still a lot we don't know about this recent phenomenon. The only way to find out more is to dive even deeper. At least now Lewis can't deny it to Cleo's face. He still might. Cleo is doing her job. What show is this? She's trying to get promoted to person who needs to stand closer to the water more often. Yeah, that tracks. All while Nate and Lewis are stinking up Ricky's place again. Like there's no plan or intel here. They're just enjoying each other's company when no one is around. I'm happy for Lewis. Most of his friends so far have been really bad friends. I can't believe Ricky would intentionally ruin the beautiful band of Bella, Nate, and Lewis. They just wanted to spread joy. I won't lie to you. I was pretty convinced we actually might not see Will again, and I'm shocked he's even here. The question is, is he going to be an important part of this world-ending Battle of the Band story, or is he gonna... Oh, he's gonna make Cleo's new job harder. I don't think random citizens can just do this. Drop shirt and start riding the dolphins. It seems unsanitary, also unsafe. Speaking of unsafe, Cleo is dangerously close to the water and wet planks, again. What are you up to? Oh, you know, just rehearsing with Ronnie. Oh, hey, well done. Wow, you told him that already. You know, if Cleo wanted to, she probably could have just used her water powers to accomplish the same thing. What a wacky sitcom situation Cleo has gotten herself into. What a situational comedy based on a misunderstanding. Wanna get with me? You better line up, ladies. Line up, ladies. If you want a love letter from me. You better sign up, ladies. You better give me your address. You guys are gonna hate this, but I'm all in on Nate right now. I'm really pulling for him to come out the other side. Zane only reminds me more and more of him. It's funny that they want to keep putting Cleo Jr. in the same, like, kid outfits when the actress has visibly hit a growth spurt. Like, if the main girls are seniors in canon, she's gotta be, like... I just realized I'm bad at math. But if my math is correct, that makes Nate even more of a super senior going after Bella. <laughs> Lead guitarist in indie bands, am I right? I'm making sweeping generalizations for comedic purposes. Bella and Ricky make up. But what of the band? What of their plight? Isn't Cleo doing stuff too? What are you doing here? Came to see the show. What a foreboding note. Should we be afraid of this guy? I feel like he's mostly been a wet rag up to this point. Cleo refuses to get into the water, which the paranoid Will does not question, but he's all but dropped any investigation he had previously. He's got a casino wheel in his head of a different character trait every episode. Cleo gets over her insecurities and manages to sort the dolphins brilliantly. I don't think I explained what she was doing, actually. Her friends and family smile ear to ear while Nate watches intently. He's never been more locked in. Other than that time he... You know. When you add new characters to the cast, you have to try out all the different character combinations as you go along. This was supposed to be a Cleo and Will episode, but honestly, I feel like Nate has had more development with our remaining main girls and Bella. All the while, Will is worming his way into the group. Bella sings a song dedicated to her new older sister surrogate, Ricky. It's implied that she wrote this ahead of time and performed it on the spot, but the other bandmates already know the lyrics and chord progression somehow. What do we even call this band? I have a suggestion. Oh boy, I can't wait for my new favorite main character, Nate, slowly redeem himself over his past transgressions and slowly be brought in and accepted by the Neptunes. A man can dream. I mean, considering Ash died in that plane crash. Okay, so February, right? We're in February now. I don't think you understand. This is the first time in two to three seasons when we can actually place what month it takes place in. What I wanna know is what year. Cleo and Bella are excited about Valentine's Day, but Ricky is way too cool for that. She mocks Cleo for going fishing with her boyfriend who loves fishing because she hates Joy and Whimsy and also Lewis all of a sudden. Do you guys remember when I referred to challengers earlier? What's going on? It's none of your business. Leave me alone. Come on, Cleo, let's just, let's go, okay? Hey, check this out. That's nothing. Check this. Okay. 
Now that is just too cool. Uh, Kim, can I talk to you for a minute? Later, I'm busy. She's on a mission, Cleo. I really tried to go the entire series without you learning her real name, but yes, I've been lying to you. Cleo's little sister's name is Kim. It seems the people working on the show have noticed the same thing I did last time, as Kim is now about the age Cleo was when the show started. Oh, Dad, I think it's time you had to talk. The talk? What talk? The talk. Well, that talk? Oh, I don't think so. Kim's not ready. Well, yesterday she was finger painting and riding on ponies. What do you guys think the talk is? Now, Kim, you can't be making boys fight for your amusement. Only if it is really, really entertaining. What do you know, Dad? This is why Mom left you. I forgot what show I was watching again. Since it's Valentine's Day, the single girl, Bella, is on the hunt, and for some reason, she sets her sights on the wet rag, considering her only other options are either missing or seniors. It's horrible. She already knew everything. You know, they have a class at school for that. This show's hilarious. Fine. I only said it to keep Dad happy. Kim, if Dad catches you with any of those boys, well, maybe I should be living with Mum then. Did I write this script? The girls convene as we finally get an explanation as to why Bella likes Will. Get this, she says, because. Solid point. What's my character's motivation in this scene? Oh, we don't know? Okay. I mean, they show him gallivanting on the beach in slow motion. I could put two and two together. Cleo's dad is in a panic as it seems every boy in town is obsessed with Kim, which makes sense. I mean, she's got good leadership skills and business acumen. I was talking about her starting a gang. What did you think I was talking about? I fear for the well-being of this town. Hey, I already bought you a smoothie. So you did. Kim? What is going on? Dude, why would you buy her a smoothie? I already got her one. Dude, it's empty. When did this show get really funny? The daughters Cleo have once again cost their dad a business opportunity. No wonder she wants to move away. Let's check back with Bella, shall we? Oh, oh, uh, never mind. That was it. Kim opens up to her older sister. Cleo gets a boyfriend and friends. She's got no friends, no real boyfriend, and no mom. Most importantly, no mom. But in the end, everyone's got a date. Oh, except for Bella, I guess. Lewis brings a rose and suit to Cleo. Ricky and Zane try something romantic. Kim is out on the hunt, and even Cleo dad gets some action. This all just raises one question. Where is Nate? Nate wasn't in that at all. Please tell me Nate gets a happy ending. The full moon is upon us. Nobody cares. I wouldn't either, to be honest. Aside from that water tentacle last month, we've had it pretty much under control. Speaking of which, the creature drags Cleo to the bottom of the ocean, never to be seen again. But don't worry, it was all a dream. A water tentacle did this to me. What? It's not a full moon. Okay, it was a dream. Okay, so we're still probably in February? The next full moon's really close. Or... Um, I don't know why I insist on placing all these episodes on a timeline. They're never gonna fit. Meanwhile, Zane is having more fun with Nate than Ricky. The boys are truly back in town as they're planning a dirt bike race. He even offers it to Will, who initially refuses until Bella talks him into it for some reason. We know her motivations are inconsistent, and Will is just malleable to whatever the episode needs him. This show is about a lot of different things. Lewis does research on the rocks that moved in the moon pool cave of Mako Island, all while Ricky and Zane are in crippling debt. Zane promises he can make the money back, but only if he wins the race. It makes sense he's bad with money, considering he grew up with it. If that's the plan, then why would he want Will in the race so bad? Let me give you a tip. Your average motocross bike isn't a scooter. Same. I'm just saying be tricky, so if you need some advice... That's cool. Done a bit when I was young. Oh, yeah, mini bikes are totally different, man. <laughs> no, it was a trail bike. My family was sailing through the Pacific. We stopped off at Santiago, went biking through the Andes for six months. Oh, we are fucked. Zane falls back into his old ways and conspires with Nate. They truly are back in town. Lord, forgive me. I have to go back to the old me. Why is Cleo dressed like Dora the Explorer? I know there's lore happening over on Mako Island or something, but we're five episodes in and I feel like Bella, Nate, and the band have had far more screen time and development than anybody else. Well, what else would we be talking about? You tell me. Have I just stepped into a parallel dimension here? I know, right? That's what I'm saying. Cleo invites Will over for dinner, which he thinks is just normal. Lewis does not. But Cleo isn't here for him, at least not the way you think. I'm not sure about Kim. She's been a little crazy lately. They use him to gather intel. He regales us with a scene we saw 
four episodes ago. And now we're all caught up. We all know nothing equally. Good work, Will. You add a whole lot to this show. The scene is really strange ADR. Like, almost none of this dialogue was usable. It's the day of the big race, and Zane and Nate are doing wacky racist stuff with earpieces and microphones. Well, there's seven here, and we know at least three of them. Listen, I don't subscribe to the gender binary or who can like what, but this show started as a generic, focus-tested tween girl's dream, and now we're watching motorbike race with rock music in the background. What I'm saying is I'm personally bored and I want more mermaids. There we go. Man, just like Portal 2. Will ends up winning the race with Bella's help from Ricky's encouragement. Zane claims he can't afford to pay the winner, to which Ricky takes money from their fund. He may be doing cartoon schemes, but He's absolutely right. Also, Will is incredibly pissed about this, as if he cared about the race at all. He makes a big stink. This is the most we've seen him care about anything, and he probably will never care about it again. Back home, back in the lab again, Lewis and Cleo capture some of the living water in a test tube and watch it float around in the air. Or, sorry, observe it floating around in the air. We've cracked the code. It's water. I think. This place makes its money back as Ricky pivots to marketing towards the bike boys and even auctions some of Zane's beloved bikes. All is right in the world. Oh, young love. Show time. You okay? I'm fine. I'm fine. But we're still keeping the band? I thought this was a rebrand. I thought we were cutting funds. Nate swinging his neck brace around is the highlight of this performance. In a way, we're going back to basics while also implementing new mechanics. By that, of course, I mean the new band plays every episode and we brought back the CG water. I know they were really proud of that effect. I'm gonna make this comparison a lot and I already referenced the show earlier, actually multiple times, more so than I normally do, uh, aside from episodes related to it. I'm getting off track here. Season three of H2O is a lot like the later seasons of Community where they rope in Chang and the Dean because they're hemorrhaging characters. Why has Nate had more screen time than our new boy guy? I normally don't point this out, but this episode was written by Simon Butters. Did I not tell you this CG bubble would be the most important character in the show eventually? Lewis decides to run tests at school and almost gets accosted by another adult scientist woman. Brother, you must run. We're talking about renewable energy, transport, batteries. Lewis! That's magic water from Mako Island. Yeah, it came from Mako Island. We are no closer to answers and it seems we've backtracked to the version of the show where Ricky hates Lewis for some reason. That's my least favorite version. Now that I think about it, I don't think there's ever been a version where Ricky doesn't hate Lewis. We're really speed running Will's way into the Neptunes, huh? Cleo is way too supportive of her judgment. I get that she trusts Bella, but you do not know this guy. You barely knew Ash. <laughs> Working we do not know him, see? Bella attempts to spy on Will, which is only fair. I mean, he's been researching them, or he was until he forgot his motivation. Ricky asks Cleo to destroy the living water as she's afraid it might fall into the wrong hands. Guess what happens immediately after? Huh, let's see the action, shall we? No, 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 stop, stop, no, no, Miss Teller, don't touch. How did you do it? Of course, the science teacher tries to explain this magic, but her reasoning is that Lewis changed the molecular structure, which I would argue is even more unbelievable. I'm not gonna take any criticism of Lewis here. This was another terrible Cleo plan. I actually don't think I could say that since it seemed to work. Can't really argue with results. Is the plan stupid if you get the desired outcome? Cleo takes the weight off and reveals that she was actually moving the normal water with her powers to make it look magic, which is... Not better. I guess I prefer Clue as being dumb together while happy than separate and miserable with a maniac. Speaking of fiends with red hair, man, the show has a type. I know what you two have been doing, Will. I saw you and I'm disappointed. I can't believe you lied to me to be with someone else. I thought maybe there could have been something between us. But... Bella. No, don't try and squirm out of it. I thought you were different. You did? Yes, but it just turns out that you're like all the other guys. Selfish, lying, immature, two-timing. And he's my brother. And. What? Oh, what a wacky misunderstanding. Let's never talk about this again. Nate wasn't even in that one. 
Cleo Dad and businesswoman we saw in a previous episode are allegedly getting really serious. Cleo Dad is inviting her to family events like the Cleo family picnic. What are the odds a female character we initially saw in a tertiary role would come back and uh, be a much more important part of the plot, he says, knowing full well. Will's sister, though they thought was his girlfriend, has the hots for Zane, who is still gallivanting around on his dirt bike regardless of his previous public shaming. Does Nate work here? They're even playing motocross video games. Will's sister jumps the line at Ricky's. Again, that is what the cafe is called now. And throws away all the other applications. I'm no job expert. As you can tell by the visible unemployment all over my body, Zane gives the job anyway because she showed initiative? Question mark? How's the family time going? Yeah, if something's bothering you. Um, you know what? You're right. The, um, the, the water looks great. Clear! Cleo? Just as I suspected. Ricky wanted to give the job opening to Bella, who almost assuredly would have been worse at it. Every Zane and Ricky subplot has been some kind of strange competition, and every Lewis plotline is him fighting unknowable horrors. Man, Bella's even losing Nate to Willette now, and she didn't even like that guy. Kim is the only one here having a good time. Didn't Cleo have a boyfriend or something? What if Dad really cares about Sam? Does that bother you at all? Earth to dum dum. There is no way she's going to stick around. She's young and got all this future ahead of her. What's dad got to offer? Plenty. He's old and he's got baggage. <laughs> she's slowly becoming the best character on the show. She's running circles around her contemporaries. Okay, damn, Sophie. The sister's name is Sophie. Thank God I don't have to come up with quirky nicknames every time now. But there will be more opportunities later. Why does Bella even want this job? Does she not already have a gig at the same cafe or is this a hot dog and a handshake sort of deal? Cleo dad has fumbled another baddie. That's a world record for this show. I should stop writing these as I'm watching these episodes because the exact next scene. Guys, I've got some big news. Sam and I are engaged. Whoa, okay. If I was a career fumbler, I would lock that shit down as soon as I could too. Yeah, if I was a, f okay. At first I thought the sister thing was just a one-off misunderstanding, but Will and Sophie have like weird tension. Like it's making me uncomfortable. Bella is just as concerned as I am, but the episode is ending. Not much we could do about that now. Guess we'll have to wait and see how all of our plots pan out. Hey, did the dad said he was getting engaged? This is a horrifying episode title to drop randomly in season three. The show's gonna get canceled anyway. All bets are off. What are you doing? Isn't she lovely? Isn't she wonderful? Full moon! Uh, it's happening again. That was like the longest month ever. I got so used to these happening like clockwork. Bella's asking the real questions. Where is Lewis? I guess all last episode, he was on Mako Island, setting up several hidden cameras within the moon cave to analyze its data later. I mean, Max Hamilton is MIA and Will does not care anymore. So really it's all down to Lewis to do this job. Unless Will has a miraculous resurgence of interest in the island. Oh, I see. I'm being facetious. Why don't we go out tonight? Just you and me. Somewhere quiet. We could uh, grab some pizza, watch the sunset at the beach. That sounds beautiful. Except you're just forgetting one small thing. Mm -hmm. Full moon? I thought you guys were over all that. I feel like they're slowly trying to make us upset with Zane, but he keeps being right. They have had this lockdown for months now. Some would say a year. Will is sketching a picture of Black Mass. A curtain? I'm glad they give us flashbacks to the season premiere every third episode. It really helps to jog my memory. In case I forgot from 10 minutes ago. Every time I see these two alone for a scene, I feel a sense of horrific dread. Shots of water. It's thinking. Somebody always rolls up to their house right before the moon rises. Maybe I'm too Gen Z, but if I heard a knock at my door and I was not expecting someone, I would not open my fucking door. That's none of my business. Go to the next house. It also makes me immune to joining any new religion on accident. Again. Sorry, I'm trying to deliver my funny joke, but you are clawing at my feet. What do you want? You want to say something? I'm 
take that as a no. Of course, Bella goes with Will to Mako Island. Why wouldn't she? The water tentacle has escaped and Lewis's Five Nights at Freddy's setup did nothing. And it even got Bella. Luckily, the Neptunes have already given up on the full moon and walk outside to convene with Will, confused with Bella's disappearance. We are eight episodes into this 26 episode season and our new big bad has kidnapped our newest Oh, that's why the episode's called that. She's becoming water or something. The OG girls arrive just in time using their water powers to hold Bella together. All of her organs, her blood, her bones, her flesh, all in the form of water, all being held in the hands of two mermaids. They try their best to keep her together, but the tentacle begins attacking them as well. As a last ditch effort, they drag Bella out of the path of the moon and credit where it's due, these girls are acting their asses off. As much as you can for a teen mermaid sitcom. What happened to Bella was life threatening, but when she awakes, she says she wants to go back in. She enjoyed it. It felt good. We've reached an allegory that is a part of every young woman's adventure in growing up. Getting into hard drugs. I get it, I'm hip. That's my torch. So, it's embedded in solid rock. That means this wall turns into a waterfall just as I thought. No, well maybe when you dropped it, it just it sort of fell into that little hole. And it's still running? A, a month after I left it here? What are the chances of that? Batteries can last a long time. No. This place is alive. Not to get semantical, but it's a volcano, right? Of course it's alive. Time to watch back the tape that Lewis recorded over the full moon and static widescreen static. While the Neptunes have come back empty-handed, Will decides to share his findings with them instead of his sister, who he calls Sis. Number one, that word is now banned on Twitter, so I can't use this clip, sorry. Number two, just as I suspected, these characters were definitely written by someone who's never had siblings. Which is weird because Cleo and Kim have seemed pretty realistic as far as I can tell. But what do I know? I have five sisters and no brothers. And no kids. God, where are my kids? The kidnapping episode ends with Will screaming that he's not crazy and vows to prove what happened to him on that fateful night. Same year as the Magna Carta, as if I could forget. That's cool. Bella almost ceased to exist. Are we gonna talk about that? Or is Bella gonna become a water junkie now? Bold new direction for your mermaid show about puberty, but we already compared it to Buffy, so we might as well follow that path. <laughs> Cleo and Lewis return the water to the moon pool after the horrifying event that just transpired, but Cleo sneaks some back with her because she thinks it's cool. Your friend dissolved. They have actual kangaroos just hanging around like deer. This country rocks. While Lewis is off having a fish adventure with Cleo dad, Coraline decides to run some tests with and on the girls. It almost kills Cleo's fish. And then their mad experiments are interrupted by Will again. Cleo, you gotta stop opening this door. While that does seem important, we get a boys golf montage set to what sounds like Wii sports music. What a deep cut. I love these dudes. I should reiterate that this actually has nothing to do with the episode at all. It really just is for golf. Juxtaposed to water shenanigans interrupted by Will, who just walks upstairs uninvited. This can't be a generational thing, right? This is strange behavior. Well, the fish gets lost in the drain system anyway. Bella, you're barely even trying. What is this fit? This isn't protecting anything. Back to golfing! Now back to the actual show. It was fun while it lasted. Cleo and Ricky slapstick and Pratt fall, followed up by another golfing montage. Let's go! Now this is what I'm here to see. This is why I made this video. But let's check back with the girls anyway. Hey don't panic. We'll save him. I can't feel him anymore. Wow. This is like X-Men. Bella finds the goldfish floating around the backyard in its living CG bubble until the wind picks up and floats her pet fish into the sun. Nah, I lie. To me, my Neptunes. All is well as Cleo dad wins the golf game to stroke his ego and the girls catch Cleo's fish in weird goo. I mean, I guess Will is upset with Bella, but is there ever really a reason why? Unfortunately, Lewis does not wish to play golf with his girlfriend's sad divorced loser dad again, which makes me sad. I didn't really elaborate on this golf subplot. It wasn't from lack of interest, don't get me wrong, it was more for like comedic effect. It's a lot funnier when it seems way more unrelated. That being said, I didn't need to stretch much. Sure, Cleo Dad gets a little arc, but why? So far, these episode concepts and even titles have been pretty extreme. They've been intense, but have amounted to nothing, or what seems like nothing. I mean, we're a third way through the season. What could they do? I still have questions about the living water or if it's even sentient or if it shifted the water on Mako Island. It doesn't work when I'm doing it when you could see me doing it. If it shifts the stone or the magnetic pool or what it has to do with the moon or what it has to do. <laughs> 
Well, fuck. The episode begins with our three mermaids deep in the blue sea mermaiding out, so to speak. There are cathedrals everywhere. What could ruin this? All right. Bella's gonna die. This is way too happy and elaborate of an opening for this show. We saw her die once. Oh, you know, something with Will, maybe. But forget that guy. Nate is back on the menu, boys. Bella gives her special shell from the bottom of the ocean to her favorite walking brick wall, Will, who immediately takes it back to his weird sibling Team Rocket investigation hut that he lives in? Question mark. Will is fed up with having no answers and also no memory of the previous episodes. Bella blows up at him and leaves his weird maybe house, which is good timing. I wouldn't want to see Sophie, his sister, sounding really jealous. I promise I'm not playing this up for a bit. It, like, in the show, it's, it is weird, right? All is rectified between these two in a montage, the way all drama should be dealt with. Will takes a dip in the ocean, then immediately goes in for a kiss on her, which obviously gets her face wet. I know the rules here are a little inconsistent, and they could still eat, but, like, aren't all kisses wet? At least, like, the good ones? I should not be talking about this. Also, who am I asking? Surely you guys don't know. I mean, I don't know either. I know a pot calling the kettle black when I see one. Always two dumbasses telling each other, exactly. You know you're enabling me? What's happening in this show? Ricky comes across the weird hut, and like everyone in this universe, barges in uninvited. It's there where she finds Will's research on the shell Bella gave him. I also look up how expensive gifts are or how to return them the second I get them. Sophie almost catches Ricky snooping, but instead only finds the shell she burnt to a crisp. Ricky gives Bella an ultimatum, and by ultimatum, I mean she makes Bella cut it off with Will and doesn't really give another option. Of course, Bella is conflicted because she likes this boy, and all the boys the Neptunes have liked so far have been roped into the group. They're lucky they never mention Emma anymore because if I was Bella and I learned about Ash, I'd be pissed. But in the end... Or, or middle? Will sees Bella as her mermaid form after purposefully pouring water on her. Honestly, I wouldn't trust him at all after this. This is methodical. Let's get some lore. We were living in Ireland at the time. My parents were busy, so I went exploring. And there was this place. I walked down by the ocean. At the bottom of the cliffs, there was a cave. I felt so peaceful there, like... Like I belonged. Something magical happened. So what we learned here is it actually has more to do with the moon than the actual pool. Like it being on Mako Island is kind of irrelevant. Meow. 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 You guys have made filming videos and logistical nightmare. And this is another spot in Australia, so just imagine how many moon pools there are all over the globe. They exist in our world too. Go out and find them now, children of the earth. I'm upset, man. I shouldn't have to give disclaimers for really hilarious bits. It makes sense since the full moon has impacted them even within their homes, but then why does the cave keep shifting? I must do more research. Really missing my corkboard right about now. Bella lies to Will, only revealing that she's a mermaid while protecting the others. To return the favor, the Neptunes say they will deal with this later, and what they mean by deal with this, only time will tell. Dramatic rumbling and whispers while Bella sings her emotions out, and Will has decided to not tell Sophie about Bella. Imagine watching this episode by accident in the middle of season one. Who are you people? All is well, but the question still remains. Is Will... A part of the team now? Does Will even know where he stands? Does Will actually know anything about himself at all? He likes motocross, I think. And even that is kind of inconsistent. Either this episode is going to be about the girls wanting to be normal again, or we're about to learn a whole lot about the internal workings of Nate. Fingers crossed. Big things are happening around town. Sophie has gotten Will a corporate sponsor for his competitive swimming that he apparently does, but Bella thinks she's pushing her brother too hard. Sophie goes into work asking for time off, all while Ricky and Zane are attempting to expand into catering events. All the pieces are moving, all the girls are fighting. I love that both of their dads have just entirely bailed, that Zane and Ricky are forced to become adults early on, and they're thriving. I could keep my ironic demeanor, but if you watch anything for long enough, you'll become attached to these characters too. Except for Will. 
I feel like he's a different guy every episode. I care more about Nate. That being said, Zane leaves Ricky at the cafe while she has to cater a child's birthday party. Where's Cleo dad in the time of need? I know he would rock these kids' world. At least Cleo is here. Does she not already have a job? Will blows it with the talent scout because of his dumb mermaid girlfriend friend. <laughs> Man, all of a sudden, for some reason, I really want chips and nuggets. Introducing the amazing, the fantabulous, Rico the Clown. So Bella and Will have inherited the H2O show and the classic characters are trapped in some kind of situational comedy hell. Remember in an earlier video where I said filler was necessary? This wasn't what I was talking about. And now she's just blatantly using her powers in front of children again. I wish my job was dancing around with effects that are clearly not there. Sounds like fun. One more trick. Sorry guys, we're gonna hold trick down. Juggle this. Hey, hey lizard, lizard squad, squad hack, hack this. this. Nerf this. Apparently the kids party did not go well. Well, this story is all wrapped up. Anything interesting happening on the other side? Bella is jealous of Will's sister again? Okay. There's actually something interesting going on with these characters, finally. While Bella is genuinely interested in Will as a person, he seems to only be obsessed with her mermaid side. Constantly asking invasive questions, wanting to see her go full mermaid mode on the regular, and using the fact that he knows their secret as some kind of currency. Like she has to trust him now. What's the name of that one Overwatch character? Uh, Chaser? Bella notices this pretty early on and tells Will to stay away from her, which she relays to the other Neptunes in a genuinely touching moment. It's actually sad. Hey, you got your allegory for puberty. The girls help Bella feel better and now Zane is a clown. All is well in the world, it's like nothing has changed. At no point at the beginning of the season did I think I would be genuinely interested in a Bella plot, yet here we are. And we didn't even need Nate this time. We didn't see Lewis there at all. God, I hope the band is okay, they can't survive without him. Also, wait a minute. Bella has been a mermaid her whole life, like since she was a little kid, and this guy is the first guy to find out her secret? She's way better at keeping the secret than our protagonists. <laughs> I'm not even gonna make assumptions about this title, it's simply too insane. Cleo's water powers are getting really, really powerful. She can warp the water into complicated, specific shapes. She made a glass statue that she plans to gift to Ricky, when we know famously, she hates those. She turned one down and broke a bunch of others. No, why? Come on, Zane, you know what today is. Full moon? Summer solstice? Gang warfare? A man in a rush asks for an order from Hulu's The Bear, and when he asks for delivery, Sophie tells him they don't deliver, but she changes her tune when he hands her $20, which is, all things considered, very little money. I spend more on food delivery like every day, nearly. I gotta get out more. While planning for Ricky's surprise birthday party, Bella gives Will the cold shoulder, but at least his sister is there to comfort him very normally. She puts him in charge of delivery, which leads him to a shady character who pays him in fake comedy dollars. And I'm not just talking about Australian currency. <laughs> so Ricky, always the risk taker, goes to retrieve the real money. It goes about as well as you would expect. I don't mean to victim blame, but this is the second crime syndicate that has kidnapped Ricky. If that happened to me multiple times, I would start to look inward. Oh no, we rented the cafe to kids on accident. I've got to win this joke race. I hope they like my band. Ricky gets held captive by a group of counterfeiters. And this is even aside from the living tentacle that turns people into water. Classic kidnapping faux pas. They forgot to take her phone away. No, it's from Ricky. It just says help. What does that mean? I don't know. She needs us? <laughs> It couldn't be a joke, could it? Maybe she found out about the party and she's trying to pay us back. Call her. <sighs> Cleo. You have killed Ricky. This act of the show is shot more like a Law and Order episode and it's legitimately beginning to become unsettling. Unfortunately, these magical girls with supernatural powers cannot save her alone and instead need a big strong man who can't move water with his mind. You have to tell us everything you know. On one condition. You tell me everything you know about mermaids. This could either take several days or mere seconds. I know a lot of things in the show don't make sense. But they call the police so they clearly want to put these guys away, but then Will tosses all the fake money in the ocean and burns the rest of the evidence, meaning the boat. 
Hey, remember that time Zane exploded? I already suspected you couldn't trust this guy, but now I'm starting to believe him and his weird family are in on this scheme. I mean, Sophie attempted to steal the glass mermaid statue they made. We're still doing the birthday party after this? I would think the cops would have some more questions for you. What's he doing here? He saved Ricky's life when you couldn't be contacted. What? You've, you've been in trouble. Long story, but we can trust him. And he knows everything. Well, welcome to the Neptunes, new Ash. I know Nate is off somewhere crying. The episode ends with Will looking at the gang menacingly, but the upbeat music tries to make you believe he isn't up to another scheme. Kind of a double standard that everyone seems to be cool with the new class, but they all wanted Charlotte to die horrifically. Also, Sophie is there, in the show, not on the island with them. Double bad news for Cleo. Lewis got a mysterious letter from who his invasive teacher calls the states. That's our states! But he can't relay the information because Cleo dad dumps bad news on her first. He's getting married tomorrow. To this lady. Remember her? from H2O Just Had Water, the show. Lewis talks to Ricky about his scholarship. That would require him to fly out almost immediately. Ricky, ever the good friend, tells Lewis to just not tell Cleo and leave in the night. I guess, just like her mom, as if things couldn't get more muddled. I've been thinking it over and none of the guys down at the wharf seem like the right choice to be best man. How do you feel about it? Do you not like have adult friends? Also, don't you kind of hate this guy? I guess golfing really can cure all. And now Bella's in on Ricky's terrible plan. Lewis smartly goes against this strange advice and talks to his girlfriend who makes a sad face. She seems more mad about the fact that he didn't tell her first, which just for posterity, I'd like to blame Ricky for as well. I mean, it basically is her fault. Cleo is having a rough go of it, so she tried to distract herself with the wedding that's happening right now today. She even dons the cursed amulet or lock it. I think it's a lock it. You know, this would be a really impactful mid-season finale if we knew anything about the bride-to-be. I know she's blonde and that she's a woman and she likes Cleo dad. Lewis loses the rings and then makes Cleo cry, but then, but then. I'm not going. Cleo, I'm not. I, I called the Institute and I told them that I can't just change my life like that. This is also shocking news to me. I was almost certain and still am that we are about to lose another crucial cast member halfway through the final season. I mean, the writing's on the wall by this point. The wheels are falling off. It's revealed that not only did Kim purposefully hide the rings to sabotage the wedding, but also sprinklers. They sort of make it seem like this ruined the marriage. Like they can't still just get married? Cleo's got an idea. Uh-oh. Finally, we learn what Will is for. He's the muscle. He's here to threaten Kim. So she, in turn, apologizes to her new lame mom. The wedding is back on, and you'll never guess where it's held. Mako Island! The scene begins with a song playing that I thought was just for the background, but then it pans over to Bella, who's the only one singing, even though there's clearly multiple voices on the track. Also, very clearly digitally altered. So is this diegetic? Was the actress just mouth words that look like lyrics? Where is the sound system? Also, why would you take your parents' new parent to this island? There are so many other locations you could have taken them, like the cafe, the cafe. What a nice mid-season Mark episode. I mean, truly, all the stars are here. This is basically all our major players, sans Sophie and Nate. I hope the next episode is this exact day, just from their perspectives. I could come visit. To America. Hey, I'm a mermaid. I can swim. It's no big deal. The Pacific Ocean is quite a big deal. Uh, I'll make a stopover in Hawaii. This doesn't have to be oh, the end. Cleo, long distance relationships never work. Oh no, she's doing the sad face again. Cleo lets Lewis go. This is the opportunity of a lifetime. I mean, even Cleo dad said so. He can't say no to this opportunity. He can't stay behind just for Cleo. So she compels him to go and they kiss potentially one last time. Sure, that's sad, but it's not like he's leaving right now. I mean, we'll see him in the next episode, right? Right? Lewis leaves this episode and the show on a boat off Mako Island. I know they said he's going on a plane, but this shot really implies that he's about to dinghy to America from Australia. Now, you may have noticed I reference community a lot in these videos. I brought it up a lot in this video. This would have been the perfect opportunity. This exact thing happened in community. I keep comparing it to Buffy, but honestly, the trajectory of these seasons, I know I do bits with Nate and it was pulling for Zane, but from the jump, from episode one, Lewis has been my favorite character and the show has suffered a great loss without him. Only 13 episodes left. Let's see if they can limp past the finish line.
Mermaid magic? Yeah, that's what the show is. The Neptunes, what's left of them, dive in the deep blue sea. But Zane is feeling a little threatened by how good of a diver Will is. It's something. It's consistent. This might as well act as a new season. Now that Lewis is gone and nobody mentions his name anymore, he joined Emma in Super Hell. Their biplane crashed into his boat. The girls gotta do some research of their own. We've been stagnant for far too long. What's the deal with this rock? How did the living water do this to Lewis's FNAF security camera? The B-plot is Zane buying Will as a diving sponsor, but it's clearly just a power play. The boys are fighting. Lewis really was the backbone holding this ship together. And now that he's gone without him, Zane falls back into his worse influences. Night. You and your mate still got your scuba gear? Yeah. Do you want to go diving? Nah. Fish boy over there needs to be taught a lesson. Yeah, let's go. Another Zane and Nate scheme. Welcome back to the show, brother. Bella tries to melt the rock or something. I don't know. It starts glowing. I'm honestly far more interested in Zane's newest murder attempt. Crazy that Sophie is the voice of reason on this boat. Zane almost dies or something, but just for a moment. And I haven't really done this yet, but I like to point out how Marvel this is for a teen show like this. They shot, performed, filmed underwater. Of course, it couldn't have actually been in the ocean, but considering we've made jokes about how cheap the show is, this is legitimately impressive impressive. Inversely, look at this epic CG bubble. It's like it's coming right at me. Ah, blue. Of course. Gems? Myths? You won't find anything. How do you know? It's the same crystal as mine. Where did you get yours from? It was at the bottom of the sea pool where I became a mermaid. I've worn it ever since. When were you gonna mention this? Why after they went to gems.com? Unfortunately, our crystal gem meeting is interrupted by Zane calling the girls for help. You see, he cheated, using Nate to convince the Sibs that he dove down 40 meters. So Will got competitive and tried to beat his score, basically drowning himself. I'm gonna be honest, sounds like it's not Zane's fault. Again, where did Nate go? Was he not just under there? Under where? Ricky saves the Will by breathing air into his lungs. I didn't know you could do that. Of course you can't get in there before Sophie does. Make room! I know that smile. Is he about to fall in love with Ricky? Does really all it take is saving someone's life? Like iCarly? Or head of the class? But don't worry, he obviously can't get with Ricky. She's with Zane. Well, where are you going? To see Will alone. <sighs> Ricky, okay. I know I messed up. But we're okay, aren't we? Right now, I'm more interested in seeing if Will's okay. Oh. Uh-oh. Only 12 episodes left. You gotta stir the pot, I guess. This show has broken my heart so many times already. A lot of the times over the last, like, handful of episodes, there's no way. Right? <laughs> We finally learned something about the new Cleo mom. She's a colonizer, filling the house with idols, statues, and masks from other countries that she says she bought legally, but I'm not so convinced. Sophie steals Bella's fundraiser idea and pitches it to the team of Ricky and Zane, while being visibly upset when they consider having the band play. On one hand, Sophie is being weird and jealous about the band again. On the other hand, can they even function without Lewis? They've lost their drummer. The music they decide to play for this dinner scene to show the new mom's affinity for other cultures is... Oh, what is that smell? It's a recipe I picked up from a tribe of goat herders in East Africa. At the worst stock music they found, this family is holding on by a fucking thread. Bella is upset with Sophie for partnering with the Marine Park Dolphin Foundation. Oh man, what's the point of helping dolphins if I don't get the fame and glory? I hate dolphins. This love triangle is as boring as it is uncomfortable. Let's cut back to more Kim shenanigans. Something tells me this water trap she's setting isn't gonna hit her desired target. <laughs> That shit's gotta be a nightmare on your tailbone. By this point in the show, their masters have taken bumps. We gotta get these girls in a ring. Gotta admit, she's a go-getter. Yeah, she is. Just gotta be careful what it is she's going after. Yeah, like your love interest. Her own brother. Meanwhile, the Cleo household is a waking nightmare. 
I actually had a nightmare like this once. Who is this dude? You're supposed to be Lewis's replacement? Ah, also, yeah, Nate time. Has this band always had like five members? Has it ever needed more than three? Although the band is pushed out of the event, Nate is transfixed on how hot he finds Sophie. This dude can only worry about one thing at once. Meanwhile, I have mastered the art of being worried about everything all the time. Ricky smells something fishy and makes her best thinking face, but that's not nearly as important. Honey, do you use the bathroom before you go? Yep. <laughs> then you'll have to wait your turn. As long as we're operating with one bathroom, we'll be following this roster. A roster. Maybe Lewis was smart to get out of the show as soon as he did. Not nearly as soon as Emma did. Back to the real show, Sophie is doing a terrible job at running this concert. She's been trying to charge bands to play and charge Dolphin Rescue Foundation to be involved, which is insane, even for her. Like, it's not even an evil scheme. It's just dumb and obviously didn't work. So they fire her and bring the band back together. All right, ready to go? You look great. Thanks. You all look great. Which could mean nothing. I love that no matter how annoying they may find him and how quickly they replace Lewis, they never once tried to remove Nate from the band. He's the heart, he's the sensitive one. Was this meant to be a vehicle for this actress? I feel like this show doesn't facilitate her singing abilities very well. Like they don't, oh. The episode's over. Lewis's absence is clearly felt. Oh no, if only we had another side character that was initially introduced in season one that we could push into a main role that's been on the sidelines and also in all these episodes. Come on, there's only nine episodes left. Just give him a chance. Mako Island. The full moon is coming yet again, but this time, Lewis isn't here. I'm gonna be honest with you guys. I have been writing this video for months and have been exclusively watching this show. You may have noticed that the time between episodes, like the recap, has really shortened. I'm I'm trying to barrel through these. I'm just checked out. I'm waiting for another shot of adrenaline to get me over the finish line, but I really am feeling Lewis's absence. I, I just don't. Losing Lewis has really knocked the wind out of me. Also, I'm two, three, four, five, six, eight hours into recording today. And you could see it on my face. I'm grasping at straws and I always self-editorialize my writing to an annoying degree, but I feel like I'm not adding a whole lot here. I'm in an endless cycle of screaming, repeating jokes and skipping over scenes that I find boring. There's really just nothing here to keep me going as an H2O fan, aside from the lore, the mystery, the intrigue. Dude, what time does that card game start tonight? Uh, it's been canceled. Private party. Oh, I was looking forward to that. Also, Nate. I like Nate. I get that normally I'd be a fan of Zayn as well, but he's intertwined in a rivalry with wet bread now. They even play like Western music. It's like a cell service ad. The Neptunes initially planned to all meet at a specified location and stay the night for the moon. Cleo's dad allows Cleo because he trusts her and nobody else has parents that care about them. I don't think we've even seen the parents of the new kids. This was meant to be at Ricky's, which Ricky leaves after having, as Will calls, a big fight with her idiot boyfriend. Zane has been a real dickhead recently, probably just lashing out now that his bestest boy is gone. And I had a sinking feeling, knowing where this is going to go, when Will confronts Ricky, but luckily she runs away from him too. He frantically calls Cleo, since Ricky is now loose on the precipice of a full moon. But she's got her plate full with Kim, who got dressed up and snuck out like the baby genius she is. Now this is an episode of H2O. Tension, drama, one of my favorite characters becoming awful all of a sudden, eight episodes left. The moon rises. Ricky, completely without the influence of the moon, she decides to do this before, intends to take on the water tentacle all by herself. But first, now this is a party. Alright, this is over. I'm shutting the cafe down. Oh, but you can't do that. I can do what I want. It's my place. Dude, can I just play one more song? I, I don't want to let my fans down. I'll get over it. Zane has decided that Ricky's life is important, actually, but in doing so, breaks my heart. Aw, oh, Cleo, Dad, you just missed the concert. What's going on? It's Ricky. No, it's not. It's your dad. It's, it's, uh, Ricky. I don't care how old that joke is by the time this goes up. I am so tired. Cleo dad questions why this sleepover looks so much like a party. It's got boys, candy, boys. All it's missing is towels and sippy cups. Hey guys, isn't Ricky like fighting for her life or something? I love karaoke. Um, I don't 
think I'm gonna get out of here anytime soon. Doing my best. Good for tonight. I said, baby, you make me feel great. Ricky comes face to... She, uh, she confronts the tentacle. She extends her arm out in front of her to stop it. When she asks the creature what it wants from them, it almost seems to stand down. That is before Will shows up to piss it off. Ricky, attempting to defend the wet paint, looks deep into this water creature, and under the moonlight, it begins to glow. Something has changed, and yet, we still know nothing. I'm gonna be real with you. The way this season was going already, I was decently sure that Ricky was going to die. Like she was gonna be turned into water. Something about looking into the tentacle makes Ricky cry and look off into the distance dramatically. The Neptunes, all of them, well, all the ones left, return to Ricky's. The establishment, not her house. This is really confusing. Cleo, Bella, and Will seem to be the only ones to notice how visibly shaken Ricky is. But Will takes initiative. What happened out there? You spoke to it and the water stopped. It was like it was under your control. And why are you lying to Cleo and Bella? Why did you tell them I saved you? What's the big deal? It's not true. You saved me. You came out to Mako to look after me and now they think you did. I came after you because I care about you. <sighs> I can't do this right now. Hey Ricky, remember that time you tried to keep a secret from your friends and a water witch said it would eventually ruin your friendship as the prophecy is foretold? No? Remember when Zayn exploded? This is coming from someone with a very detached knowledge of X-Men. This is X-Men. Everything I know about X-Men came from- I'm gonna take you for a ride! Mako Island is beautiful this time of year. Ricky is being weird again. She's hiding something. I am not joking. I know this sounds like a trope, but Cleo starts wearing glasses and she's inexplicably more perceptive and intelligent. Someone needs to fill that Lewis shaped hole in his absence. Surprisingly, it's our dumbest character. But we all know nobody can actually replace Lewis on this show. Hi, Ryan. Welcome. Oh, thanks for the invite. It's okay, you're welcome. Come in. You must be Kim. And you must be Cleo. No! No, Cleo, no! Jean Shirt, or Jert for short, takes a look at Cleo's magnetic rock she broke off from the Mako Island moon pool. I swear, it's like Cleo got stolen by aliens in the night. The glasses have seeped into her brain, unlocking 100% of her power. Ricky is pulling away, spending more time at the moon pool. She says she belongs there or at least it feels like it, which results in another Ricky and Zane fight. Again. Every time in the past I mentioned being from a broken home, this is what I was referring to. She also lashes out at the new smart Cleo for showing important artifacts to a guy she just met, potentially revealing parts of their secret. Oh, I know she can be a bit feisty. <laughs> yeah, but I've never been on the receiving end like that before. Didn't she make you break up with your boyfriend that one time, which eventually led to an evil redhead almost ending you? Actually, you know what? A lot of these girls' overarching problems are caused by Ricky, advertently or otherwise. I'm glad all the mom statues are still strewn throughout the house. Well, I can't go calling him Jert anymore. He's dressed like a Boy Scout now. That pin says most bitchly. Yeah. Yeah, it does, okay? But it's a reminder for me not to be such a bitchly. Two clips for one video? I was hoping I'd find you here. Why you knock? There's no door. You shouldn't sneak out with people like that. Then you shouldn't face your back to the door. Will rescues Ricky from her pouty stupor and returns her to his weird hut boat house thing. After doing tests with glasses, Cleo, the rock is incredibly magnetic, which they knew. Time to do some more research. Rocks. Dot. Com. It should be a scoria or a basalt, but it's not. It's Better left a mystery? Well, this mystery is making a life hell. And it's got us fighting with each other. The girls are fighting. Thank God they show his outfit. I almost didn't know what to call him. Anyway, he calls Cleo and offers to analyze the magnetic water rock. Who said I'd annoy him? Ah, uh, Kim, look. Boys don't like girls that are pushy. Wrong. Uh, incorrect. Oh my god, it's overtaken his body. He's wearing a hat now. The live action adaptation of Yogi Bear compares his findings with Cleo and. Well, the only rocks with this degree of magnetism came from... Where? The moon. The moon, like where water comes from. 
Also, Portal 2 reference. They do have gel. Ricky can seemingly open a portal in the moon cave with her powers. At least I think that's what this effect is meant to represent. Did this dude's hat get bigger between shots? Am I going insane? Okay, you are never going to believe this. Mako Island is made out of some sort of moon rock. This ties everything together. I know what that means. We can definitely shoot a portal on these walls. The girls are fighting? Bella is also feeling the oncoming child of divorce feeling. Boy, do I know it. Will spills the beans about what happened that fateful night. The night Ricky looked deep into the water tentacle, possibly explaining why she's been so strange lately. Not that arguing with everyone closest to her is out of the ordinary for Ricky, but you know. Ricky stays behind testing her new powers of blue projection. And the episode ends as she looks over her shoulder ominous. What will happen with Ricky now that she's looked into the light. What are the odds? Oh my god. I forgot they go to school. The new class and Cleo have been looking for Ricky, but she hadn't turned up, implying she even skipped school. And then the new smart Cleo says there's one place we haven't looked, to which we transition to Mako Island. I don't know how smart she can be, considering this isn't the first place you looked. Not only is this the exact last place you saw her, but... She's here all the time now. Boy, are these two glad that Cleo's getting ratatouille by these glasses. But then they leave the cave, thinking she isn't there. When in reality, she was just hiding behind the R2-D2 special edition rock. Cleo, you have got to get new friends. I didn't mean this guy. Why is he here? What do I call him now? Plaid? That's not nearly as good as Jert. Yeah, that's really weird because I called the school and they hadn't heard about it. They said you haven't been there in 20 episodes. While Ricky stays on the island, she notices as Plaid pulls up in his boat. What's he up to? So she finally comes out of her hiding to blame Cleo for all of this. Whatever this is. Oh no, mom and mom are fighting again. I hate this family. I should have gone with Emma. And then on her world tour, she rolls up to her job that she's never at to get the only other employee to leave work with her. If you remember, they fired Sophie and then she went missing under mysterious circumstances. Too bad they don't have Nate on the payroll anymore, if they even ever did. I just noticed that his display name says the boss. They cannot make me hate this guy. Ah, uh, he's not answering. Maybe his phone switched off? Yeah, either that or he's on Mako Island where there's no phone service. You see, I know for a fact that's not true, but I'm far too lazy to find a clip to prove it. Editor Andrew, get on it! Okay, so maybe Sophie didn't go missing, but Ricky would have preferred if she did. She complains about all these meetings that have been happening behind her, and Zane rightly brings up that she hasn't even been around. What's more strange is how jealous both of them are. Ricky is jealous that Zane is spending so much time and confiding in Sophie. Zane is jealous that Ricky is spending her time as a group, but still individually with Will. And then Sophie is jealous of Bella for spending time with her brother? Which is weird and confusing. Also, Cleo has a new nerd or something and a new brain. Will blows up at Zane. No one asked him to do this. Are we supposed to hate Zane here? Like, I know I went to bat for Charlotte, but he has seniority over Will and also Will is boring. Speaking of new nerd boy, decided on the ranger fit again, huh? Ricky sabotages his research with her powers and now chase. Like three minutes of chase. Guess they were really proud of these on-location sets. Like, okay, this is getting a little ridiculous. We can only hear the stock swoosh and looping five-second Indiana Jones track so many times before we start to become wise. Doesn't matter anyway, as Ranger Rick discovers the moon pool cave on his own, like most do, by tumbling down the hole. If only Emma was here to prevent this. Well, Ricky was right. It's all Kim's fault. The more changes, the more stays the same. He has now taken on the role of character whose name I refuse to learn since I was forced to learn Kim's. Now, take a wild guess as to how they get Ranger plaid jerk off their trail. That's right, fully grown adult children. They gaslight him. Convince everyone around him that he's crazy and make him believe he's losing his own sanity. Maybe that's why Kim likes him. Anyway, what now? It seems like this is pretty much resolved. The tentacle is really special. I made a connection with it, like a real connection. Initially, I thought Will was a threat to Ricky Zane, but little did I know the real eligible bachelor was right under my nose. I'm not making that tentacle joke, all right? These are children. And I guess that's enough to convince the rest of the Neptunes, sans Zane. They're ever so slightly pushing him more and more out of group activities and individually making him seem less and less redeemable. Whether that is Nate's doing or not is up to you and me but mostly me. She really did get them to look into the light. Fuck, I should have made a joke about this title instead. What was that other thing? 
Oh yes, the Gold Coast Freediving title. The Gold Coast Freediving title? What is that? What the hell are regionals? They never stop talking about it. I guess that's what this whole episode is gonna be about. Even Ricky and Zane's plot. They're all tied into it. Kinda fucked up that Ricky is way nicer to Will than she ever was to Lewis. Ricky needs to take a break from work, so Cleo takes her to her job. There isn't a problem between you two, is there? Uh, nothing serious. Is there anything I can help with? No, I've got it under control. Because if there is anything I can do, you know I will. Laying it on really thick, huh? Hey, you guys see the latest season of The Boys? It made me really sad and annoyed. Speaking of shows randomly going, hey, what if your favorite character was awful all of a sudden? Ricky is pissed. The creature that lives in water got her wet. Meanwhile, a lot is riding on the Gold Coast free diving title, Zane's money and Sophie's life's work. Unfortunately, Bella has convinced him that this isn't actually what Will wants when this is the only consistent characteristic we've seen from him in 19 episodes. And then she undoes that. Actually, what is your game here? Like he sulks for minutes and then she shows up and says, the water is cool and blue. And then he immediately flips a switch. Yes, ma'am, whatever you say, glory to the Neptunes. One trillion to Ricky's. Speaking of which, Bella joins Ricky and Cleo at Cleo's job she somehow still has. And then they leave. I guess we needed to get them into the main story somehow. Sometimes the, sim Sometimes the simplest way is also bad but it all makes sense now they all had to be perfectly in place the mermaids cheering on will then raise up out of the water to see <laughs> that's a new record we did it congratulations we did it. Will seems way more disgusted and upset than Ricky does. She just seems like she just smelled them up and down. Welp, I did it. I let the nostalgia overtake me. I was too nervous about how I would be perceived making fun of and complaining about this show. Wanna be nice to the show, doing this all in good fun. But in doing so, the show has actually got me emotionally invested in some of its most bullshit characters. And now with seven episodes remaining, I'm done. I'm checked out. Everyone I cared about is dead or washed so over. Well, at least Nate is pleased. Will is upset with Sophie, which I really hope isn't jealousy. He blows up and says he doesn't want to dive anymore, even though I'm pretty sure he already became champion today. And Ricky breaks up with Zane. But interestingly, Zane points out that Ricky's changed ever since the day she looked into that tentacle, which is honestly a good point. I honestly do have a lot to say about this, but I'm sure you'll hear about it later, so... <laughs> I didn't even consider this, but all three of these guys still work together. Like, the place is called Ricky's. So Sophie is fast-tracked to manager so Zane can get a break. I'm gonna make the comparison again, this time not to Buffy or Community. You remember that uh, late season episode of Fairly Odd Parents where they just started lumping all of the villains together regardless of how small scale they were just for fun? Hey look, Cleo has her glass. Do you mind? No. Hey, I thought you'd spent your allowance. Now that I'm working, what I do with my money is none of your business. Uh, you have a job. Mm -hmm. At the cafe. The new manager there said I have a great future. The Neptunes are on the ropes as their new rivals, the fastest growing evil team, is making moves. Sophie's the manager and Kim is there at all. I drew the battle lines of the quote good guys and bad guys and in doing so the show aligns Nate with the Neptunes. Or at least Will and Bella. Please come on, we've lost all the other guys. It's Nate's time to shine. In reality I think he acts more as like the devil on Zayn's shoulder, pushing him further and further as he slips into a life of crime and scheme. Also, I forgot about the tentacle. They should get that guy a job at the cafe. Gotta change that name. This band has really fallen off since Lewis left. The only characters of season one of the show in this scene are Nate and Kim, and we're playing two Bella songs back to back. What happened to this thing, man? Bella sneezed and accidentally turned all of the liquids in the room into jelly, as is her power. And finally, she involves the other Neptunes. We got some lore happening. I get the feeling this is more wacky sitcom shenanigans over learning anything about anything or anyone. I'm staunch in my support of filler, but this season of this show is doing everything in its power to change my mind. Well, what's changed? Did anyone say Cleo wash her hands? In fact, does anyone ever say Cleo wash her hands? 
Of course I do. Damn, that's a good point. Is the implication that Cleo hasn't washed her hands in years? You're causing a scene in front of your new colonizer mom. There's a first time for everything. We're seeing them actually sit in on a class. I just assumed they all went to high school to learn how to surf or catch fish. A Disney Channel original movie happens as Bella makes more goop. She's distraught. She can't perform under these conditions and she's gonna let her band down. The girl trio discuss and come to a conclusion that Cleo will be Bella's replacement because... They forgot the last time she did this. There is an episode previously about how Cleo is normally a terrible singer, and one about how her dad crushes at karaoke. Get him in the band, it's like Lewis never left. This has got to be some type of humiliation ritual. Even Nate is weird to the F out. But he still goes to bat for her. Sure, he's bad with boundaries and generally creepy, and- I think this is a good idea. Yes, absolutely. Now, just one quick thing about the wardrobe. Basically, just wear something short and tight. Short and tight. Nate, you're making this really difficult for me. Sophie gets slimed and we're not even on Nickelodeon anymore. Surely at the very least, Nate will defend her. Hi everyone. Welcome to Ricky's. I'm gonna sing you a little song. If we get the song, how about some car wheels? <laughs> In a minute. Oh my god. Girl, you gotta get off this stage. It is not safe in here. Also, what did you mean in a minute? Cleo is on the cusp of embarrassing herself yet again, completely left out to dry by her closest friends. But at the last minute, it's revealed that it was Will's cologne making Bella sneeze like crazy the whole time. That's mundane. Like, the way the episode was going, I was pretty convinced this was another Sophie scheme. Like, she would do deep research and figure it out what she's allergic to and spread it all around the cafe. Like, the episode almost implies it as a red herring, which is weird in its own right. All as well, as well as it can get. In the end, Nate ends up with another small victory, which is truthfully all I care about. I know he's a bastard and a freak, but I know he can do better. I can fix him. <laughs> Will is tinkering with his trinkets, and by trinkets, let's just say, <laughs> the jewel. Finally, now all I need is a pipe and a spoon. Cleo is the only one of the Neptunes that wants to study, obviously on account of her new glasses. But everyone else is having a great time. They're playing off each other and laughing and bantering. In any other show, this would be a sign that someone here is gonna die this episode. Someone basically is, considering Will gave the necklace he made to Ricky and not Bella. Bella doesn't seem too visibly upset by this, but Zane does, as he attempts to talk Talk things out with her in a very public place. You know, if you guys wanted a clean break to move on, you shouldn't have become entangled in siblings. Everyone keeps telling Zane he needs to move on, as if it's been weeks or months, which as far as I know, it very well could be. I don't see what the big fuss is. It's just another dumb soccer game. Kim, this is far from just another game. This is the final, the glorious climax. Wow. Wait, why did she call it soccer? Do they call it that there? Cleo dad just wants someone to watch the game with him, but not even his damn new wife wants anything to do with this. He puts the game on really loudly as the Neptune study with the door wide open. When Ricky and Bella are about to kiss, an ever observant glasses Cleo notices that their necklaces are drawn to each other, as if they came from a magnetic rock. If only we already knew this. He shoots! The goalie dies! No. Well, that's just great, girls. You got your blue all over the place. The girls realize they were drawn to the glowing blue just like the full moon, so they go to the moon cave to find more for fun. I heard you gave Ricky a um, present, some sort of crystal. Where'd you hear that? Oh, wait. Let me guess. Zane. I know this is a real life teenager, but like. He's really bad at this, no? Like, surely I'd be worse if put on the spot, but it's really noticeable this episode. How did Cleo become the brains of this operation? Oh, right, the glasses. When did this show become Stardew Valley? They're just collecting crystals now? To what end? There's gotta be a way to make money off this. Will and the girls return to his creepy shack to find the original Ricky necklace missing, which we learn was Zane's doing. However, the girls instantly clock Sophie as a prime suspect. Will protests, even though we've seen her do this before, not that long ago. But this time, they actually are wrong. I don't know why they did this. I mean, Ricky figures out it was Zane in the very next scene. Zane is being... Weird. Weirder than Ricky was with the tentacle. Well, we've come full circle. <sighs> Send him to jail. We have forgotten too soon that he tried to kill Cleo. Remember that time he exploded? I tried to prevent the Buffy comparisons, but in reality, the Buffy plot was happening right under my nose. Spike walked so Zane could 
die. Now the girls have three necklaces that are way cooler and epicer and have powers than those dumb old amulets. Emma who? Water witch who? We've learned two things this episode, that we can't trust Zane anymore, and the Neptunes now have powered up gems. I think I see where this is going. They're gonna light him on fire. I wanted to end my commentary there for dramatic effect, but Zane types on a static keyboard. Like nothing on the screen moves. This show is awesome. Byron missing. Ash gone. Emma dead. Lewis pirate, probably. Zane ruined. At least I've got Cleo dad. And Kim. And Nate. I guess I also got Cleo. And Ricky. <laughs> I'm starting to believe this last crop of episodes are just going to be a training arc for the girls' new conduits, and I gotta say, I'm not uninterested. Cleo's gotten the moon alert on her phone. It alerts her of the full moon when it's coming. It shows a picture of the moon and plays a wolf howl sound effect. Yes, it is incredibly necessary. It's not silly. The brain is studying for finals while the blonde squad is going full mermaid mode in the ocean. Look at this nerd with her nerd books. This is how you would dress your character if they got blasted with a dork ray for one episode. Her ass is not reading that. Ricky would rather spend her time watching the gang study. Wasting time arguing that they don't even need science. Meanwhile, Glass is Cleo, the accomplished woman she is. I mean, she managed to keep her job the whole show. Ricky is out of a company that shares her name, but it's making Cleo freak out. Her schedule has become decent synced and for the first time in the show, I actually understand her. I get it. I love schedules. I know we all do. The glasses really do go a long way. Which causes water all around the building to go crazy and even on Mako Island. No one else sees this? They're really that distracted by the sprinklers? The exam has been compromised, apparently. On the night of the full moon, the girls are at a loss of what to do next, so Ricky suggests they just let it take them. Just sit there in the moon pool and wait for the tentacle. It's at this moment of this terrible plan that I am reminded of the time she looked deep into the tentacle and how she's never been the same since. Oh my god, that's not Ricky. Her evil clone is back. It was inside her the whole time. Another The Boys reference. Spoilers, sorry. And so, it arrives. Arrives to greet its ally yet again. It zaps a cliff face, revealing a concave crevice inside. All three of the gemstone necklaces glow as the girls place their pendants in the Temple of Time or whatever. Okay, but didn't they like make those? Like the gems were carved down out of larger rocks. Why would they fit perfectly in that hole that has already existed? You know that scene from Rise of Skywalker where they Whoa, it's glowing. Ricky steps towards the tentacle almost knowingly as the other two follow shortly after. First Bella, the one who almost became water, and then Cleo, the brains of this new operation. They are dragged into the moon pool and shown a projection. Now, I know we are three seasons, 74 episodes into this mermaid show set in high school, and you always gotta up the stakes, but I promise you, and I know I say this a lot, you have to believe me, I I'm not making this up. The tentacle shows the girls a vision of a meteor that is on pace to hit all of Australia and maybe even the Earth. Will and Zane also see this and Zane gets pissed at them. I don't, I don't know what he's doing. On one hand, oh my God. It was a comet, wasn't it? Do you think it was here? I mean, right here? Well, I think that's what it was telling us. But that it happened or that it's going to happen? Maybe it was showing us how Mako Island was formed. But on the other, I was already falling out of favor. This is a shot of adrenaline right into my veins. Literal coolest thing ever. The girls have nothing but their memories to speculate. Are these the shadows of things that will be? Or are they the shadows of things that may be? What does it mean? Cleo, you're the brains. Oh yeah, and they aced the test or whatever. I know you were all personally invested in how the test plot was going to resolve. Speaking of incested, uh, Sophie also kind of got stood up by Zane. Moving on. <laughs> I didn't mention this even though it's one of my very few memories revolving around this show. I remember being at the house that would host 
March Madness parties along with the one we would always watch the Kid Choice Awards at because you don't really understand accents as a kid, or at least I didn't. Maybe I just lived a very sheltered, thin worldview. We heard these Australian characters say party, which sounded like potty. And every time we saw this on the TV and they would say, you're going to the potty, we would all die of laughter. We were like eight years old and it was the funniest thing ever. Same thing with the sumo episode of Pokemon, but I can't even quote that to you. I just have hazy memories of staring at that and everyone laughing. I think laughing at something I said, which is the first time as a kid, I'm like, well, I can make people laugh. This is the height. This is victory. Anyway, I bring up that important memory because there's a big potty. A beach potty. But obviously we could not have seen this episode. Everyone is going. Cleo's going, Ricky's going, Bella, Sophie, Zane. That's everyone. But the small wrinkle in this plot is the tied web of relationships our characters have trapped themselves in. Zane tries to ask Ricky to the dance, but considering she saw him kiss Sophie, she wants no part of that. Zane vents to Sophie, who very clearly wants him, even more than she wants her own brother. Speaking of which, Bella wants to go to the dance with Will, but Will is nervous, so he role plays with Ricky as a way to prepare to ask Bella out. Somebody called Nathan Fielder. But Bella, like most teens in this town, shows up uninvited and slinks around, overhearing this and missing understanding the context. Cleo is at home and receives a mysterious present that houses a telescope, clearly a gift from Lewis, but when she emails him about it, Lewis said it wasn't from him. I promise I'm not just describing the plot of this episode. This is all set up. I'm always going to add my two cents in the little jokey jokes. I swear the way they're all saying party has given me flashbacks, but there's no way we watched this episode. It didn't air on Nickelodeon and certainly didn't air in 2009. Anyway. Hey, the party, you're coming with me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the night monster strikes again. What did I tell ya? Truly, now everyone is going to the party. Nate sings to her with his golden pipes. This will only make the band better. Bandmates dating has only ever been good for local bands historically. Bella tells him he should go with someone else, to which he instantly looks at his own sister. The next scene, they play weird romantic music, but in actuality, Sophie tries to convince Will to ask Ricky so she can have Zane all to herself, because she obviously knows that he is a logically sound and well-adjusted man and not a murderer that will handle this news with respect. Nate then shows up to the the Cleo household to hit on Cleo because he's just been all over town. It turns out the telescope isn't from him, but that won't stop him from trying to make this thruple work. The third and final potential bachelor shows up. Wait, who is this? Wait, is that the Jert Ranger guy? Do we know him? He mentions the moon rock, so it's definitely him. That's just my way of saying, remember me? Who could forget you? I did. But she turns him down because he isn't Lewis and she's gotten exponentially smarter since getting those glasses. Nobody at this party is happy aside from her, the only goddamn adult on this beach. I mean, I guess Nate, but he's got brain worms. Time for another song that sounds nothing like this band. Take it away, Nate. Don't go looking for another kind of is Ricky hosting this event? Does Ricky even work there anymore? Of course, Zane reacts the way he's meant to. Clearly, Sophie doesn't know him at all. Will confesses his feelings to Bella finally, which an angry Nate rushes in to accidentally spill water on her. She escapes to the sea, where Will joins her and they have a conversation. You know what? I just realized I don't care. You can kind of tell that they planned on moving the concept over to different people and different characters this late into the game by the amount of time they dedicate to new characters. Like, yeah, Cleo and Ricky and Zane are there, but they aren't the centerpiece. Hey, remember that time you saw that meteor that may or may not be coming to Earth? No? I'm realizing for the first time that fishing is Cleo Dad's job. Like, he doesn't do it for fun. He legitimately puts food on the family's table. Kim is complaining that they can't afford a vacation, which should sound reasonable until you remember that their new mom has several artifacts from all over the world. Why does it have to be his money? Will and Bella get their first scene in a relationship and they realize they have nothing in common. Will wants to info dump about rocks while Bella is uninterested and attempts to workshop her song. This exact thing has happened to me bar for bar, except instead of rocks, it was professional wrestling. But yes, they are official now, I guess. I don't really know how this works. I've got to show you the new trick I taught Ronnie. Spend the day watching a dolphin do tricks or shopping for new shoes. New shoes! Got an interview for a new job. Really? That's great. Doing what? Customer service. It's only part-time. Part-time. Which one of these jokes is funnier? Because I can't use both. We've run out of legacy characters to incorporate in a plot, so now Cleo Dad got a job at the Marine Park as a pirate. 
This is awesome. Should I even bother asking why the Marine Park has this job? What does he even do? If I were Nate, I'd be a little upset. And yet he's still here day in and day out rocking for the love of the art form. It's here that we learn that Will doesn't understand music at all. In a way, Bella has more in common with Nate, which could mean nothing. Boys and girls, don't miss our brand new pirate adventure with Captain Don. Your time has come, you build rats. You'll soon be moving over to the plank. Did they add this just for this man? That's so fucking sick. The ship and costume did not exist before him, and I'm convinced he brought them from home. Cleo accidentally, albeit, gaslights another kid for life. Cleo dad has never been happier, and he loves his job. Meanwhile, the newlyweds are on the rocks, as Will has become Yoko Ono for this band all of a sudden. Lewis and Cleo get together, and then randomly Lewis acts completely different, and then they split. Ricky and Zane get together, and the same course of events take place except they haven't gotten back together. Of course it would happen to the only girl left, but I just don't care because it's Will and Bella. What does he know about music? How dare he try and axe out Nate? He's the heart of the band. He is the sensitive one. I've been promoted. You're not going to be a pirate anymore. No, too right I am. They've even given me a crew. Isn't there a meteor coming soon? Bella destroyed Will's favorite shell. They just keep getting in each other's way. Speaking of getting in each other's way, nobody is coming to Cleo's dolphin show because there's a goddamn pirate at this park now. I get it, man. He's getting way too into this character. It's taken over his body like a symbiote. Full-time position, more money, long-term contract. Very impressive. I told them maybe another time. I think Captain Don is about due to hang up his cutlass. No! Captain Don! No, please! The dolphins were so lame, but I guess this is all they can do after they threaten to put him down. You may be thinking, wait, they still own the ship. Why don't they just hire a different guy? How would Cleo doing this even help her job? But you clearly don't realize nobody's doing it like this guy. They cast a new guy and he's gonna be torn apart in three minutes flat. Also, Cleo dad probably brought the costume from home and probably took it back with him. I'm making a lot of assumptions about our A plot. On the other side, the newbies dive underwater to find a new shell. And then they share a moment where they say, actually, we do have stuff in common, which is... Still not true. Water doesn't count. Like, I get it. When you live in a small town and everyone knows each other, beggars can't be choosers. But maybe don't date then. That's a thought. That's an option. Speaking of shifty compromises, this episode ends with Cleo incorporating a pirate costume into her dolphin show. Intellectual property theft. You'll be receiving a cease and desist from my lawyer shortly. The apple doesn't far too fall from the tree unless you're Cleo's mom, in which case the apple fell, then the tree left town and got a new identity. Well, here we are, the penultimate episode of the original incarnation of H2O Just Add Water, originally airing April 16th, 2010, as the follow-up finale episode would air immediately following it, but only as two separate episodes back-to-back, -back, not as a fake TV movie. Sorry to get your hopes up. An ominous cloud approaches Mako Island. Sorry, a normal-looking cloud with ominous music playing approaches the island. The music leads me to believe we should be concerned while looking at these gorgeous vistas. Maybe I'm just used to seeing the planet die all the time now, but this doesn't seem that bad. Will and Bella are being cute, which means that something terrible is bound to happen to one of them, for sure. I've never been wrong about this. As the girls swim into the moon pool, they comment on how humid the cave has gotten. That's actually what they say. No, it definitely is a bit more humid. Something's weird. Well, this is a volcano, but it's supposed to be dormant. No, it's not that. Something's changed. Yeah, they call those seasons. Then, the exact next scene. Bella, Bella, Bella. You'd think you'd forgotten he has a sister. Okay, Sophie. Actually, what the fuck does that mean? Anyway, business is not booming. Ricky's is close to going under. The Neptunes, what's left of them, agree to check out the moon pool cave together tomorrow morning, before Sophie shows up to interrupt them. She attempts to convince brother Will to sell his dumb rocks to fund the cafe, and he's way more receptive than you would think. Not that he agrees, but just doesn't disagree as much as he probably should. He must really love of his sister. Kinda wish he didn't, though. I guess the band is really not bringing in the funds. Oh, great. 
It's this guy. Ranger Jert was off looking at rocks on Mako Island, which can only spell bad news for the Neptunes. Our pieces are falling into place. Sophie is cooking up a money-making scheme thanks to the intel of the Hat Man. She learns that the gem in Bella's necklace, which she got from the island, is worth a pretty penny. All the while, the girls find out that the cave has lost its magnetism using Lewis's old compass. So they put Ricky on the case. I mean, she's been obsessed with this place ever since looking into that tentacle. I mean, it's basically ruined her relationship. Also, the cheating. Hey, remember that time Zayn exploded? She says it's alive or something. New mom and ranger boy are at the Cleo household. None of these words are English. Researching the changes over at Mako Island. Man, I guess Ricky was right. The whole town is in a tizzy over this. Zane even comes to her hat in hand about the downfall of what used to be their shared diner. Ricky's very busy. All the while, Jert is meeting with Sophie to discuss what info he's come across. I you had 10 grand. Would that get us everything we need? Yeah, just. In that case, there's someone I'd like you to meet. Sophie introduces the man of the hour to Zane, giving him the opportunity to bankroll their expedition of Mako Island. I hope he doesn't go along with it. Not for any moral reasons, I'm just certain these guys are gonna lose, in which Zane would lose all of his money. He's too far gone, he's desperate for more money. The former Neptune, former friend Zane, agrees to help the Ed boys with their scheme. There are cases of fish deserting their areas prior to a sudden change in their environment. Like what, a cyclone? Yeah, or an earthquake, or even a comet. A comet. Sure, why not? I have a sinking suspicion Zane is about to explode again. I looked up the trajectory of the comet on the internet. It said that it entered our solar system on February the 7th. That's the same day as the first water attack. Okay, so like, where are we now? What month is this? How long has it been? Why even bother asking? The girls realize they may not have seen the whole vision and return to the moon pool cave without the full moon. So no tentacle. And yet, the vision. Mako Island was formed after a, a collision with a comet, right? The crystals and the rocks in the moon pool prove that. I'll bet that the comet is made up of the same stuff. That's why they're attracted to each other. Mako was drawing it in like a giant magnet. Yes. Boy, are we glad Cleo started wearing glasses. If she didn't, we'd be sitting ducks. The Neptunes need to act, but how? Oh wait, so it is a full moon? Why didn't they just... Oh, it's so something terrible could happen to the Ed boys. The cave is heating up, but they don't know how. Zane is concerned, but Sophie needs those gemstones now. The park ranger shoots a big laser at the wall of the moon cave, revealing perfectly cut crystals. Am I interpreting this right? The meteor is still on its way to the planet. The same planet with all the... Oh. That's how the episode ends? You're telling me we have 24 minutes of H2O left of the original incarnation of the show? I would tell you that I'm not ready to say goodbye and that I'd miss them, but... I kind of have been saying goodbye the whole time. It's like slowly peeling a band-aid off or watching a family member slowly die of an illness. You know, insane analogy, actually. It's a TV show for tweens. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. But this show has been hemorrhaging characters and quality for a while now. I know I keep comparing the show to the same three TV shows. Maybe you should watch more shows. But the oncoming finale does remind me more and more of the community finale. Like, I knew this was coming. I just hope they can stick the landing. Well, they have like 20 minutes left to stop a meteor from destroying the entire Earth or maybe just the country. It's really unclear. Let's see if they can overcome this in the final episode of H. So it seems like the comet is no longer a secret as the Cleo household is planning on borrowing the gifted telescope from Jert to watch it pass. She meets with the gang sans Ricky, who's off looking at glowing rocks in a cave. Cleo, again, is talking and thinking circles around these kids. We're in the end times. It was seen on the Irish coast in the early 1700s, right over the area where I became a mermaid. That can't be a coincidence. Lots of people must have seen it across Ireland. But these people thought that it was the end of the world. Everyone started panicking. 300 years ago, they still thought the earth was flat. Um, Will, how about you get that big government stick out of your ass? True patriots know it still is. Apparently, there was a local girl named Ava who warned the people. By the way, I'm no history expert, but 300 years ago, they wouldn't be like simpletons or cavemen. Ava warned them, then disappeared into the ocean as a beam of light, well, beamed out of the water 
and struck the meteor. After four minutes of explanation, Ricky rolls up to relay the bad news to the Neptunes. The Ed boys want to strip the mine for all it's worth, but how will they get these gems without child labor? Their little hands can fit in holes that we just can't. Somebody call Kim, I guess. I feel like she would fit in with the scoundrels. Sophie and Indiana Jones go to Mako Island without Zane, who attempts to warn Ricky, his ex, who hates him. Oh, I guess the other girls are there too. The whole time, Zayna's defected, but it's too late. Sophie and Sir Topham Hat set off explosives in the cave while also being inside the cave. I see a small flaw in your plan. The three mermaids do their best to frantically remove the piling rocks, and then Will is just there with Zane. The cave begins to collapse around them, but Sophie refuses to leave her fortune, her precious gems and jewels. I'm doing this for both of us. I don't want any of them. What's more important to you, me or the money? Are they, are they about to kiss? Can we get out of this cave now, please? All the humans scurry out somewhere, but the mermaids stay behind, looking at the broken pile of rocks and gems that used to be the cave. But that won't stop the moon. It will continue to rise. What if the tower of light that hit the comet wasn't just light? What if it was water? Water. Yeah, what if? Energized water. A tentacle. The CG comet swerves past the CG moon. Would you prefer they use a real moon, Andrew? Bella believes she may be the second coming of Ava, so she vows to make the beacon of light all alone while sending the others away. Cleo rejects this and says the line, this is why we were made mermaids, the three of us. Which is like, technically? Give or take a few mermaids that shan't be named. She wants to stop the comet together, as a family. The three remaining mermaids of our story stand hand in hand and jump into the Mako Island. Moon pull on Mako Island as the meteor beats down on Mako Island. New mom sees the meteor through the Pokemon Rangers telescope and begins to realize the severity of this disaster. The girls do their best to form a tentacle all their own to combat this as it circles and circles around them. Eventually Eventually, electricity runs through the beam and shoot right into the meteor, setting it off course. So, several questions. So was there ever actually really a tentacle? Was it ever sentient? Because they just made one on their own. Did it work with them? Was Ava the tentacle the whole time? Why did it only appear now? I'm gonna be honest. Pretty anticlimactic. Like, I know that the show was never about the lore and the power of mermaids. It was always more so about the interpersonal relationships and drama of these teenagers, which is why the rest of the finale's runtime is their graduation. But like, if you're gonna incorporate a giant meteor, maybe bring it up a couple more times. Or at least set up clear-cut stakes. Like, they're not on Nickelodeon anymore. They can get away with the violence, and the show was canceled anyway. Nothing in the show ever outright says it's even going to hit Earth, much less Australia. For all we know, it could have landed in the ocean or broken up in the atmosphere. But I guess none of that matters now, as they all reel from the intense use of their powers. Remember when the tentacle almost turned Bella into water? What was that about? Remember when Zayn exploded? Maybe Cleo was wrong, dude. I feel like this prophecy was all about Bella. It didn't activate when Emma was here at all. Wait, where is Emma? It's her best friend's graduation. You didn't even want to visit? Also, no way Ricky graduated with everyone. Wait, Bella and Will are seniors? So they were just off screen somewhere the first two seasons? You know, I never thought I'd say this, but after everything that we've been through, I'm gonna miss this place. Cleo. You're never here. I've seen you at this school like four times over 70 episodes. Cleo gets a special science award that may or may not be a scholarship. She really stepped up and took charge. The group needed a brain and she rose to that occasion and filled those shoes and if- Oh, thank God, Lewis is back. Now I can take these stupid glasses off. The sweeping shot they give this guy is insane. I'm glad you're back now, Lewis, but did you know that a meteor may or may not have almost destroyed the planet? You should have showed up a lit like an hour earlier. Man, these two are just all over each other. They managed to remain loyal the couple months he was gone, and now they have so much more in common, a mutual love for science. Seeing how Ricky and Zane end up, I'm glad someone got a happy ending. Oh yeah, mm, these two exist. The show ends with the most important plot of season three. Not the tentacle, not the meteor, not the cafe, not Will and Sophie, not Zane, but the band playing the theme song which I guess canonizes it as one Bella wrote. And the final shot, Lewis has to watch from the sidelines as the band struggles without their drummer. In the end, I guess Nate came out on top. Wait, did he graduate? 
Does he even go to school? I think I may have answered my own question. So that was the end of H2O, just add water. Well, at least the original incarnation of the show. I truly went into this video thinking, believing that this show was just a flash in the pan that very few remember and not what it actually is, which is a dynasty. First of all, we know that the show was originally only planned to have two seasons before a third was ordered due to popularity. Of course, with a new season comes extra contract negotiations, and I don't blame the actors who decided to leave the show before season three and during season three. The show is not forgotten, and it certainly isn't lost. You may know today that the cast is still actively talking about the show. There was a TikTok trend a while back of people donning a fake accent and belting out, Nar, clear. I mean, it was really easy to find these episodes. They aren't on YouTube in the way that Total Drama and Stoked are on YouTube. These episodes were posted on the official H2O YouTube channel that is still posting content as we speak. The comments aren't even that old. The YouTube viewing audience is actively watching the show in 2024. It never dies. So then why does no one really talk about it beyond remembering that it did exist and was Australian? The show isn't an obscure piece of nostalgia. It's right in everyone's faces. They have a TikTok and a Roblox game? Hey, look, I'm Cleo. Let me guide you on how to explore the game. Here is where you can watch full episodes of H2O. Shows happen every 30 minutes. A new episode will come out about every two weeks. You'll need pearls to unlock new tales. You can earn them by collecting them in the water or by completing mini games. Let's head over there via your teleport button located on the right side of your screen. Fantastic, look at how happy they are. You rolled a Just Add Water tail. It looks just like the tails from the show. That being said, most of the cast members we see talking about it are actors who were in the entire show. I mean, Emma's actor had bigger projects to move on to, like The Vampire Diaries. Mean Girls 2, Pretty Little Liars, okay, that was pretty big. But even as the original show ended in 2010, they still weren't done. The show never had a resurgence because it never went away. The first spin-off series, Mako Island of Secrets, was announced in 2011, only a year after the original finale and would eventually air on Netflix in 2013, only the second year Netflix had begun to roll out originals. And this was not a short-lived experiment. This show also ran for three seasons over multiple years with an entirely new cast, which was followed up by the original animated spin-off series titled H2O Mermaid Adventures, which is, um, looks like this and is animated like this. But unlike the first spin-off, this one stars legacy characters like Ricky, Emma, Cleo, Lewis, and Bernie the Hermit Crab. Bernie got higher billing than Zane. The Vandal Gang is a group of troublemakers. Murray the Moray Eel, Danny the Octopus, Burke the Hammerhead Shark. Sorry, are these real animals? As much as I'm sure you'd love to see me also talk about these spinoffs, that's five more seasons and it took me this long to talk about three. I honestly didn't even think that I should go past season one. I mean, my original point, my nostalgic standing for the show was only me watching it when it aired in the US on Nickelodeon. Hey, did you know the Canadian animated show by Fresh TV 16 also aired on Nickelodeon? If you want to hear more about that, uh, you know what to do. So I think we're gonna have to end things here. Not only for my sanity, but also for cohesion of the plot. Look at me. I got so caught up in the storyline and lore of H2O that I'm referring to my own real life as plot. That's silly. Oh, weird. How long have I been wearing this glove? I don't even remember putting it on. Ow! Dude, what the f- All right, enough. Who's doing that? I know you can hear- Fuck! You know what they say. If you ignore something for long enough, it, it might just go away. Probably. Man, I never know how to end these things. I'm not glad that happened, but I just, it feels like a breakup. Like I just want to be left alone to wallow. I refuse to figure out what's going wrong with me. I'll have you know, I've got TV shows to watch. I got to do the ceremonial changing of the Hawaiian shirt. It's a lot more awkward when I don't have a monologue to say, and I'm making a whole lot of eye contact. Um, I think if anything, it adds to the experience. Thank you, Gasgana. Man, they really just dropped the whole puberty thing after season one, huh? You remember that? Do you remember when Zayn exploded? Ah!
Thank you.